Preface to Civilization and Climate by Ellsworth Huntington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Civilization and Climate by Ellsworth Huntington, late research associate in geography in Yale University. Preface to First Edition. This volume is a product of the new science of geography. The old geography strove primarily to produce extra maps of the physical features of the Earth's surface. The new goes further. It adds to the physical maps an almost innumerable series showing the distribution of plants, animals, and man, and of every phase of the life of these organisms. It does this not as an end in itself but for the purpose of comparing the physical and organic maps and thus determining how far vital phenomena depend upon geographic environment. Among the things to be mapped, human character as expressed in civilization is one of the most interesting and one whose distribution most needs explanation. The only way to explain it is to ascertain the effect of each of many cooperating factors, such matters as race, religion, institutions, and the influence of men of genius must be considered on the one hand, and geographical location, topography, soil, climate, and similar physical conditions on the other. This book sets aside the other factors, except incidentally, and it confines itself to climate. In that lie both its strength and weakness. When the volume was first planned, I contemplated a discussion of all the factors and an attempt to assign to each its proper weight. The first friend who I consulted advised a directly opposite course, whereby the emphasis should be centred upon the new climate facts which seem to afford ground for a vision of some of our old estimates of the relation between man and his environment. In writing the book, I have growingly felt the wisdom of that advice, and have been impressed with the importance of concentration upon a single point, even at the expense of seeming to take a one-sided view. If the reader feels that due weight is not given to one factor or another, he must remember that many unmentioned phases of the subject have been deliberately omitted to permit full emphasis upon the apparent connection between a stimulating climate and high civilization. The materials for this volume have been derived from a great variety of sources, although personal observation and investigation are the basis of much that is here stated, still more has been derived from the world's general store of knowledge. Except in a few special cases, I have not attempted to give references. To the general reader, footnotes are not only useless, but often a distraction and a nuisance. The careful student, on the other hand, cannot form a fair estimate of the hypothesis here presented without reading previous publications in which I have set forth the reasons for many conclusions which are not fully discussed here for lack of space. These publications contain numerous references. Accordingly, the needs of the student will be met by giving a brief list of books and articles which have served as preliminary steps to the present volume. These publications form a logical series with only such repetition as is necessary to make each a complete unit. It is scarcely necessary to add that the rapid growth of the subject during the past ten years has led to important modifications in some of the earlier conclusions. The facts set forth in this volume have by no means been derived wholly from observing and reading. Not far from a hundred people have given direct personal assistance. They are so numerous that it is impossible to mention them all by name. Therefore it seems best not to single out any for special thanks. Many of my colleagues among the Yale faculty and among the geographers of America have gone out of their way to offer suggestions or friendly criticisms, or to bring to my attention publications, and facts that might have escaped my notice. Others connected with such organizations as the Carnegie Institute of Washington and the United States Weather Bureau have placed me under obligation by the kind way in which they have taken a personal rather than official interest in answering queries and providing data. Equally great courtesy has been shown by officers and other members of the teaching force at West Point and Annapolis and by officials connected with various factories, including some whose figures it has not yet been possible to tabulate. 
Another large group comprises contributors to the map of civilization, many of whom devoted to this work time which they could ill afford. Lastly, I owe much to personal friends who fall in none of the groups already specified. I suppose that the total time given to this book by all these scores of people makes their contribution larger than mine. My chief hope is that they may feel that their kindness has not been wasted. To each and all I can only express my deep sense of gratitude, and most of all to those who advise from the beginning has done more than anything else to keep this book true to a single aim. Ellsworth Hollington, Yale University, New Haven, Connecticut, July 1915 Preface to Third Edition In preparing the third edition of this book, two circumstances have led to a radical revision. First, the World War has receded far enough into the background so that people's minds are once more able to concentrate upon the far-reaching problems of science instead of the temporary details associated with war. During the past three years, this has led to a marked increase in the number of publications dealing with the problems of this book. Second, during the nine years since the first edition was issued, many new facts have come to light which amplify and strengthen the general hypothesis of the effect of climate upon civilization. The present edition differs from the first in several important respects. 1. In the first edition, inheritance, physical environment, and culture were recognized as the three main factors in determining the distribution of civilization. Physical environment was, of course, treated fully, since it is the main subject of the book. Enough was also said about human culture to show that I fully appreciate its importance, especially as an explanation of the difference between Aboriginal America and the Old World. Inheritance, however, was dismissed briefly. In the present edition, it received a good deal of emphasis, especially in the first chapter, which is almost wholly new. It would be emphasized much more strongly were it not that, in The Character of Races, I have devoted a whole book to the problem. That book and this are so closely allied that neither is complete without the other. 2. The relation of climate to health has been much discussed during the past nine years. Accordingly, three new chapters, 7 to 10, have been added on this topic. They balance the three preceding chapters by discussing the manifold effects of climate and weather upon man from the standpoint of disease and death, instead of from the standpoint of the day's work. 3. In the first edition of Civilization and Climate, I assume that historians and others would be more familiar with the evidence of climatic changes during historic times than is actually the case. Accordingly, in Chapter 14, the hypothesis of pulsatory climatic changes is more fully elaborated than formerly, while chapter 15, which is new, is devoted to criticisms of that hypothesis. 4. Chapters 16 to 17 are devoted to some of the main criticisms of the hypothesis that climate is one of the three main determinants of the distribution of civilization. An especially important new feature is a study of the white man in tropical Australia. 5. In addition to this, a large number of minor points have been added. Hence, although certain sections, such as chapters 3 to 6, remain practically unchanged, the book as a whole has a distinctly new aspect. In its present form, the book does not insist as strongly as before upon the supreme importance of climate, but the arguments would lead to the conclusion that climate ranks with racial inheritance and cultural development as one of the three main factors in determining the distribution of civilization seem much stronger than previously. Ellsworth Huntington, New Haven, September 1924 End of Preface Section 1 of Civilization and Climate by Osworth Huntington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on the volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 1 Civilization and Climate. Introduction The races of the earth are like trees. Each according to its kind brings forth the fruit known as civilization. As russet apples and pippins may grow from the same trunk, 
and his peaches may even be grafted on a plum tree, so the culture of allied races may be transferred from one to another. Yet no one expects pears from cherry branches, and it is useless to look for Slavic civilization among the Chinese. Each may borrow from its neighbours, but will put its own stamp upon what it obtains. The nature of a people's culture, like the flavour of a fruit, depends primarily upon the racial inheritance, which can be changed only by the slow processes of biological variation and selection. Yet inheritance is only one of the factors in the development of civilization. Religion, education, government, and all of man's varied occupations, customs, and institutions, his inherited culture, as the anthropologists say, form a second great group of social influences whose power seems almost immeasurable. They do for man what cultivation does for an orchard. One tree may bear a few wormy, knotty little apples, scarcely fit for the pigs, while another of the same variety is loaded with great red-cheeked fruit of the most toothsome description. The reason for the difference is obvious. One tree grows in a grassy tangle of bushes with no room to develop, little chance to get sunlight, and scant opportunity to obtain nourishment because of the abundance of other plants and the poverty and thinness of the unfertilized soil. The other stands in the midst of a carefully tilled garden, where it has plenty of room to expand and enjoy the sun, and where its roots can spread widely in a deep, mellow, well-fertilized soil. Moreover, one tree is burned with dead wood and suckers, and infested with insects and other parasites, while the other is carefully pruned, scraped and sprayed. In spite of the most careful and intelligent cultivation, a tree of the finest variety may fail to produce good fruit. Too much rain or too little, prolonged heat or constant cloudiness, frost when the blossoms are opening, or violent wind and hail may all be disastrous. The choicest tree without water is worth less than the poorest, where the temperature and rainfall are propitious. Its health is ruined, and it can bear no fruit. Here, as in the preceding case, the great need of the trees is health in the fullest and broadest sense. A good climate, good cultivation, and good nourishment are merely means of giving the tree perfect health, and thus allowing the fullest development of its inheritance. Thus the two great factors which really determine the quality of the fruit are inheritance and health. The other factors, namely, food, climate, parasites, and cultivation, are important chiefly as means whereby health, or perchance inheritance, is modified. Does the fruit known as civilization depend upon these same conditions? It seems to me that it does. Few would question that a race with a superb mental and physical inheritance and endowed with perfect health is capable of adding indefinitely to the cultural inheritance received from its ancestors and thus may attain the highest civilization. But if that same cultural inheritance were given to a sickly race with a weak inheritance of both mind and body, they would almost surely be degeneration. Aside from biological inheritance, the main factors in determining health are climate, food, parasitic diseases, and a people's stage of culture, which corresponds to the cultivation of the tree. Moreover, these same four factors, through their potency in selecting some type of preservation and others for destruction, and perhaps through their power to cause mutations, are among the main agencies in determining inheritance. Climate stands first, not because it is the most important, but merely because it is the most fundamental. It is fundamental by reason of its vital influence upon the quantity and quality, not only of man's food, but of most of his other resources. It plays a large part in determining the distribution and virulence of the parasites which cause the majority of diseases, and through its effect upon human occupations, modes of life, and habits, it is one of the main determinants of culture. On the other hand, neither food, disease, nor culture has any appreciable effect upon climate, although they may modify its influence. Moreover, climate has a direct effect upon health in addition to its indirect effect through food, disease, and mode of life. Hence, although climate may be no more important than other factors in determining the relative degree of progress in different parts of the world, it is more fundamental in the sense that it is a cause 
rather than a result of other factors. In studying climate, it is essential to draw a sharp distinction between three types of influences. In the first place, climate has a direct effect upon man's health and activity. Second, it has a strong indirect but immediate effect through food and other resources, through parasites and through mode of life. Third, by its combined direct and indirect effects in the past, it has been a strong factor. Some would say the strongest in causing migration, racial mixture and natural selection, and it may have had something to do with producing the variations which the biologists call mutations. Thus it has a powerful effect upon inheritance. From the days of Aristotle to those of Montesquieu and Buckle, there have been good thinkers who have believed that the direct effect of climate is the most important factor in determining the differences between the degree of progress in various parts of the earth. Others have held that wherever food is available for a moderately dense population, a man can avoid diseases like tropical malaria, human culture can rise to the highest levels. The location of the world's great nations seems to them largely a matter of accident. The majority of people reject both these extreme views. Few doubt that climate has an important relation to civilization, but the majority consider it less important than racial inheritance, proper food, or good institutions in the form of church, state, and home. We realize that a dense and progressive population does not live in the far north or in the deserts simply because the difficulty of getting a living grinds men down and keeps them isolated. We know that the denizens of the torrid zone are slow and backward, and we almost universally agree that this is connected with the damp, steady heat. We continually give concrete expression to our faith in climate. Not only do we talk about the weather more than about any other one topic, but we visit the seashore or the mountains for a change of air. We go south in winter and to cool places in summer. We are depressed by a series of cloudy days and feel exuberant on a clear, bracing morning after a storm. Yet in spite of this universal recognition of the importance of climate, we rarely assign it to a foremost place as a condition of civilization. We point out that great nations have developed in such widely diverse climates as the hot plains of Mesopotamia and Yucatan, and the cool hill country of Norway and Switzerland. Moreover, although Illinois and southern Mongolia lie in the same latitude and have the same mean temperature, they differ enormously in civilization. To put the matter in another way, we recognize two great sets of facts which are apparently contradictory. We are conscious of being stimulated or depressed by climatic conditions, and we know that as one goes northward or southward, the distribution of civilization is generally in harmony with what we should expect on the basis of our own climatic experiences. Nevertheless, even in our own day, regions which lie in the same latitude and apparently have equally stimulating climates, differ greatly in their degree of civilization. When we compare the past with the present, we find the same contradiction still more distinctly marked, hence our confusion. From personal experience, we know that the direct effects of climate are of tremendous importance. Yet many facts seem to indicate that this importance is less than our observation would lead us to anticipate. The reason for this doubtful attitude can easily be discovered. The things that we call facts are often not well established. Although we believe in the influence of climate, we know little of the particular climatic elements which are most stimulating or depressing. How much do we know of the relative importance of barometric pressure, wind, temperature or humidity? What about the comparative effects of the climate of England and southeastern Russia? In addition to this, we are far from knowing what type of climate prevailed in Egypt, Greece, or Mesopotamia when they rose to eminence. Many good authorities have asserted that the climate of those regions was the same two or three thousand years ago as now. This view is rapidly losing ground, but those who believe in a change are not certain of its nature. They are not yet wholly agreed as to whether it has produced an important influence upon the particular climatic elements which are most stimulating to the human system. 
This book has been written because two recent lines of investigation apparently combine to explain at least part of the contradictions which have hitherto proved so puzzling. In the first place, a prolonged study of past and present climatic variations led to the conclusion that the climate of the past was different from that of the present. In early historic times, for example, some parts of the world appear to have been drier than now, and other parts moister. In any given place, however, the change from the past to the present has not consisted of a steady progressive tendency in one direction, but of variations. In the places that were falling moister than now, there appear to have been alternate changes toward dryness and then toward moisture, while in the places that are drier than in the past, there have been corresponding variations of the opposite types. In a word, the climate of historic times seems to have undergone a pronounced series of pulsations which have varied in character from one part of the earth to another. The second line of investigation which originally led to the writing of this book was a study of the climatic conditions under which people of European races are able to accomplish the most work and have the best health. This investigation led to the conclusion that the principle of climatic optima applies to man quite as fully as to plants and animals. According to this principle, each living species has the best health and is most active under certain definite conditions of temperature, humidity, wind movement, storminess, variability and sunlight or more exactly, under certain combinations of these conditions. Any departure from the optimum conditions leads to a decrease of activity and efficiency. During the last ten years, the importance of racial inheritance and racial selection has been strongly emphasised. In the first edition of Civilization and Climate, the importance of race is strongly emphasised, but I fail to see how important a part has been played by climatic changes in selecting certain types of people for destruction or preservation. Such selection is apparently one of the chief ways in which the character of races is altered. The climatic pulsations of the glacial, post-glacial and historic periods appear to have exerted a profound influence upon the degree of habitability of different parts of the earth. Thus famine, distress and disease have arisen, and the pressure of population has led to migration, racial mixture, and the preservation of one type of people in one place and another somewhere else. Natural selection under the stress of climate goes far toward explaining many of the cases where the distribution of civilization does not agree with what would be expected on the basis of the direct effect of climate. So important is this that I have written a book on the character of races for the express purpose of applying the principles of natural selection to the history of racial development. That book might well have been called Civilization and Race, in order to emphasize the fact that it is a continuation of the present work. The change in my own realization of the part played by climatic changes is one of the chief reasons why the present edition of Civilization and Climate is in some respects almost a new book. A large part of the reasoning of this book stands or falls with the hypothesis of climatic pulsations in historic times. The steps which led to the hypothesis may be briefly sketched as follows. In 1908, under the inspiration of the broad vision of Raphael Pompili and the carefully scientific methods of William Morris Davies, I began to study the climate of the past. Two years' work with the Pompili expedition sent to Turkestan by the Kaji Institute of Washington led to the conviction that Reckless, Kropotkin, and others are correct in believing that two or three thousand years ago the climate of Central Asia was moister than now, a view which I advocated in explorations in Turkestan. Later, during the Barrett expedition to Chinese Turkestan, it became evident that the scientists who hold that the ancient climate in those regions was as dry as that of today also have much strong evidence to support their view. It soon appeared, however, that this apparent contradiction is fully explained by the fact that throughout the dry regions of Central Asia and the Eastern Mediterranean, the evidences of moist and dry conditions, respectively, are grouped in distinct periods. The beginning of the Christian era was moist, for example, and the 7th century dry. This led to what I have called the pulsatory hypothesis, which furnished a name for the pulse of Asia. According to this hypothesis, 
although the historic and prehistoric past in those particular regions was in general moister than the present. The change from moist to dry has taken place irregularly in great waves. Even in early historic times, certain centuries were apparently drier than today, while others not long ago were moist. In 1909, this view was confirmed during the Yale expedition to Palestine, the results of which are set forth in Palestine and its transformation. Then a series of journeys in the drier parts of the United States and in Mexico and Central America, in cooperation with D.T. McDowell of the Desert Botanical Laboratory of the Carnegie Institution, show that the main features of previous conclusions apparently apply to the new world as well as the old. The most important feature of this work in America was the measurement of the thickness of the annual rings of growth of some 450 of the big trees of California, the Sequonia Washingtoniana, which grows high in the Sierras. These measurements made it possible to form a fairly reliable climatic curve for 2,000 years, and an approximate curve for another thousand. The final data as to the big trees were published in the climatic factor which appeared in 1915, at the same time as Civilization and Climate. The agreement of the California curve, with the climatic curve for Western Asia previously worked out, and the constant growing evidence as to the reliability of tree growth as a measure of climate, have done far more than anything else to cause the hypothesis of climatic pulsations to be widely accepted. Here is the way the matter is summed up by the British meteorologist C. E. P. Brooks, in his book on The Evolution of Climate, 1922. The question of climatic change during the historic period has been the subject of much discussion, and several great meteorologists and geographers have endeavoured to prove that at least since around 500 BC, there has been no appreciable variation. It is admitted that there have been shiftings of the centres of population and civilization first from Egypt and Mesopotamia to the Mediterranean regions, and later to northern and western Europe. But these have been attributed chiefly to political causes, and especially to the rise of Islam and the rule of the accursed Turk. Recently, however, there has arisen a class of evidence which cannot be explained away on political grounds, and which appears to have decided the battle in favour of the supporters of change. I refer to the evidence of the trees. The conclusions derived from the big trees of California have fallen admirably into line with archaeological work in Central America, in Central Asia and other regions, and have shown that the larger variations, even of comparatively recent times, have been very extensive, if not worldwide, in their development. Another important factor in perfecting the pulsatory hypothesis has been the study of the Maya ruins in Yucatan and Guatemala. They join with other evidence in suggesting that changes of climate are of different types in different parts of the world. Central America seems to have been relatively dry at times when the big trees of the Sierras suggest that California was moist. This is an important modification of some of the conclusions which I have seemed to imply in earlier books. At practically the same time when this newer conclusion was published, an almost identical idea was presented by J. W. Gregory of England, whose article is the Earth Drying Up in the Geographical Journal for 1914, is the strongest criticism of my climatic theories that have ever appeared. It will be discussed more fully later. The fact that two investigators who seem to be opposed should independently publish the same conclusions without knowing what the other was doing greatly strengthens the force of that conclusion. Having reached the conclusion that pulsatory climatic changes have taken place during historic times and have differed in type from region to region, the next step was to study the mechanism and cause of the supposed changes. In Palestine and the eastern Mediterranean, the conditions of vegetation, especially the palm and vine, as Gregory has well shown, make it almost certain that variations in storminess and rainfall rather than in temperature have been the primary factor. The recorded observations upon the mild climatic pulsations of the past hundred years support this conclusion. 
Various lines of evidence also indicate that climatic pulsations probably consist of a shifting of the Earth's climatic zones, or at least of the areas of cyclonic storms alternately toward and away from the equator. The idea as to zones, although not as to storms, was announced by the German geologist Penick at essentially the same time that I announced it, but the two conclusions were wholly independent and were based on quite different data. In both cases it was specially recognised that the same kinds of climatic shiftings have taken place both in prehistoric and historic times, although the earlier changes were of greater magnitude. In these shiftings, the tempered zone of storms appears to have been shoved irregularly back and forth. When it was farther south than at present, the subtropical countries, which now are subarid, must have been relatively moist. At the same time, the subtropical arid belt was apparently shifted toward the equator, so that on the borders of the torrid zone, certain lands which now are wet were then relatively dry. When the shifting of zones took place in the opposite direction, the reverse changes of climate apparently took place. It was only after the preceding conclusions as to climatic pulsations had reached essentially their present form that had begun the next phase of the investigation, namely, the study of the actual effect of present climates upon human health and activity. This is important because some critics have supposed that I have unduly emphasised the importance of climatic changes, or have even formed a theory in regard to them for the purpose of bolstering up a preconceived idea that differences of climate from place to place are a main cause of the present distribution of human progress. On the contrary, up to this period, my reasoning had been somewhat as follows. If climatic changes have occurred during historic times, they must have had some economic effect because such changes alter the capacity of a region to support population. The economic changes in their turn must have led to political disturbances and migrations. Is there any evidence of such events at times when the climate suffered unusually great or rapid changes? The possibility of such a connection between climate and history has deeply interested a great number of students. Kropotkin, for instance, has vividly portrayed the way in which gradual desiccation of Asia presumably drove into Europe the hordes of barbarians whose invasions were so important a feature of the Dark Ages. If the changes from the climate to the past to that of the present had been marked by pulsations rather than by a progressive change in only one direction, and if there had been certain periods of rather rapid change and of great, though temporary extremes, as seems highly probable, the correspondence between historic events and climatic vicissitudes may be closer than would otherwise seem credible. Indeed, as soon as I had framed a preliminary outline of the curve of climatic changes during historic times, it appears as though many of the great nations of antiquity had risen or fallen in harmony with favourable or unfavourable conditions of climate. During periods of drought, not only are the people of the drier regions forced to migrate, especially if they are nomads, but increasing aridity, even in more favoured places such as Greece, must cause economic distress, and thus engender famine, misery, and general discontent and lawlessness. A recent journey to China, which gave an opportunity for a study of the famines and barbarian invasions that afflicted that country for 2,000 years, has added greatly to the already abundant evidence of the truth of this view. It has also been emphasised the remarkably intimate connection between economic distress and political discontent a connection which is obvious in advanced countries like the United States, Australia, and Europe, as well as in backward regions like China, Persia, India, and Mexico. While these economic and political effects of climatic changes were being studied, I became more and more impressed by the fact that when each country rose to a high level of civilization, it appears in a general way to have enjoyed a climate which approached more closely than now to certain well-defined conditions. These conditions appear to resemble, but by no means duplicate, those now prevailing in most of the regions where civilization is highest. In spite of marked variations, the general tendency during periods of high civilization has apparently been toward cool, but not extremely cold winters, and toward summers which, though warm or even hot for several months, 
a generally varied by storms, or at least by winds which produce frequent changes of temperature. It became especially evident that a relatively high degree of storminess and a relatively long duration of the season of cyclonic storms have apparently been characteristic of the places where civilization has risen to high levels, both in the past and at present. Hence such places experience much variability, a condition which latter work has led me to believe highly beneficial. Up to this point in my investigations, I saw no ground for appealing to anything except economic and political factors in explanations of the apparent connection between civilization and climate. Then a little book on Malaria, a neglected factor in the history of Greece and Rome, by W. H. S. Jones, convinced me that climatic changes have altered the conditions of health as well as the economic situation. Later studies indicate that in other countries such as Central America, Indochina, Java and Egypt, as well as Greece and Rome, changes in the amount of virulence of such diseases as malaria and yellow fever may have been potent factors in diminishing the vitality of a nation. In fact, it now seems probable that though their effect on bacteria, on the water supply, on the breeding places of insects, on the quality of the food, and perhaps in other ways, climatic changes may exert quite as much effect as through the more direct economic channels. The study of diseases was a natural prelude to a closer inquiry into the fact that at times of favourable climate in countries such as Egypt and Greece, the people were apparently filled with a virile energy which they do not now possess. Many authorities attribute the loss of this to an inevitable decay which must overtake a nation as old age overtakes an individual. Others ascribe it to the lack of adaptability in various institutions, to increasing luxury, to contact with inferior civilizations, to a change in racial inheritance, or to various other factors, most of which are doubtless of importance. Previous to 1911, a few authorities such as O. Frass had connected the decline of energy in Egypt, for example, with climatic changes. But they gave so few reasons, and the whole matter seemed so doubtful that I had little faith in their suggestions. At that time, Charles J. Comer of Syracuse University sent me a manuscript calling attention to the remarkable similarity between the distribution of cyclonic storms and of civilization. His article was never published, but was presented at a meeting of the Association of American Geographers. He advanced the idea that the barometric changes which are the primary cause of storms, or perhaps some electrical phenomena which accompany them, may produce a stimulus which has much to do with the advancement of civilization. Although he presented no definite proof, his suggestions seemed so important that I determined to carry out a plan which had long ago been in mind. This was to ascertain the exact effect of different types of climate by means of precise measurements. Dexter, in his book on Weather Influences, had made a beginning. Lehman and Pedersen had made a small series of measurements whose highly suggestive results have been published under the title Das Wetter und Unsier Albiat. A few physicians and students of child psychology were also at work, and the results have been summed up in such publications as Helpak's Geophysische Eschumangen and Berliner's Einfluss von Klima, Wetter und Jahreszeit auf das Neveren und Selene Leben. Nevertheless, there existed no large series of measurements of the actual efficiency of ordinary people under different conditions of climate. The ideal way to determine the effect of climate would be to take a given group of people and measure their activity daily for a long period, first in one climate and then in another. This, however, would not be practical because of the great expense, and still more because the results would be open to question. If people were thus moved from place to place, it would be almost impossible to be sure that all conditions except climate remained uniform. If the climate differed markedly in the two places, the houses, food and clothing would also have to be different. Social conditions would change. New interests would stimulate some people and depress others. Hence, no such experiment now seems practicable. 
The most available method is apparently to take a group of people who live in a variable climate and test them at all seasons. The best test is a man's daily work, the thing to which he devotes most of his time and energy. Accordingly, I took the records of four groups of people, namely some 500 factory operatives in three Connecticut cities, New Haven, New Britain, and Bridgeport, three or four thousand operatives in southern cities from Virginia to Florida, and over 1,700 students at the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis, and the Military Academy at West Point. In most cases, each person's record covered an entire year, or at least the academic year. All the records were compared with the weather, as explained in later chapters. The results were surprising. Changes in the barometer seem to have little effect. Humidity apparently possesses considerable importance, but the most important element is clearly temperature. The people here considered were physically most active when the average temperature ranged from 60 degrees to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. That is, when the noon temperature rose to 70 degrees or more, while the night temperature fell to 55 degrees or so. This is higher than many of us would expect. Mental activity, however, reached a maximum when the outside temperature averaged about 38 degrees Fahrenheit. That is, when there were mild frosts at night. Another highly important climatic condition seems to be the change of temperature from one day to the next. People did not work well when the temperature remained constant. Great changes were also unfavourable. The ideal condition, or optimum, seemed to be mild winters with some frosts, mild summers with a temperature rarely above 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and a constant succession of mild storms and moderate changes of weather from day to day. The facts just seem to be of great significance, as will be fully explained in this book. They suggest that the weather exerts a rather large and easily measurable effect upon man's capacity for both physical and mental work. This conclusion naturally led to a query as to how the climates in different parts of the world vary in their importance on human efficiency. Accordingly, I constructed a map showing how human energy would be distributed throughout the world if all the Earth's inhabitants were influenced as were the 15,000 people of the four American groups mentioned above. This map was found to agree, to a remarkable extent, with a map of the present distribution of civilization based on the opinions of about 50 geographers and other widely informed men in a dozen countries of America, Europe and Asia. Moreover, it agreed with the conclusions previously drawn as to the relation of climatic changes to the civilization of the past. Take, for example, the decadent countries as to whose past climate we have some definite idea. In practically every case, the climate during their more flourishing periods appears to have approached the optimum, as determined in the United States more nearly than the present. This does not mean that the climates of Egypt, North India, China, Greece, or the Maya regions in Guatemala were ever like that of either New York or California. It merely means that it approached more closely than at present to one or the other of these American types. Hence, at the time of its greatness, each region apparently enjoyed more than its present advantages in economic conditions, in freedom from parasitic diseases, and in direct climatic stimulus. When my investigations had reached this point, the first edition of Civilization and Climate was written. During the nine or ten years that have since elapsed, not only has much new evidence come to light, but my own point of view has changed considerably. The changes are set forth in the series of books and articles listed in the preface to the present third edition. They are referred to at some length in later chapters, but may here be briefly summarised. The comments on civilization and climate by historians and others make it more and more evident that the crux of the hypothesis of this book lies in changes of climate. The question, however, is not whether the climate of ancient Egypt, for example, was like that of modern England. It certainly was not and never could be. The contrast of the two countries in latitude, topography, and relation to land and sea makes any such close resemblance impossible. The real question is this. When Egypt rose to its greatest heights, did its climate approach appreciably nearer than now to the type which provides the optimum condition of energy, health, and economic strength 
for a people in the early Egyptian stage of development. Bear in mind that when the ancient Egyptians first rose to a state approaching civilization, they had not yet learned to use iron tools. Even in later days, they had nothing like our modern skill in using wood and coal for heating houses, in manufacturing cotton and woolen cloth on such a scale that even the poor can be warmly clothed, in building houses that are proof against wind, rain and cold. Nor had they our skill in combating disease. Hence their stage development caused the optimum climate to be warmer for them than for us. We are able to guard ourselves against low temperature and exposure, and thus gain an important stimulus without suffering much harm. They could not withstand cold winters. Bearing in mind, then, that the optimum climate varies according to a nation's stage of civilization, and also that there is doubtless some difference in the optimum from race to race, our problem becomes to determine how far the climate of the past in any given region was like that which is best for the stage of human progress, and perhaps the race with which we happen to be dealing. This point of view is slightly different from that of the first edition of this book. The change is due largely to Gilfillan's article on the Cold World Course of Progress in the Political Science Quarterly, 1920. So far as changes of climate are concerned, the ten years since this book was written have seen considerable new evidence as to the reality and nature of historic as well as prehistoric pulsations. As an entire new chapter will be devoted to this matter, and as the comment of Brooks on the convincing character of the evidence has already been quoted, it is evident to point out here an interesting fact as to the kind of people who have accepted the conclusions of this book. The non-scientific public which has doubtless been the widest audience of civilization and climate, has accepted the book on the reasonableness of its main hypothesis, and with an open mind as to future proof or disproof. Geologists, archaeologists, and those geographers who have had a geological training are the types of scientists who have found the hypothesis most convincing. This is because most of the methods of reasoning and lines of evidence employed in discussions of climate change are such as are commonly used in geology, archaeology, and geography. The evidence consists chiefly of ancient lakes and streams, old roads and deserts, dead vegetation and its rings of annual growth, abandoned fields and irrigation systems, and especially ruins and other traces of man, which are really human fossils. Such evidence appeals to geologists, archaeologists, and geologically trained geographers. Anthropologists, economists, and historians, on the other hand, have been slow to believe that climatic changes have had much influence upon human history. They accept, indeed, the geologist's conclusion that previous to recorded history, great climatic changes drove man this way and that, destroyed ancient types of culture, and either wiped whole races out of existence, or profoundly modified them physically, mentally, and socially. They apparently have no difficulty in accepting the geological evidence that among primitive men, as among plants and animals, climate has been one of the most powerful factors in determining the distribution and vigour of different types. But when it comes to the period of written history, many historians, and some anthropologists and economists, no longer trust the geological methods of reasoning. Their opinions are more or less unconsciously moulded by two widely accepted assumptions. The first assumption is that climatic uniformity is a normal condition. This idea seems wholly untenable in view of the constantly growing evidence of numerous and important glacial periods and other extreme types of climate at all stages in geological history. The more we know of the geological record, the more clear it becomes that change, not uniformity, is the rule. Even in the long periods when the larger types of climatic changes have been absent, there is abundant evidence of minor fluctuations and pulsations. The second assumption is equally doubtful. It holds that written records and statistics are more reliable than the geological type of evidence. Of course, written records and statistics are far more reliable than any other types of evidence if they are sufficiently full, if they can be trusted, and if they are prepared by people who are conscious of the purpose for which they are to be used. But the written and recorded evidence as to the climate of the past consists of mere scraps of information set down in most cases accidentally 
and with no idea of their possible significance in the distant future. Such evidence has, of course, great value, and must be studied assiduously. Nevertheless, it is inevitably subordinate to the geological type of evidence, which may be either physiographic, botanical, or archaeological. It seems clear, then, that the ultimate decision as to whether climatic changes have taken place on a large scale during historical times does not rest with historians. It rests primarily with persons who are trained in climatological and especially geological methods. During the last ten years, geographers, as a whole, in spite of some exceptions, seem to have become persuaded that the historical period has witnessed a series of climatic pulsations like those of the prehistoric or post-glacial period, although on a small scale. According to the prone written statement in answer to a questionnaire, over nine-tenths of the geographers of America, if we may judge from the fifty who have expressed their opinions, hold this view, although they are not quite so fully agreed as to how great the effect of these pulsations upon man may have been. Of course it is possible that a few geographers fail to answer the questionnaire because they do not wish to express an opinion contrary to mine. I think, however, that the number of such is very limited. For most of those who are known to hold views unlike my own expressed them freely. Even when all due allowance is made for failures to answer, it seems clear that among the people who are best competent to weigh the evidence, the great majority believe in pulsations of climate. If these geographers with their geological training are right, there seems to be no escape from the conclusion that during certain periods of Asian history, the climate of places like Egypt, Mesopotamia, and North India approached the Octum more closely than at present. Since the lower stage of culture in those early days presumably caused the Octum temperature for human progress to be higher than is now the case among the most advanced races, the climatic conditions were even more favourable than I realised when this book was first written. If this conclusion is well grounded, it becomes a basic fact which the historian must take into account, just as every careful student of early man now continually takes account of the fact that primitive man was greatly influenced by the vicissitudes of the successive glacial epochs, and just as every economist recognises that modern man, on a small scale, is profoundly influenced by good or bad crops. History can never be written correctly until its physical basis is thoroughly understood, and until it is recognised that economic conditions, the human health and energy, vary from age to age, almost as much as do the conditions of politics, religion and personality. Another line, where there has been much progress in the last ten years, is the determination of the nature and importance of the climatic optimum for man's physical development and health, as opposed to his economic development. After civilization and climate had been completed, I undertook a study of the relation of deaths to climate. The results appeared in world power and evolution. Some eight and a half million deaths in about 60 cities in the United States and 30 in France and Italy were analyzed according to the average weather of each month during periods which in most cases amounted to at least 10 years. Except for about 400,000 in the United States, all the deaths occurred during the normal period immediately preceding the Great War. In addition to this, about 50 million deaths in other countries were analysed less intensively, but with essentially the same results. On the other hand, about 700,000 deaths in New York from 1877 to 1888 have been very minutely analysed according to the day of death. For the six years from 1883 to 1888, the number of deaths each day is being compared with the weather day by day during the two weeks ending with the day of death. In another investigation, 7,200 deaths from lobar pneumonia in New York in 1913 were compared with the weather for each day. Again, in the two largest hospitals in Boston, the relation of the weather to 2,300 deaths succeeding operations was looked into. At a later date, the death rate during the influenza epidemic of 1918 in the United States was analysed by still a different method in order to determine whether the weather had any effect in altering the rate from city to city. 
The net results of these investigations, as shown in World Power and Evolution, and in various technical articles, agree closely with those of the investigation of factory workers and students. They confirm the work of other investigators in showing almost beyond question that there is a distinct optimum condition of climate for man, just as for plants and animals. This optimum varies relatively little from one set of people to another, or from place to place. Even for Negroes, the departure from the white standard is by no means so large as would be expected, though it is unmistakable. Any departure from the optimum for a given race or individual seems to render people not only less efficient, but also more susceptible to disease and hence an easier prey to bacteria and other parasites. Moreover, as appears in world power and evolution, there is some evidence that departures from the optimum climate render people less buoyant, less capable of prolonged and steady mental activity, and correspondingly less likely to make progress. The significant fact about the whole matter is that, so far as I am aware, in every case where large bodies of people have been carefully analysed, the same minor responses to climate become evident, even though there may be differences in details. Thus the progress of the last ten years seems to add appreciably to the general certainty as to the nature and importance of climatic optima, and as to the effect of departures therefrom upon health, efficiency and progress. The difference between the present and first editions of this book in respect to natural selection and racial inheritance is especially important. It may be illustrated by ancient Greece. In the first edition, I suppose that the reason for the peculiar ability of Greece was a mystery which there was no immediate prospect of solving. It was a result of some unexplained biological processes. I believe that no matter where those particular people might have gone, or what period they had happened to live, they would have achieved much more than any ordinary people. As events actually shaped themselves, the ancient Greeks migrated to a land near more ancient centres of civilization, whence they could receive the inspiration of the greatest preceding cultures. By reason of the numerous gulfs and harbours of their land, the Greeks were easily able to get what they wanted from other countries, provided they had energy enough to sail abroad for material riches, and capacity enough to absorb the mental riches with which they came in contact. So far as climate is concerned, Greece appears to have enjoyed unusually favourable conditions throughout most of the period from perhaps 1000 to 300 BC, and especially about 400 BC. Previous to 1100 BC, however, there seems to have been an unfavourable period culminating perhaps 1,300 to 1,200 years before Christ, while at a later date, a period of rapid climatic degeneration from 300 to 200 BC was followed by highly unfavorable conditions during the succeeding century. The favorable climate during the period of the greatest Grecian development apparently rendered the economic conditions distinctly more favorable than those of today and stimulated the Greeks to a higher degree of physical and mental energy. At the same time, it rendered the environment unfavorable not only to the Anopheles mosquito, which causes malaria, but to other disease-bearing organisms. Thus the Greeks, with their high inheritance, enjoyed an environment which gave full opportunity for the development of the best that was in them. The fall of Greece, according to the hypothesis set forth in this book ten years ago, was greatly influenced by a rapid deterioration of climate. In the 3rd century BC, a decrease in rainfall caused the most serious diminution in the capacity of Greece to support population. This increased the political difficulties, while at the same time the ability of the people to cope with such difficulties was diminished by decline in the stimulating qualities of the climate. At the same time, the increase in marshes and stagnant pools because of changed conditions of rainfall, made the environment favourable for malarial mosquitoes, while poverty, a poor food supply, and other adverse conditions also fostered disease. In general, the poor economic and political situation and the unfavourable conditions of health tended to kill off the blonde and horse invaders, who seem to have been the leaders among the early Greeks. 
At present, my view of the rise and fall of Greece differs from the one set forth above in only one respect, but that is highly important. Instead of recognizing natural selection as an important cause merely of the decline of Greece, I now regard it as one of the main causes of the rise of that country. The people who made Greece great, as I have shown in detail in the character of races, were primarily the Dorians and especially the Ionians. These people appear to have originated far to the north, perhaps in the great plains of Russia. They came to Greece in a series of migrations, the first of which may have been that of the Achaeans in the 14th century before Christ, while a later invasion culminated in the Dorian invasion two or three centuries later. The Ionians appear to have been largely Greeks of the old Achaean and Minoan upper class, who were led to migrate by the prolonged disturbances and fighting which harassed Greece for generations and perhaps centuries after the Dorian invasion. Attica had previously been almost depopulated and did not attract the Dorians because it was infertile and poverty stricken by reason of its dryness. Later, however, perhaps in part because of the amelioration of climate, it became the refuge of large numbers of the old upper classes from the rest of Greece. When its population became too dense, some of the settlers, together with many of the more able and energetic people from other parts of Greece, went across the Aegean Sea eastward to the Ionian coast of Asia Minor. Now we are expressly told by Thucydides and others, not only that the settlers in Attica were a highly selected group from the leading families of the rest of Greece, but that they strenuously kept themselves apart from the lower classes. Even if an Athenian married a woman of the lower classes, his children followed the social status of the mother and not the father. Thus among the citizens of Athens, a selected inheritance was kept almost unimpaired for many centuries. But note another important fact. Not only was there a rigid selection of good material when the Ionians settled in Athens, but there appears to have been a perhaps more rigorous selection during the earlier migrations of the people who finally became Greeks. Every migration is more or less selective because the weak, the feeble, the cowardly, and those lacking the spirit of adventure, together with those who lack determination, are gradually weeded out. The longer and more difficult the migration, the more strenuous is the selection, especially among women and children. All but the most vigorous, both mentally and physically, are weeded out with peculiar rapidity. Thus the net result of practically every long or difficult migration in which women as well as men take part is to pick out a relatively small group of people of unusual capacity. The group may contain only one out of twenty, or one out of one hundred or a thousand of the original stock. Now the Athenians, as we have just seen, went through this selection twice, and may have gone through it at earlier times also. They also maintain the quality of the original stock more or less completely by refraining from intermarriage with any but the elite of other regions, and by various practices such as infanticide, which eliminated weaklings. Such selection with various modifications has been, I believe, one of the most effective factors in producing competent races. But what has this to do with climate? Much, because a large number of the migrations of history appear to have been more or less directly started by climatic vicissitudes. For example, the Irish migration to America during the 19th century was due largely to the fact that a series of good potato harvests in the early decades of the century permitted the population of Ireland to increase enormously. Then it came a series of unduly rainy years, accompanied by bad crops. Famine and distress ensued, and immediately an enormous migration to America set in. In later years, as is shown by Bruckner's data, which I have cited in an article on A Neglected Factor in Race Development, Journal of Race Development, October 1915. The migrations from Ireland, and likewise from Germany to the United States, have varied in close harmony with the climatic conditions and consequent agricultural prosperity of both the old world and the new. When the crops are bad in Europe but good in America, as is not uncommon, emigration from the old world is greatly stimulated for a few years. On the contrary, a period of bad crops in America coincided with good crops in Europe, gradually diminishes the pressure which leads to migration. Similar examples on a large scale have occurred from time after time in the history of China, Central Asia, 
and other regions. Contrary to the common belief, most parts of the world normally contain practically as large a population as they are capable of holding under the social and economic conditions which happen to prevail at any given time and place. The birth rate among mankind, as Carl Saunders convincingly shows in The Population Problem, is so large and responds so quickly to economic changes that only a few decades or generations are required for even a relatively depopulated country to fill up to what Woodruff in his expansion of races, as called the saturation point. Thus the great majority of migrations can be understood only by thinking of all parts of the world as normally having nearly their full quota of population. Among primitive hunting tribes, for example, this quota may mean only one person per square mile, while in a modern highly civilised community it may mean a thousand per square mile. The conditions are like those of a bucket filled to the brim of water. As soon as any object is dropped into the bucket, some water runs over. In the same way, in most parts of the world, any deterioration of economic conditions, such as frequently arises from bad crops, immediately necessitates either a lowering of the standard of living or a diminution of population through an increased death rate by reason of poverty, famine or war, or through migration. A migration, as a rule, is merely a slow drifting of people with unusual energy and initiative from unfavourable to favourable districts, but not infrequently, and especially after one of the sudden climatic vicissitudes which have been common in history, it becomes a violent stream of invasion, such as many of the barbarian outpourings about 1400 to 1200 years before Christ, and again at various later periods. The original Greeks apparently took part in extensive wanderings of both the mild and violent kind, and natural selection presumably worked among them effectively. The net result was a highly selective race which gave the world a marvellous group of famous men. These men, it appears, accomplished great things, not only because of their high innate qualities, but because growing favourable climatic conditions from six to four hundred years before Christ improved their economic situation and helped to give them great energy and splendid health. According to this view, Greece apparently lost her ability partially because the fine original stock became mingled with weaker elements, and partially because the change of climate, which began soon after 400 BC, and which took place most rapidly, from 300 to 200 BC, not only enabled malaria to spread with baleful rapidity, but introduced a stage of diminishing resources, scanty food supply, overpopulation, and lessened climatic stimulus. These factors presumably combined with other well-known conditions to produce poor health and perhaps restriction of families among the upper classes, thus killing off the old dominant stock of northern origin. Hence the racial elements to which Greece owed her greatest disappeared, and the country fell into intellectual insignificance. Other factors undoubtedly cooperated, but such conditions as political corruption, social degeneracy, and undue personal ambition are probably results of racial decay and poor health, quite as much as causes. The essential point is that, at the beginning, a time of climatic stress among nomads in relatively cool grasslands seems to have led to migration and a favourable type of selection. Another period of similar stress and a highly developed people in a relatively southern land where there was less opportunity or incentive for migration, led to the dying off of the more able people. Yet even in this case, many of the most competent Greeks migrated, thus still farther impoverishing the mother country and giving rise to highly gifted colonies like the Alexandrian community in Egypt. To sum up the whole hypothesis of the relation of climate to civilization, here are the factors as I see them at present. Most parts of the world are so well populated that any adverse economic change tends to cause distress, disease, and a high death rate. Migration ensures among the more energetic and adventurous people. Perhaps the commonest cause of economic distress is variations in weather or climate which lead to bad crops or to dearth of grass and water for animals. Such economic distress almost inevitably leads to political disturbances, and this again is a potent cause of migrations. The people who migrate, perforce, expose themselves to hardships, and their numbers diminish until only a selected group of unusually high quality remains. Such people 
either as warlike invaders or in small bands, enter a new country. They may find it well populated and merely impose themselves as a new ruling class, as seems to have happened several times in India, or they may find it depleted of people as in Attica. When the period of climatic stress is ended and the climate improves, the dominant newcomers not only possess an unusually strong inheritance, but are stimulated by unusually good economic conditions and by improved conditions of health and energy. Moreover, since the population is apt to remain below this saturation point so long as the climate improves, the standards of living tend to rise and to become relatively high. Thus, many people are freed from the mere necessity of making a living and have the opportunity to devote themselves to development of new ideas in literature, art, science, politics and other lines of progress. The repeated coincidence between periods of improved climate and periods of cultural progress appears to be due not only to the direct stimulus of climate, as I supposed in the first edition of this book, but to that stimulus combined with a higher racial inheritance due to natural selection. This, I am well aware, by no means offers a complete explanation of history, for many other elements must also be considered. But it helps to explain many historic events which have hitherto been only partially understood. Here, once more, is a sequence. Climatic changes produce economic results through an increase or a diminution of the food supply. Thus there arises either a temporary condition of underpopulation with comparative political tranquility and opportunities for the growth and expanse of civilization, or a condition of overpopulation with consequent political turmoil, war, migration, and the repression of civilization. This point of view was dominant when I wrote The Pulse of Asia and Palestine and its transformation. Climatic changes also appear to have direct effect in stimulating or repressing man's physical activity, a viewpoint which dominated the first edition of the present book. It is obvious that through their effect upon food, insects, bacteria, and man's own powers of resistance, climatic changes must exert a great influence upon disease. Hence, I was led to write World Power and Evolution from the standpoint of disease and the death rate, but this does not end the matter. For climate apparently exerts a direct selective effect in preserving a certain type of people and destroying others, and it certainly exerts these effects indirectly through various conditions already mentioned. Therefore, it was only logical that the character of races should centre around natural selection, especially in its climatic aspects. The next step is obviously a study of the relation of climate to mutations, and thus to the origin of the new types among which natural selection makes its choice. But that is as yet impossible. Beyond this lies a synthesis of the effects which climate produces through economic and political conditions, through war and migration, food and natural resources, energy and health, and through natural selection and mutations, and all these results of the climatic environment must be put into due relation not only with the results of the other factors of physical environment, but with the opposite side of the shield, that is, with the purely human factors such as institutions, customs, ideas, and all man's passions, ideals, and aspirations. Then it will be possible to form a true philosophy of history. Meanwhile, the present edition of Civilization and Climate tries to take a broader and deeper view of human progress than its predecessor but it makes no claim to deal exhaustively with more than one small phase of matter, namely the direct effects of climate upon human health and energy. End of section 1For more information on to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 2. Race or Place The problem which confronts us is primarily to separate the direct effects of climate from those of inheritance, regardless of whether the inheritance has been influenced by the climate of the past. It may be made concrete by comparing two sharply contrasted races, Teutons and Negroes. Suppose that there were two uninhabited Egypts, exactly alike, and that one could be filled with Negroes and the other with Teutons. 
Suppose that these settlers were average members of their races, and were equipped with the same religion, education, government, social institutions, and inventions. This might easily happen if the Negroes came from the United States. Suppose, further, that neither race received new settlers from without, or lost any except through natural selection. Which would succeed best? The Teutons, of course, is the answer. What a foolish question! But is it so foolish? You were thinking of the first generations. I am thinking of the twentieth or later. Does anyone know what five hundred or a thousand years of life in Egypt would do to either Teutons or Negroes if no new blood were introduced? At the end of that time, the two sets of people would assuredly be different, for the effect of a diverse inheritance would last indefinitely. The advantage in this respect would presumably be on the side of the Teutons. I wish to emphasize this matter, for I shall have much to say about the effect of climate, and I want to make it perfectly clear that I do not underrate the importance of race. Although the matter is by no means settled, many authorities think that the brain of the white man is more complex than that of his black brother. Strong in the Pedagogical Seminary for 1913, and Morris in the Popular Science Monthly for 1914, have shown that in Columbia, South Carolina, the white children are mentally more advanced than the coloured. By applying the Binet test to 225 children in two white schools and to 125 children in a coloured school, they obtain the following table, showing the amount by which the two races exceed or fell short of what would be expected. More than one year backward. Coloured, 29.4%. White, 10.2%. Satisfactory. Coloured, 69.8%. White, 84.4%. More than one year advanced. Coloured, 0.8%. White, 5.3%. Among the white children, those from the middle classes made a better showing than those of factory operatives, but both were ahead of the coloured. So far as home environment is concerned, the factory children have almost no advantage over the coloured children. A slight advantage may possibly arise from the fact that when the Binet tests were originally devised, they were designed to measure the capacities of white children. The Negro race may have capacities which the white does not possess, and which do not play a part in the tests. In appreciation of humour, for example, and the equability of temperament, there can be little question that the black man surpasses the white. These things, however, can scarcely account for the fact that 29.4% of the coloured children showed a mental development more than a year behind that which would be expected from their age, while only 10.2% of the white children were equally backward. So far as I am aware, every exact test which has been made on a large scale indicates mental superiority on the part of the white race, even when the two races have equal opportunities. For example, in Washington, the coloured children remain in school quite as long as the white but they do not accomplish so much in the way of study and do not reach so high a grade. In the cities of the South, Mayo and Loram find that when the races are given essentially the same instruction, the proportion of whites who are promoted is greater than that of Negroes. Moreover, the difference seems to indicate with years, which suggests that the average colored child not only stands below the average white child in mental development at all ages, but ceases to develop at an earlier age. In the high schools of New York, the superiority of the white race is shown by Mayo's examination of the average marks. By the time the children reach high school, the processes of promotion have weeded out a much larger proportion of coloured children than of white. Hence the Negroes form a specially selected group whose superiority to the average of their race is more marked than the superiority of the white high school children were compared with the rest of the white race. Nevertheless, the average marks of the white children are distinctly higher than those in the coloured. In order to test the capacity of the two races in a wholly different way, I have made a comparison of white and coloured workmen employed under precisely similar conditions. The first case was a cigar factory at Jacksonville, Florida. The employees were practically all Cubans. Both the whites and the blacks have very little education, and their home environment in Cuba differs to only the smallest extent. They earn good wages, but are often out of work, and are generally shiftless and unreliable. There is, of course, no colour line in Cuba, and the same is true in the cigar factories. 
black men and white work side by side at the same tables in such a factory if the black man is as capable as the white he has exactly as good a chance for he is paid by the piece and his earnings depend entirely on himself what then do we find taking all the operatives we have thirty-nine white and sixty-five negroes their average earnings as measured by the wages of two weeks are in the ratio of one hundred for the whites to only fifty-one for the negroes to make the comparison more favourable to the negroes let us eliminate those who roll low-grade cigars where little skill is required and the pay is low we then have thirty-nine white men and forty-four negroes they are doing exactly the same work under exactly the same conditions but the whites earn a dollar where the negroes earn seventy-five cents at a similar factory at tampa florida seventeen coloured men were at work and three hundred and three white in this case practically all of the few negroes happened to be men of long experience while many of the whites were comparatively new nevertheless the whites are still on a par with the coloured men the ratio being one hundred to ninety nine point eight one of the best places for comparing the two races is the bahama islands for reasons which i shall present later the process of making poor whites has probably gone farther in the bahamas than in almost any other anglo-saxon community part of the white people are like their race in other regions but a large portion have unmistakably degenerated witness their intense and bigoted speech their sunken cheeks and eyes their sallow complexion and their inert way of working in spite of racial prejudice there is no real color line in the bahamas Persons with more or less Negro blood are worthy occupants of the highest positions and are universally accepted in the most exclusive social circles. The British government gives the Negro every possible opportunity. The state of affairs may be judged from the remarks of a poor white sailor who said to me, You want to know why I likes the southern states better than the north? It's because they hate a nigger and I hates him too. What kind of a place is this where they do everything for the nigger and nothing for the white man? It's bad enough to have to go to jail, but it's damned hard for a white man to be taken there by a nigger constable. In one Bahaman village, I saw negro girls teaching white children in the public school. In that same village, a number of the leading white men cannot read or write. When they were children, their parents would not send them to school with negroes. The despised negroes learned to read and write, but have now largely forgotten those accomplishments. The proud whites grew up in abject ignorance. Today the same thing is going on. I visited two villages where the white children are staying away from school because they will not go to Negro teachers. The homes of such whites are scarcely better than those of their colored neighbors, and their fathers are called Jim and Jack by the black men with whom they work. Racial prejudice apparently works more harm to the whites than the blacks. So far as occupations go, there is no difference, for all alike till the soil, sell boats, and gather sponges. When the lumber industry was introduced into the islands, whites and blacks were equally ignorant of the various kinds of work involved in cutting trees and converting them into lumber. The managers did not care who did the work so long as it was done. They wanted three things, strength, docility, or faithfulness, and brains. They soon found that in the first two, the Negroes were superior. Time and again, persons in authority, chiefly Americans, but also some of the more capable native whites, told me that if they wanted a crew of men to load a boat, or some such thing, they would prefer Negroes every time. The poor white shirks more than the colored man. He is not so strong, and he is proud and touchy. Other things being equal, the Negro receives the preference. But other things are not equal. The very men who praise the Negroes generally added, But you can't use a Negro for everything. They can't seem to learn some things, and they don't know how to boss a job. The payroll reflects this. Even though the Negroes receive the preference, the 400 who are employed earn on an average only about 60% as much as the 57 white men. If we take only the 57 most competent Negroes, their average daily wages are still only 88% as great as those of the native whites. The difference is purely a matter of brains. Although the white man may be ignorant and inefficient, with no more training than the Negro, and although his father and grandfather were scarcely better, he possesses an inheritance of mental quickness and initiative which comes into evidence at the first opportunity. 
all these considerations seem to point to an ineradicable racial difference in mentality. As a plum differs from the apple, not only in outward form and color, but in inward flavor, so the negro seems to differ from the white man, not only in feature and complexion, but in the workings of the mind. No amount of training can eradicate the difference. Cultivation may give us superb plums, but it will never take the place of apples. We have tried to convert the black man into an inferior white man, but it cannot be done. Initiative, inventiveness, versatility, and the power of leadership are the qualities which give favour to the Teutonic race. Good humour, patience, loyalty, and the power of self-sacrifice give favour to the Negro. With proper training, he can accomplish wonders. No one can go to a place like Hampton Institute without feeling that there is almost no limit to what may be achieved by cultivation. In an orderly, quiet way, those Negro boys and girls go about their daily tasks and give one the feeling that they are making a real contribution to the world's welfare. To be sure, they walk slowly. They are not brilliant in their classes. They really have new ideas in their manual work. But yet they are faithful. The willing, happy spirit of their work is something that we nervous, worried white people need sorely to learn. Once in a long time there comes a leader, a man to whom both white and black look up. But such leadership is scarcely the genius of the race. Yet leadership is what the black man must have. At such places as Hampton he gets it, and one realises that the white man's initiative, joined to the Christian spirit, which is there so dominant, can give a training which overcomes much of the handicap of race. Having turned aside to pay tribute to the potency of race, education and religion in determining the status of civilization, let us come back to physical environment. What part does this play? Is it so important that a strong race in an unfavorable climate is likely to make no better showing than a weak race in a favorable climate? How far can a bad climate undo the effect of a good training? In answer to these questions, we may well compare the Teutonic and Negro races when each is removed from the climate in which it originally developed. Before proceeding to this, a word should be added to forestall any possible misunderstanding of my attitude towards the southern parts of the United States and toward the progressive regions which, nevertheless, suffer somewhat from climatic handicaps. In searching for the truth, I shall be forced to say some things which may not be wholly pleasing to residents of such regions. It must be clearly understood, however, that these are not stated on my own authority. All are based either on the consensus of opinion among a large number of persons, including many Southerners, or upon the exact figures of the United States Census or other equally reliable sources. My part has been simply to interpret them, believing that the South contains a great number of people who in all essential respects have an inheritance equal to that of the best northern stocks. I have tried to find out why the southern part of the United States has prospered less than the northern. This does not mean that I reject the old ideas as to the cause, but simply that I emphasize another which has not received sufficient consideration. It does not discredit the South, nor its people. It does not alter the fact that Southerners possess a courtesy and thoughtfulness which we of the worried and hurried North need greatly to imitate. Nor does it mean that men of genius are not as likely to be born in one section as another. Instead of this, it merely indicates that in addition to the many efforts now being made to foster progress in the South, by other means, we should add a most vigorous attempt to discover ways of overcoming the handicap of climate. This book is written with the profound hope that the truth which it endeavours to discover may especially help those parts of the world whose climate, although favourable, does not afford the high degree of stimulation which in certain other restricted areas is so helpful. Let us first undertake a study of what the census shows as to Negroes and whites in different parts of the United States. The only people whom we can compare with accuracy are the farmers, for they are the only ones for whom exact statistics are available. Fortunately, they are part of the community where social prejudices and other hampering conditions have the smallest influence. The prosperity of the farmer, more than that of almost any other class of society, depends upon his own individual effort. If he is industrious, he need never fear that he and his family will have a roof over their heads and something to eat. Even when the crops are bad, he rarely is in danger of suffering as factory operatives often suffer. 
at least not in the eastern United States, with which alone we are now concerned. Moreover, the prejudice against coloured people has little effect upon farmers. No one hesitates to buy vegetables peddled by a darky farmer. Finally, farming in the occupation in which the South has been least hampered as compared with the North for over half a century, the Negro has been able to buy land freely in any part of the country. The Southerners, whether white or black, have suffered economically because of slavery and the consequent war, but they have a good soil and a climate far better for agriculture than that of the North, and they have peculiarly good opportunities to raise tobacco and cotton, two of the greatest money-making crops in the world. Taken all in all, the farmers of the country ought to show the relative capacities of different races, and of the same race under different conditions, better than almost any other class of people. In 1904, the United States Census Bureau published a bulletin on the Negro. From that, I have prepared Table 1, showing the relative conditions in four groups of stats in 1900. Table 1 is displayed on the following page. Comparison of white and Negro farmers in the northern and southern parts of the United States. The first row of numbers, line 1, shows the total number of white and coloured farmers. The second row shows that the farms of the northern white men average about 100 acres in size, while those of the southern white men are larger. The coloured farms, on the other hand, have an average size of about 50 acres. In the next row of figures, line 3, we notice that the northerners forge ahead. Even in the relatively hilly states of New York and Pennsylvania, the white farmers have improved 63.5 acres per farm, or 69% of the whole leaving only 31% in the rough state of bushes or woods. The northern Negroes do exactly as well in proportion to their holdings, for they have cleared 33.0 acres, which is also 69% of the average farm. In the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida, on the contrary, the white men have improved only 34% of their land, and the colored men 58%. For the states farther west, comparison B, Approximately similar conditions prevail. The Negroes are obliged to clear a larger percentage than the whites because their small holdings would not otherwise furnish living. The significance of the figures lies in the fact that the Northerners, whether white or black, show more energy in improving their land than do the Southerners of the same kind. Since this table was in print, the corresponding data for 1910 and 1920 have appeared. Unfortunately, they are less full than for 1900, and do not include the value of products. Line 9, for line 4, in the percentage for each of the three census years, are as follows. Table 2 is displayed on the page. In comparison A, the gain of the other groups in relation to the northern white farmers is noticeable. This, however, does not mean merely that agriculture is improving in the south, but that it is declining in the middle Atlantic states. In B, the percentages are almost unchanged. In both comparisons of Table 1, Item 4 and 9 are the most significant. They show the value of the farms and the value of the annual products. In each item of Table 1, the values are stated in dollars, as given in the census report, while underneath I have added percentages. In computing the percentages, the highest value is reckoned as 100%, and the rest figured accordingly. In each item of both comparisons, for all three census years, as given in Table 2, the northern whites stand at the top. In general, taking both comparisons into account, the northern white man's farm is worth twice as much as that of his colored neighbor, and he gets twice as much from it. The southern white man has a farm worth less than that of the northern negro, but he gets from it approximately the same amount of products. The southern negro's farm is worth less than half as much as a southern white man's, and it gets from at about two-thirds as much. Taking all the farms from our four groups of states and reckoning them according to the value of what they actually produced in 1900 and of their value in 1920, the census ranks them as shown in Table 3. Table 3 is displayed on the page. The relative efficiency of white and negro farmers in the north and south. This little table possesses profound significance. It shows unmistakably two types of contrast. First, there is the racial contrast, 
the result of long inheritance. That apparently is what makes the Negroes fall below the whites in both the North and the South. There is also a climatic contrast that apparently is why the Negroes who come to the North rise above the usual level of their race, while the whites of the South fall below the level of theirs. I realize that the contrast between the two sections is explained in a hundred ways by as many different people. One ascribes it to the fact that slavery was a poor system economically. Another says that the South is cursed for having consented to the sin of slavery. Again, we are told that the predicament of the South is due to the war of succession, the failure to develop manufacturers, the absence of roads and railroads, bad methods of farming, the presence of the Negro making the white man despise labor, and many other equally important causes which cannot here be named. Still, other authorities ascribe the condition of the South to its supposed settlement by adventurers, whereas the North had its pilgrims. I would not minimize the importance of these factors. All are of real significance, and if it had been different, the South would not be quite what it is. All depend upon two fundamental conditions of race or inheritance, and place or climate. Yet, in the contrast between the North and South, the climatic effects seem to be the more potent. Slavery failed to flourish in the North, not because of any moral objection to it, for the most godly Puritans held slaves, but because the climate made it unprofitable. In a climate where the white man was tremendously energetic, and where a living could be procured only by hard and unremitted work, it did not pay to keep slaves. For the labour of such incompetent people scarcely sufficed to provide even themselves with living, and left little profit for their masters. In the South, slavery was profitable because even the work of an inefficient Negro more than sufficed to produce enough to support him. Moreover, the white man was not energetic, and his manual work was not of much more value than that of a Negro. Hence, it was easy to forward to the habit of using his superior brain and letting the black man perform the physical labour. If the Puritans had settled in Georgia, it is probable that they would have become proud slaveholders, despising manual work. So far as inheritance is concerned, the white southerners, according to the generally accepted principles of biology, must be essentially as well off as the white men of the north. New England has probably had a certain advantage from the strong fibre of her early settlers, but that section is excluded from our comparison because it has so few coloured farmers. In New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and the states farther west, the white farmers in 1900 were of highly mixed origin, and there is little reason to think that they inherit any greater capacity than do the white men of the south. Hence we infer that the difference shown by the census is largely a matter of climate. It has arisen partially by indirect means such as slavery and disease, partially by direct means such as disinclination to physical exertion. This demands emphasis for what we are told that the South needs nothing but a fair opportunity, plenty of capital and abundant roads, railroads and factories, or else it needs only education, a new respect for one race for the other, cooperation between the two for the sake of the common good, and a deeper application of the principles of Christ. All these things are sadly needed, but it is doubtful whether they can work their full effect unless supplemented by new knowledge of how to neutralise the climatic influences which seem to underlie so many southern problems. In the climate of the south, a part of the white population becomes a prey to malaria, the hookworm, and other debilitating ailments. People cease to be careful about food and sanitation. Even those who are in good health do not feel the eager zest for work, which is so notable in the parts of the world where the climatic stimulus is at a maximum. Thus one thing joins with another to cause a part of the people to fall far below the level of their race and to become poor whites or crackers. These increase in number as one passes from a more to a less favourable climate. It is their run-down unkept farms which bring the average of the southern whites so dangerously near the level of the Negroes. The best farms in the south vary with those of the north. They show what could be done if all the inhabitants could be instilled with the energy and wisdom of the best. Aside from North America, the only large area where Teutons and Negroes come into direct contact as permanent inhabitants is South Africa. There they meet on practically equal terms. The English and Boers began to settle in South Africa in large numbers only in the first half of the 19th century. In 1921, the South African Republic contained about 
500,000 Europeans, 4,700,000 Bantu natives, and 700,000 other natives and Asiatics. A large proportion of the white men were not born there, and hence the new conditions have not had time to produce their full effect. The majority of the natives are Zulus, but the most capable appear to be the Basutors, an allied race who have preserved a large measure of their independence in the Drakenberg Mountains. Both the Zulus and the Basutors came from the north a few generations ago. Some precede the white man and some have come since his arrival. The coloured people are most numerous in the north and east of the Republic, that is, in Rhodesia and in Natal. The white men are most abundant in the south and in the central plateau, that is, in Cape Colony, Orange River Colony and Transvaal. With ever-increasing force, however, the blacks are pushing into the white man's country. They are brought as labourers for the mines. They are wanted for the farms. They are in demand as servants. And they are themselves taking up farms and successfully cultivating them. They are doing more than this, however, for they are actually ousting the Europeans. In 1902, the English and Boers finished a bit of war. Ten years later, their enmity had almost vanished in the common fear of the Negro. Aside from the disturbances due to the European War of 1914, the great political question has long been the black man. One party advocates segregation, while a white man's South Africa in the highlands from Transvaal southward and a black man's South Africa in Natal and Rhodesia. No black man, they say, should be allowed to live permanently outside his own country, though he might go elsewhere to work temporarily. The other party holds that such measures are too radical, but it also recognises the gravity of the situation. The problem presents itself under an economic guise. The coloured men have a lower standard of living than the whites, hence they work more cheaply. They furnish so abundant a supply of labour that white labourers have no chance. Thus a large number of the Europeans, even a tenth according to ardent believers in the future of South Africa, are poor whites. They are a shiftless set, living from hand to mouth, proud of their race, yet less efficient than the blacks. The problem of preventing them from becoming an immediate charge upon the community is serious. They lack the push and energy which characterise the rest of the white population. According to Stevens in his book, White and Black, 5% of the white population in certain regions have fallen so low that they would rather resort to crime than work in competition with a black man. These figures have been questioned, but they are abundantly confirmed by Dr. Andrew Balfour, Director-in-Chief of the Wellcome Bureau of Scientific Research in London. In some lectures on sojourners in the tropics and problems of acclimatization, published in The Lancet in 1923, he states that he referred the matter to Colonel P.G. Stock of the Ministry of Health, who knows South Africa intimately, and he confirmed Huntington's statement, pointing out, however, that in parts of the Transvaal, chronic malaria may be to blame. The most sinister fact is that these poor whites appear to have been largely born in the country. The newcomers are on the whole more energetic, they find employment, and if they have difficulty in one place, move on to another. The poor whites lack the initiative to do this. If they fall into difficulties, they tend to lie down and give up. They need higher wages than the blacks in order to maintain their traditional standard of living. They are not efficient enough to get higher wages. If they had the restless energy which characterised the children and grandchildren of emigrants from Europe in Canada, for example, they would scarcely fall into such straits. Since the problem is economic, the South Africans are striving to apply economic remedies. This is wise, but success is doubtful unless other factors are also considered. Back of the economic facts, and in many ways conditioning them, lies the climate. South Africa is supposed to have a climate admirably adapted to Europeans. I shared the common opinion until I began to gather statistics on the effect of climate upon efficiency. These, as will be shown later, indicate that although the South African climate is pleasant, it lacks the stimulating qualities which are so important in Europe and North America. This lack of stimulus increases rapidly as one goes from south to north. Here, then, is the situation that confronts us. In South Africa, the white men settled first in the regions most favourable 
from a climatic point of view, and then pushed northward into worse conditions. Even the best parts of South Africa cannot approach England and Holland in the excellence of their climate. Hence the white settlers are everywhere at a disadvantage. On the other hand, the Bantu Negroes have come into South Africa from the north, where the climate is far less favourable than in their new homes. Thus the two races face each other under conditions which lessen the white man's energy while they stimulate the black man. The whites are still far ahead, and will Dallas continue to be so indefinitely? Nevertheless, the weaker ones are being weeded out and prepared for destruction. What the final result will be, no man can say. It depends upon whether we can discover a means of preventing the deterioration which now seems to attack a portion of the population when people move from a good climate to a worse. A more striking case than that of South Africa is found in the Bahama Islands. At the time of the American Revolution, a considerable number of loyalists were so faithful to England that they sacrificed their all in order to escape from the new flag with its stars and stripes. Leaving their homes in Georgia and other southern states, they sought the British territory of the Bahamas. Other colonists came from Great Britain. Now, after from three to five generations, the new environment has had more opportunity than in South Africa to produce its full effect. Almost nowhere else in all the world have people of the English race lived as genuine colonists for several generations in so tropical a climate. What has been the result? There can be but one answer. It has been disastrous. Compare the Bahamas with Canada. The same sort of people went to both places. Today, the descendants of the loyalists in Canada are one of the strongest elements in causing the territory to be conspicuously well-governed and law-abiding, and the descendants of other colonists, both British and French, vie with them in this manner. In the Bahamas, the descendants of the same type of people show today a larger proportion of poor whites than can probably be found in any other Anglo-Saxon community. Although no figures are available, my own observations lead to the conclusion that the average white farmer is scarcely ahead of the average Negro. Whatever the exact figures may be, there can be no question that in the Bahamas the two races tend to approach the same level. This seems to indicate a marked retrogression of the white race in regions which are climatically unsuitable. Let me hasten to say that many of the more intelligent Bahamans do not differ from the corresponding portions of the Anglo-Saxon race elsewhere. At home they feel themselves handicapped, but when the young people go away to the northern United States or England, they frequently show marked ability. Their inheritance is still good, as to the poor whites, who are described in connection with the lumber industry. It is not so certain that their inheritance remains unimpaired, for in some villages, genuine abnormalities, both of body and mind, are seen. This, however, may be due to the intermarriage of cousins, which has been common in certain communities. The inefficiency of many of the white Bahamans, however, is not due to intermarriage, as is sometimes implied, for villages where this prevails are scarcely worse than those where it is no more common than in America. Nor is the inefficiency due to disease. The hookworm is practically unknown. According to a report of Dr. McCatty, Chief Medical Officer of the Islands, only two cases have been reported up to October 1913. In this report, for which I am indebted to the courtesy of Dr. J. A. Farrell of the Rockefeller International Health Commission, the author points out that the remarkably rapid manner in which the soil dries after even the heaviest rain prevents the development of the infective larvae. For similar reasons, malaria is no more prevalent than in Delaware. For instance, and in general, the islands are decidedly healthful. A monotonous diet may be another detrimental factor but it is scarcely the root of the matter. Many of the people are well fed, and all could be so if they displayed any energy. Indeed, many people say that life is altogether too easy in the Bahamas. The soil is wonderfully fertile. Crops of some kind will ripen at all seasons, and a man can work less than half his time and still readily procure an abundance to eat and wear for himself and his family. On the other hand, we are often told that the difficulties of life have broken the spirit of the inhabitants. The soil, in spite of its richness, is thin, and rocks are so abundant that the plough is almost unknown. 
and agriculture in little patches in the midst of naked limestone is the rule. It cannot be denied that there are difficulties in comparison with many other tropical countries. For instance, I was talking with a Negro whose parents were in a slave ship bound from Africa to Cuba when a British warship captured it. The slaves were taken to the Bahamas and liberated. In answer to a question as to how his parents liked the island compared with Africa, the son said, They didn't like it. They used to say, In Africa, one could lie around all day and do nothing and always find something to eat. Here, one has to work or else starve. The truth seems to be that compared with North Prussia or Maine, the Bahamas are a very easy place in which to make a living. For that much, more work is needed than in some other tropical regions. They are at the happy mean. Other difficulties, such as the tropical hurricanes which sweep over the country once in every few years, insect pests which are neither more or less harmful than in other countries, the American tariff, competition with Cuba, and above all the isolated position of the islands, are frequently cited as causes of the constant Bahamian failures. The islands are always suffering from bad luck, and something must be to blame. All these various factors doubtless play a part in retarding the development of the Bahamas. Back of them, however, lies a factor of even greater import, namely an inertia due to climate. It does not cause the difficulties mentioned above, but it aggravates them and makes it almost impossible to overcome them. I talked about this with perhaps 50 of the more intelligent people, including both natives and foreigners, who have been there a number of years. Almost without exception, they said the same thing. This climate is one of the best in the world. You can see that for yourself. It is very helpful, and we have very few sicknesses. The only trouble is that it does not make one feel like work. In winter it is all right, although even then we cannot fly around the way you Americans do. We always feel lazy, and in summer we want to sit around all the time. As an American picturesquely put it, until I came to the Bahamas, I never appreciated posts. Now I want to lean against every one that I see. Many of the men, and almost all the women, complained of feeling tired. Even the children are listless. One young man stated the case very strongly. We go to bed tired in summer, and we get up more tired. And the summer lasts from April to October. Again and again people said, Oh, it's all very well for you to think we're lazy, but try living here six months or a year, and you'll be as lazy as we are. It's something in the air. Just look at these young ministers who come out of England. At first they are full of energy, but after a year or two it oozes out, though their spirit is still as zealous as ever. Two of the ministers spoke of the fact that when they came out they thought nothing of walking twenty miles, but now they dread the thought of two. Several of the most thoughtful and intelligent islanders, men who have succeeded in business and whose judgment would be respected anywhere, said, we know that we are physically unable to do what English and Americans can do. We are weaker than our fathers, and they were weaker than theirs. It is a grief to send our children away, but in our hearts we know that this is not a white man's country. All this, it must be remembered, is not due to any specific disease, so far as we are aware. Indeed, I met several people who said that a stay of a few years in the Bahamas had improved their health, but at the same time had made them feel inefficient. Aside from extremely ignorant persons whose opinion is of little value, the only men who spoke of the climate more hopefully were five or six highly trained officials and others occupying positions of authority. These men, with that exception, can control their own time. In most cases, their office hours are from 9 or 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. or less. They are men of naturally strong physique. They have the opportunity and the will to take regular exercise, and most important of all, they make long and frequent visits to the United States or England. The benefit to be derived from a visit to a more bracing climate is astonishing. The contrast between the dull, sallow complexions and thin cheeks of the women and girls who have always lived on the islands, and the round, rosy cheeks of those who have recently come back from a long stay at the north, is most striking. According to a local saying, you cannot tell whether a Bahaman woman is pretty until she goes away and has a chance to fill out her cheeks and get some colour. It is by no means strange that the stronger, more energetic young white people are fast leaving the islands. 
I asked my Harmon girl who had been studying nursing in New York whether she enjoyed life more in the United States than in the Bahamas. How can one help enjoying it more there, she answered. There one feels like doing things. Here one never feels like anything. Like almost everyone else, she was sure that it was the climate, even more than the social environment, which made the difference. One thing that surprised me was to hear the Bahamans speak of the stimulus of living in Florida. A native merchant remarked, If I hire a new man, I don't have to ask whether he has been to Florida. I know it by the way he works. But it does not last long. Here again, the social environment is an important factor. But various people told me that the air somehow makes them feel more capable of work in Florida than at home. The women of Florida, I hear them say it themselves, are pale and wan compared with their northern sisters. One of them, whose colour still shows her northern origin, remarked, When I come home after a summer in the north, I am full of energy and see all sorts of things that I want to change about the house. But after a month or two, I don't care whether these things are fixed or not. One hears the same sort of thing everywhere. A factory superintendent from Atlanta, Georgia, told me that the Florida workmen, even the most skillful mechanics, drive him frantic because they are so shiftless and are so ready to take a day off whenever they feel like it. Far more so than at Atlanta, even though Atlanta seems slow to northerners. Yet in spite of all these things, Florida is a more stimulating place than the Bahamas. Its summers are not much better, but its winters are sometimes frosty. While in the Bahamas, the thermometer practically never goes below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Perhaps of greater importance, as we shall see later, is the fact that in Florida, the temperature from day to day varies much more rapidly than the Bahamas, even though both places are in the same latitude. Hence the mainland is blessed with a genuine cinematic stimulus compared with the uniform islands. The last thing to be said about the Bahamas concerns the effect of the climate on mental activity. Practically all the islanders with whom I talked thought that the effect of the climate on mental activity is at least as great as on physical. Several of the more thoughtful, were any suggestion on my part, put the matter in this way. The worst thing about this climate is the effect on the mind. Not that people do not have as good minds as elsewhere, but one soon gets weary of hard mental effort. It is extremely difficult to concentrate one's thoughts. At night, one cannot seem to make himself read anything serious, nothing but the lightest kind of stories. In our own southern states, one hears the same complaint. Even in Virginia, the booksellers say that during the long summer, almost no one touches a serious book. One feels it everywhere, for on the trains, at the railroad stations, and at the news dealers, it is generally difficult to find the higher grade of magazines. Time and again, during a recent journey of three months in the southern states, I try to get such papers as The Outlook, Independent, Harper's, Atlantic, Review of Reviews, The Century, and so forth but all that I could find was trashy story magazines. The dealers really kept the better magazines because people would not read them. Lack of training surely has something to do with the matter, but mental inertia due to lack of climatic stimulus seems to be at least equally important. Let us return now to our question as to a Teutonic and a Negro Egypt. The farmers of the northern and southern states, the race problems of South Africa, and the backwardness of the Bahamas, all seem to point to the same conclusion. When the white man migrates to climates less stimulating than those of his original home, he appears to lose in both physical and mental energy. This leads to carelessness in matters of sanitation and food, and thus gives greater scope to the diseases which, under any circumstances, would find an easy prey in the weakened bodies. The combination of mental inertia and physical weakness makes it difficult to overcome the difficulties arising from isolation, from natural disasters, or from the presence of an inferior race. And this in turn leads to ignorance, prejudice, and idleness. Thus there arises a vicious circle which keeps on incessantly. From its revolving edge, a part of the community is thrown off as poor whites, whose number increases in proportion to the enervating effect on the climate and the consequent speed with which the circle revolves. That climate is the original force which sets the wheel in motion seems to be evident, 
because it is only in adverse climates that we find the cracker type of poor white trash developing in appreciable numbers. If white men lived a thousand years in Egypt, it seems probable that a large proportion of them would degenerate to this type, whether they would still retain an inheritance of health and mentality sufficient to keep them ahead of a similar body of Negroes can scarcely be determined. The chief reason for doubt in this respect is that we do not yet know just how natural selection will work in such a case. It would almost certainly act in two ways. First, many of the abler young people of the white race would presumably migrate, as they do in the Bahamas. This tendency is generally strongest in the upper classes, who can afford to send their children away to school. It is also strong among the young people of all classes who possess more than the average initiative, ambition and physical strength. It becomes weaker and weaker as one goes down the scale, and almost ceases among the poor whites, who have so little mental capacity and so much physical inertia that in spite of much grumbling they remain where they are and compete with the coloured people. The other kind of natural selection consists of a selective death rate. Children who inherit certain physical and mental traits are more likely to die than are children who do not possess those traits. What the traits are which cause extermination we do not know. A fair skin, a nervous temperament, an excess of activity, an unwillingness or incapacity to get sufficient rest may be qualities which doom certain white stocks to gradual extinction outside their own climate. In places like South Africa and Bahamas, the temperament which is willing to intermarry with the coloured people helps certain types of white people to perpetuate their inheritance, but at the same time it gradually eliminates the qualities of energy, initiative and inventiveness which seem to be so much more characteristic of Nordics than of Negroes. It must not be forgotten that theoretically it may be possible that some day a carefully controlled series of crosses between whites and blacks may eliminate the weak traits of each and combine the good traits. Thus a race may arise which resembles Negroes in its good temper and its capacity to withstand a troubled climate, but which will have the progressive, executive and inventive capacities of the white race. Such crosses have been made among animals. For example, Mr. M. F. C. Honore of the Transvaal has sent me the following quotation which he believes to be prophetic of what will some day happen in South Africa. It is from Winston Churchill, the British Cabinet Minister. At Navishar, practically on the equator of British East Africa, there is a government stock farm. One may see in their various flocks the native sheep, the half-bred English, the three-quarter bred, etc. The improvement is amazing. The native sheep is a hairy animal, looking to the unpracticed eye more like a goat than a sheep. Crossed with Sussex or Australian blood, his ascendant is transformed into a woolen beast of familiar aspect. At the next cross, the progeny is almost indistinguishable from the purebred English in appearance, but better adapted to the African sun and climate. It is the same with the cattle. In the first generation, the hump of the African ox vanishes. In the second, he emerges a respectful English shorthorn. Such carefully controlled crossbreeding may perhaps be possible among mankind after hundreds or thousands of years, but first we must know what human qualities are unit characters, so that they are inherited according to the Mendelian law and are not due to the combination of a series of such characters. Then we must learn what qualities are dominant over others as to the presence of one hides the other. Another highly complex problem is to determine what qualities are linked with others so that one cannot be inherited without the other. The fact that linked qualities are very common may mean that certain good qualities like the tolerance of the Negro for a hot climate can never be inherited without certain undesirable qualities like the lack of care for the future which is one of the chief causes of Negro shiftlessness. Even if such linkage is not an inseparable barrier to the production of a really new race by intelligent crossbreeding, there still remains the almost insurmountable obstacle of deep-seated human customs, racial antipathies, and modern ideas of individual liberty. Nevertheless, it is worthwhile to reflect on the following dream of Lafcadio Hearn. It is neither unscientific nor unreasonable to suppose the world eventually peopled by a race different from any now existing, yet created by the blending of the best types of all races, uniting Western energy with far Eastern impatience, Northern vigour with southern sensibility, 
The highest ethical feelings developed by all great religions with the largest mental faculties evolved by all civilizations. Speaking a single tongue composed from the richest and strongest elements of all pre-existing human speech and forming a society unimaginably superior yet unimaginably unlike to anything which now is or will ever be. This is an inspiring dream even though most biologists now regard it as impossible. So far as climate is concerned, the hard reality seems to be that, at present, both by its direct action and through natural selection, a warm, monotonous and unstimulating climate tends to reduce human activity both physical and mental, regardless of race. End of section 2 Section 3 of Civilization and Climate by Ellsworth Huntington this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 3. The White Man in the Tropics Thus far, we have dealt with the temperate zone. Even the Bahamas lie north of the Tropic of Cancer. Let us now turn to the torrid zone, which contains the world's richest and most fighting fields of future development. Let us inquire into the effect of that region upon Europeans who attempt to live there permanently. The isolation of the tropical regions, the lack of facilities for transportation, and the great difficulties of agriculture will doubtless be overcome, but that will by no means solve the problem. Two great obstacles will still remain, the native inhabitants and the white man's own mind and body. Whatever may be the cause, it is generally agreed that the native races within the tropics are dull in thought and slow in action. This is true not only of the African Negroes, the South American Indians, and the people of the East Indies, but of the inhabitants of southern India and the Malay Peninsula. Perhaps they will change, but the fact that the Indians both of Asia and South America have been influenced so little by from one to four hundred years of contact with the white man affords little ground for hope. Judging from the past, there is scant reason to think that their character is likely to change for many generations. Until that time comes, they will be one of the white man's greatest obstacles. Experience shows that the presence of an inferior race in large numbers tends constantly to lower the status of the dominant race. Here in America, although the Negro forms only a tenth part of the population, he is one of our gravest problems. Yet he is not so great a handicap as are the native races of the tropics. Whatever the Negro may have been when he was first brought to America, he is now less stolid and indifferent, more subject to stimulating influences than he was when he came, or than the Indians of tropical America. It is literally true in South America, for instance, that the more an Indian is paid, the less he will work. If one day's pay will buy two days' food, he will work half the time. If the pay is increased so that one day's pay will buy food for three days, he will work one third of the time. The experiment has been tried again and again. The most considerate employers of tropical labour agree with the most inconsiderate that in general it is useless to attempt to spur the Indians by any motive beyond the actual demands of food and shelter. Kindness and consideration on the part of the employer undoubtedly promote faithfulness, but they seem rarely to arouse ambition or energy. With the Negro in Africa, as everyone knows, much the same condition prevails, but where he has been brought to the United States, this is by no means so true. For example, in Central America, it is generally thought that a Negro from Jamaica is more efficient than an Indian, while a Negro from the United States is much more efficient. The Negro in the United States is generally considered more efficient than he was in Africa, whereas his stay-at-home brother and the Indians of tropical America remaining in their old environment do not seem to have changed. Doubtless the change in the Negro is due to a social environment quite as much as to a new physical environment, and many authorities believe that the social change is the more important. This, however, does not materially alter the cause. As conditions are now, it is extremely difficult to change the physical environment of tropical races so long as they remain in their present habitat, and it seems to be equally difficult to change their social environment. Those who dwell permanently in the white man's cities are influenced somewhat, but the results are often disastrous. 
Here, as almost everywhere within 20 degrees of the equator, the general tendency seems to be to revert to the original condition as soon as immediate contact with the white man is removed. This does not mean that contact with a higher civilization will never benefit the people of the tropics, but merely that the process is bound to be slow. The Aborigines of tropical America, for example, show little sign either of disappearing or being swallowed up by a multitude of immigrants, as has been the cause in temperate latitudes, nor do they appear to be changing their character. On the contrary, in Latin America, the only tropical region except Australia where the white man has settled in large numbers, the proportion of Indian blood is apparently increasing at the expense of the white, and the Indians act and think almost like their ancestors three or four centuries ago. This is largely because the white man, except in a few favoured places, suffers from tropical diseases more than does the native, and his children tend to move away as strong, or to be weaklings who die young and leave few children. It is notorious that India contains almost no fourth generation of Indian-born British. The British children are either sent back to Europe to recover their health, or else become enfeebled and their descendants die out. Even with the help of modern medical science, it is not yet certain that the permanent white population can increase greatly, although sojourners are sure to become numerous. In Australia, to be sure, the white man seems to be succeeding within the tropics, but he is still new there, and has the inestimable advantage of actual natural selection and freedom from contact with the natives. In many well-populated tropical countries, modern science lowers the death rate among the natives, and thus increases their numbers. The white man has permitted the native population of India to double and that of Java to increase sevenfold, partially by conquering diseases and partially by the prevention of famine and war. If the conclusion just reached is correct, it seems probable that tropical countries will long continue to maintain a dull, unprogressive population. Contact with such a population constantly exposes the white man to a most deteriorating influence. For example, the inferior mental ability of the lower race and its incapacity for effective organisation lead to the abuse of its labour and to its exploitation in some form of peonage, even though the fact may be disguised by legal phraseology. Again, the presence of a despised priest is almost certain to lead to low sexual morality. In the same way, political equality becomes a mere form of speech, for the dominant race will not permit the other to gain rights at its expense. Manual labour, too, is despised, for it is associated with the idea of an inferior race. All these things may be looked upon as disadvantages of the lower race, but I believe that the higher reaps by far the greater injury. The conditions just mentioned appear to be among the most potent factors in rendering it difficult for the white man to attain as much success in tropical regions as in those farther to the north or south. Their evil effect is roughly proportional to the difference between the two races. Their difference is at a maximum where a low tropical race remains in its original unstimulating environment and is brought into contact with the immigrants of a highly developed race who completely change their environment. The newcomers are released from old restraints at a time when they stand in peculiar need of them, instead of being stimulated to greater love of political freedom and equality, sterner morality and more intense industry, as was the case among the settlers in New England, the immigrants are in danger of being weakened in all of these respects. The effect on the original immigrants is bad enough, but on their children it is far worse. The settler or European colonist who is possessed of wealth and power can to a slight degree shield his family, but even in such cases the children are in constant contact with servants. They grow up with a supreme contempt for the natives at the same time with the feeling that they can treat them as they choose. If poorer people, that is, colonists in the ordinary sense of the word, attempt to live in the tropics, especially if they are people who work with their hands, their children are exposed still more to all the contaminating influences of contact with the natives. Hence the second and third generations, and the fourth and fifth, if there are any, suffer more than their ancestors. The degree to which the indirect or external handicaps of tropical countries are effective in lowering the standards of civilization depends largely upon the amount of energy and willpower possessed by the inhabitants. This in turn depends upon physiological conditions. 
Obviously, diseases have much to do with the matter. This subject has been so much discussed that I shall here refer to it only briefly. There can be little doubt that malaria and many other diseases which are characteristic of tropical countries play an important part in causing a low state of civilization. The old idea that the people who live in tropical regions are immune to local diseases is no longer accepted by students of tropical medicine. Adults, to be sure, are often immune, but apparently this is only partially true of children. Vast numbers of children die in infancy and early childhood from the diseases which prevent the white man from permanently living within the tropics. Others suffer, but recover. They bear the results with them to the grave, however, in the form of enlarged spleens, or other injuries to the internal organs of the body. The world has of late been astonished at the ravages of pellagra, and of other diseases due to such organisms as the hookworm. People who are subject to them cannot be highly competent. Their mental processes, as well as their physical activity, are dulled. So long as a community is constantly affected with such disorders, it can scarcely rise high in the scale of civilization. Nothing is more hopeful for the tropics than the rapid progress in the control of these diseases. If they could be eliminated, not only might the white man be able to live permanently, where now he can be only a sojourner, but the native races would probably be greatly benefited. How great this benefit would be we cannot yet tell, but the elimination of the diseases which especially affect children would probably do much to increase vitality, energy and initiative. This in itself would be an immeasurable boon, not only to the natives, but to the white man, who would thereby be freed in part from some of his worst social dangers. This highly desirable result cannot be obtained quickly. The achievements of the United States in Panama are sometimes said to prove that diseases can be eliminated anywhere in tropical countries. This is true, but it must be remembered that Panama is a highly specialised case. During the building of the canal, a great number of people were collected in a small area, and enormous sums of money were freely expended. Everyone was subject to strict semi-military rule, and similar conditions still continue. Such methods cannot be applied to millions of square miles. The expense would be prohibitive. The ordinary farmer in tropical regions cannot expect to be protected by his government. He must protect himself. In the long run, even tropical races may learn this lesson, but it will be a difficult and expensive task, and will require a radical change in the people themselves. Such a change would doubtless come, but not for generations, and not until a long selective process has gone on, whereby those who do not adopt modern medical methods will gradually be eliminated, while those who adopt them will persist. There has been so much misunderstanding of Panama and so many wild statements that it may be well to set forth the exact facts. The Health Department of the Panama Canal, as it is now called, has charge of three districts whose population in 1917 was as follows. The City of Panama, 61,074. The City of Colon, 25,386. And the Canal Zone, 27,543. For purposes of health and sanitation, all are under the control of the United States, and no expenses spared to make them as helpful as possible. In order to avoid the complications due to the influenza epidemic of 1918, let us take the period from 1912 to 1917. By 1912, the health measures of the United States Army had reached such perfection that the death rate had been reduced 50%. The improvement still continues but is now slow and apparently does little more than keep pace with a similar improvement in the advanced parts of the world. The two cities of Panama and Colón contain the ordinary mixed population of tropical seaports, Negroes from the West Indies, Mestizos, half Spanish, half Indian, from the neighbouring parts of the Central and South America, a few Chinese and other Asiatics, some Europeans and Americans. A considerable number of the employees of the canal live there, the Canal Zone, on the other hand, contains a large proportion of canal employees, chiefly Americans, West Indian Negroes, and Europeans. Among all of these, the percentage of men between 20 and 50 years of age is large. The following figures show the crude death rates from 1912 to 1917 among the civilian population, excluding soldiers, in the three districts of Panama, and in certain other areas 
with which comparisons may profitably be made. A table is displayed on the page. Panama, 80.5, Colon, 24.8, Canal Zone, 18.6, Chile, 27.9, Spain, 22, United States, 18.9, Bombay, 1910-1912, 87.0, Calcutta, 1910-1912, 26.1, Amsterdam, 1901-1913, 12.6. A multitude of other figures might be presented, all of which would show that while the work done in Panama has been admirable, the general conditions of health in the cities of Panama and Colon are still twice as bad as in the advanced parts of the world. They are about on par with those of similar cities of India for Bombay and Calcutta. By reason of their size and desperate overcrowding, presumably have higher death rates than to Indian cities as small as Panama and Colon. The death rates for infants under one year bears out this general conclusion, as appears from the following figures showing the death per thousand births in 1915, 1916 and 1917. Panama, Colon and the Canal Zone, 232. Colored people in New York, 182. Colored people in the United States Registration Area, 172. White people, United States Registration Area, 96. White people, in Minnesota, 69. The area where births are registered in the United States includes only a small part of the South, so that the death rate among colored infants as a whole is higher than appears above. In Richmond, Virginia, during 1917, 1918, and 1919, it averaged 198. In cities farther south, it doubtless reached a level as high as that for people of all sorts at Panama. The foregoing data make it obvious that the widespread idea as to the healthfulness of Panama is based solely on the small number of people in the Canal Zone. But the death rate of 13.6 given above for the Canal Zone has by no means the significance that is usually supposed. Its use for comparative purpose is vitiated by two facts. First, the number of deaths by violence, chiefly by accident, is unusually high in the Canal Zone. And second, the inhabitants of the canal zone are a highly selected group, mostly of good physique and the prime of life, and hence bound to have a relatively low death rate, no matter where they live. The best way to make a fair comparison is to take people of the same age, sex and occupation, who have otherwise also been selected by the same method, and compare the death rates in different places. But this is impossible. As the next best thing, let us take the death rate from 1912 to 1917 among the canal's white employees from the United States and compare it with the rate for men of similar age elsewhere. If we assume that the proportion of white men of different ages in the canal zone is the same as among the white employees from the United States, it was also the same at the census of 1920, as in the period from 1912 to 1917, both of which are essentially the case, it is easy to compare the relative death rate in other regions on the same basis as that for Panama. Using the data prepared by the International Institute of Statistics, together with the records of Yale University, we find that if the proportion of men of various ages were the same in the other places as among the white American employees of the Panama Canal, the death rates among such men would be as follows. A table is displayed on the page comparing locations to death rate from all causes and approximate death rate when deaths due to violence are eliminated. Does this mean that the climate of the states of New York and Connecticut is relatively bad, or that of Panama and the home of Yale University and New Haven is remarkably good? Not at all. It simply means that the two states have relatively normal death rates for their particular climates and for a comparatively unselected population. They are handicapped by their numerous unhealthful factories and cities, and by the great number of their immigrants, many of whom are poor or ignorant, and of low calibre mentally. Moreover, many of the more energetic young people have migrated westward. The adventurous and persistent qualities which lead to migration are partially due to health and physical vigour, and partially to mental initiative, adaptability, and readiness to try new life and new methods. It needs no demonstration to show that such people are sure to have a low death rate, especially when they are highly prosperous, as in the state of Washington. They have the physical vigour to withstand disease, they have the good sense to take care of themselves, 
and they have the means wherewith to purchase good food, good shelter, good sanitation, and good medical service. Since New Zealand is harder to reach than Washington, its immigrants have been even more highly selected for thrift, health, and physical and mental vigor. Panama, like Washington and New Zealand, attracts chiefly the more vigorous type of people. The man who is organically diseased rarely thinks of going there. Moreover, in Panama, white employees come from America as adults. On the contrary, many of the people in Washington and New Zealand were born there and remained regardless of whether they possessed the pioneer vigour and initiative of their parents. Again, even if they have the brave spirit that overcomes physical handicaps, the organically weak are not allowed to go to Panama as employees. If they try to go, they are weeded out by physical examinations. Even that, however, does not enter the matter, for the eliminations are repeated each year. Every individual who shows signs of weakness is advised to leave Panama as soon as possible. Many are ordered home, and not a few are deported, especially those suffering from mental disorders. During the three years for which I have been able to find data, 1914, 1915 and 1917, the deportations on account of disease among employees of all sorts, both white and coloured, amounted to approximately 40% of the total deaths from disease. If these people had stayed in Panama, as they stayed in New York, Connecticut, Washington or New Zealand, many of them would soon have died. Inasmuch as such deportations have been going on for years, it is practically certain that without them, the death rate at Panama would be decidedly larger than now. In addition to the persons who were deported, a far larger number go home voluntarily on the advice of their physicians. Moreover, many who show no immediate signs of disease remain at home after one of their earliest furloughs because they find the climate at Panama uncomfortable. In addition to all this, it must be remembered that the white employees of Panama are practically all officials or clerks. They belong to a class of society which, by reason of its intelligence, is able to take care of itself, so that its death rate is normally much lower than that of the great body of men of similar age. Moreover, the employees are well paid and are mildly housed. They likewise have long and frequent vacations at home whereby the effect of the tropical climate is practically neutralised. All these conditions, even without the excellent medical care which the employees receive, free of cost, would ensure a degree of health in Panama much better than in most tropical regions. On the other hand, if the population of Panama were an ordinarily unselect type, and if none of the weak were sick were sent away, it seems probable that in spite of the admirable sanitation and medical care, the death rate would be larger than in New York among people of similar age. This last statement is merely an opinion, since by its very nature it is not susceptible of actual proof. We know as a fact, however, that the death rate at Panama is greatly lowered by the selection of healthy, intelligent employees, as well as by good medical care. The conditions at Yale or any other university suggest that, in such cases, selection is even more important than medical care. From June 1912 to June 1917, the average number of undergraduates at Yale was 2,476, among whom the total number of deaths was nine through disease and one by accident. This gives an annual death rate of 0 0.8 per thousand against 4.5 or the young men of Connecticut between 15 and 24 years of age. In other words, an unselected young man in Connecticut is 5.6 times as likely to die as is a selected Yale student. If a similar ratio prevailed among the university men up to the age of about 55 years, and if the proportion of men at each age were the same as at Panama, their death rate, barring accidents, would be only 1.7 against 2.7 among the white American employees at Panama. Now, as a matter of fact, from the standpoint of health, the employees at Panama are far more rigidly selected than are the Yale students. No medical examination is required for entrance to the university. No one is actually sent away because of his health, and the amount of medical attention is less on the whole than at Panama. The other things being equal, this ought to give a higher death rate at Yale than at Panama. Yet as a matter of fact, it actually gives Panama the higher rate by 60%. This turning of the tables against Panama seems to be due to the adverse climate. 
The net result of the preceding investigation is this. There can be no doubt of the great value and success of the medical and sanitary work at Panama. It has cut the death rate in halves at the cities of Panama and Colon. Nevertheless, the death rate in those cities is still extremely high, about twice that of the United States as a whole. So far as the white people at Panama are concerned, the death rate is very low, but that proves nothing about the climate. It merely proves that it is possible to obtain practically any death rate by selecting the cases. One could go to hospitals and select the critical cases. That might give a death rate of 8 or 900. One might select college athletes and from time to time throw out any who showed signs of illness and the death rate would be zero. But to use such death rates as evidence concerning the climate would be highly misleading. It is poor policy to use any such reasoning in respect to Panama, Northern Australia or any other region where the climate possesses disadvantages. To do so encourages false hopes. When these are disappointed, people tend to blame the whole science of tropical medicine. That science is doing wonderful things, but as yet there is no evidence that it has overcome the effects of climate, although it has certainly mitigated them. We shall return to this subject in connection with Australia. There, as in Panama, the tropical death rate is lower than those of better climates, but this is due primarily to the selection of certain types of residents. I have dwelt on this matter because there is a vast deal of misapprehension and very little realisation of the importance of selection. Let us return now to our main question. Suppose the white man should succeed in cultivating the tropical forests, transversing the waste places and conquering the diseases. Suppose also that he should eliminate the deteriorating influences of low social and moral standards among the natives. But suppose also that there were no selection of the white colonists. If all of this were suddenly done, the average unselected white men were set down in a tropical garden of Eden, would they be able to hold their own among the peoples of the world? Would Teutons or Latins, under such circumstances, be able permanently to maintain as high a standard of civilization as is maintained by their brothers in Europe? Or would there be a change in some of the traits which we are wont to call racial? Clearly, we are back at the point where we started, and are confronted by the question of race versus place. We must determine how much of our European and American energy, initiative, persistence, and other qualities upon which we so much pride ourselves is due to racial inheritance, and how much to residence under highly stimulated conditions of climate. One of the lines which we may seek for an answer is by a comparison of the character of Europeans in tropical countries with their character in the temperate zone. Whatever differences we may find are presumably due partially to physiological and partially to sociological causes, but they manifest themselves chiefly through the will. In tropical countries, weakness of will is unfortunately displayed not only by the natives, but by a large proportion of the northerner sojourns. It manifests itself in many ways. For these, namely, lack of industry, an irascible temper, drunkenness, and sexual indulgence are particularly prominent and may be taken as typical. Others, such as proneness to gambling and disregard for the truth, might equally well be considered as space allowed. In the quality of industry, the difference between people in tropical and other countries is well known. We have already touched on it in the Bahamas, but let us amplify it further. Practically every northerner who goes to the torrid zone says at first that he works as well as at home, and that he finds the climate delightful. He may even be stimulated to unusual exertion. Little by little, however, even though he retains perfect health, he slows down. He does not work as hard as before, nor does the spirit of ambition prick him so keenly. On the low, damp sea coast, and still more in the lowland forests, the process of deterioration is relatively rapid although its duration may vary enormously in different individuals. In the dry interior, the process is slower, and on the high plateaus, it may take many years. Both in books and in conversation with inhabitants of tropical regions, one finds practically unanimity as to this tropical inertia, and it applies both to body and mind. After long sojourn in the tropics, it is hard to spur oneself to the physical effect of a mountain climb, 
and equally hard to think about the steps in a long chain of reasoning. The mind, like the body, wants rest. Both can be spurred to activity, but this exhausts vitality. The common explanations of tropical inertia are diverse. One man says that within the tropics hard work is unnecessary, because salaries are high. Another asserts that it is because servants are cheap. Still another claims that hard work is dangerous to the health. And almost all agree that, anyhow, one doesn't feel like working down here. Probably all four of these factors cooperate, and each doubtless produces pronounced results. But last two, health and feeling, seem the most important. In spite of individual exceptions, white men who spur themselves to exert their minds as earnestly and steadily within the tropics as at home are in great danger of breaking down in health. They become nervous and enfeebled and rarely succumb to tropical diseases. This is one of the most powerful deterrents to the development of an efficient white population in equatorial regions. If the more intellectual members of the community ruin their health, they are almost sure to die before their time, or else to go back to the north. In either case, they are not likely to leave many children to perpetuate their characteristics. Thus, if white colonization takes place on a large scale within the tropics, there is grave danger that the physically strong, mentally lethargic elements will be the ones to become the ancestors of future population. In the past, this factor must have operated to weed out the more intellectual members of each of the many races that have migrated toward the equator. The inertia which prevents the less competent members of a tropical community from overworking may perhaps be interpreted by teleologists as a merciful provision of providence to warn man that he must not work too hard in the torrid zone, but that will scarcely help to advance civilization. Few people will question the reality of the tropical inertia. It is the same lassitude which everyone feels on a hot summer day. The inclination to sit down and dream, the tendency to hesitate before beginning a piece of work, and to refrain from plunging into the midst of it in the energetic way, which seems natural under more stimulating conditions. Lack of willpower is shown by northerners in tropical regions, not only in loss of energy and ambition, but in fits of anger. The English official who returns from India is commonly described as choleric. Every traveller in tropical countries knows that he sometimes bursts into anger in a way that makes him utterly ashamed, but which he could scarcely believe possible at home. Almost any American or European who has travelled or resided within the tropics will confess that he has occasionally flown into a passion, and perhaps used physical violence under circumstances which at home would merely have made him vexed. This is due, apparently, to four chief causes. One is the ordinary tropical diseases. For when a man has a touch of fever, his temper is apt to get the better of him. In the second place, the slowness of tropical people is terribly exasperating. The impatient northerner uses every possible means to make the natives hurry, or to compel them to keep their word. His energy is usually wasted. The native remains unmoved, and the only visible result is an angry and ridiculous foreigner. Yet a show of anger and violence often seem to be the only way of getting things done, and it is frequently used as an excuse for lack of self-control. In the third place, the consequences of becoming angry are less dangerous than elsewhere. The inert people of tropical countries often submit to indignities which an ordinary white man would bitterly resent. Of course, they object to ill treatment, and will retaliate if possible but they generally do not have sufficient energy or cunning to make their vengeance effective against the powerful white man. Finally, those who have lived in the tropics generally find that, even when things go smoothly, and they are in contact with people of their own kind, and are in comparatively good health, they are more irritable than at home. In other words, their power of self-control is enfeebled. Of course, there are many exceptions, but that does not affect the general principle. Drunkenness, our third evidence of lack of self-control, need scarcely be discussed. Within the tropics, the white man's alcohol in the form of rum is scarcely more injurious to the natives of Africa than it is in other forms to himself. In places such as Guatemala and parts of Mexico, 
drunken men and women may be seen upon the streets at almost any time of day. Nowhere else, during extensive travels in America, Europe and Asia, have I seen so much drunkenness as in Guatemala. Among white men, a large number drink as badly as the natives. Here is an example. A railway conductor was telling me about drinks in Guatemala. They've got something here called white eye, he remarked. You know that Mexican mezcal and how strong it is? Well, white eye's got mezcal chained to a telegraph pole. Yes, I drink it. A man's got to drink something. The first time I tried it, I got crazy drunk and smashed things up the way they all do. I was arrested and fined fifty dollars. This is really only two and a half for Guatemalan currency consists of non-redeemable paper, which at that time was worth about five cents on a dollar, a characteristic evidence of tropical incapacity. I got fined several times that way and didn't like it. Then one day when I was going to get drunk, I said to myself, I'll go and pay my fine now and then they won't bother me. I did that several times and the Jeff Politico liked it, presumably because it was an easy way of pocketing the money. Then he said to the police, Don't bother this man, just let him get drunk all he likes, and he'll pay his fines at the proper time. I tell you, what eye is bad stuff. The only proper way to drink it is to take a quart bottle in the morning, find a place that will stay shady all day, drink the whole thing right down and get so dead drunk that you will sleep till night. I do not cite this man as typical of all the white men in the tropics. Far from it. Many conduct themselves with sobriety and industry, but such men almost invariably make frequent and protracted visits to the better climate of the north. If a white man stays steadily for long periods in the tropics, however, and if his character has any weak spots, they are almost sure to be exaggerated. The drunkenness of the tropical white man arises in part from the constant heat, which makes people want something to drink all the time, partially from the monotony of life and still more from the absence of the social restraints which exercise so powerful an inhibitory influence in home. Back of all these things, however, among both white men and natives, there seem to lie two conditions which are directly connected with the climate. One is the same enfeeblement of the will which makes a man burst into anger. The other is a constant feeling of inefficiency which makes a man crave something to brace him up. The last of the ways in which weakness of will is evident in tropical countries is the relation of the sexes. Its importance can scarcely be overestimated. It leads to the ruin of thousands of northerners, even though they do not yield to drink, to anger, or to laziness. When once they have fallen into pronounced immorality, the other weaknesses soon follow. The condition of the native race is still worse. Everywhere within the tropics, missionaries say that their converts can be taught honesty, industry, and many other virtues but that even the strongest find it almost impossible to resist the temptations of sex. Many Europeans condone this, but they say that it is natural, and that natives had better be left to their own conventional ways of restricting, but not preventing sexual intercourse. Perhaps they are right, however. I cannot be certain. That is not the point, however. We are at present concerned with the effect which free indulgence has upon civilization and upon the capacity for progress. This may be illustrated by what Goldsbury and Shan, for example, say the Zulus in northern Rhodesia. They hold that one of the greatest reasons why these people remain so backward is that their thought and energy are largely swallowed up in matters of sex. During the years when the young men ought to be getting new ideas and thinking out the many little projects and a few great ones which combine to cause progress, the vast majority are thinking of women and planning to gain possession of some new woman or girl. Under such circumstances, no race can rise to any high position. The causes of these conditions are various. Many writers dismiss the matter by saying that the social standards of tropical people are low and tend to cause northerners to conform to them. This is true, but it explains nothing. A real, though minor, reason for the lowness of the standards is found in the free, open life which is almost universal within the tropics. People are out of doors so much and it is so easy to meet in secret that temptation arises very frequently. Much more important is the scanty dress of the women and its character, which calls attention to their sex. Livingstone speaks with disgust of the way in which his carriers, hour after hour, discuss the breasts 
of the half-naked women whom they meet. Even in North, women seem to be strangely indifferent to the effect of their mode of dress upon men. They do not seem to think that they are responsible if their low-necked gowns and the making of their clothing is such a way that each little movement of their bodies can be detected stir men's passions. They appear oblivious to the fact that the display of their beauty often means that some of the women must pay the penalty. Within the tropics, these conditions are exaggerated. I believe I am speaking within bounds when I say that any young man of European race, with red blood in his veins, is in more danger of deteriorating in character and efficiency because of the women of the tropics than from any other single cause. The strength of this deteriorating force is not merely external. Either the actual temptation to sexual excess is greater in the tropics than elsewhere, or else the inhibitory forces are weakened by the same processes which cause people to drink to excess, to become unduly angry, and to work slowly. Helpak states that it is said that in southern Italy, sexual irregularities increase greatly at times when the hot, damp wind, known as the Sirocco, blows across the Mediterranean from the deserts of northern Africa. This is so well recognised among the people themselves that offences committed under such circumstances are in a measure condoned. Violence, too, is more common at such times, for self-control of every kind is weakened. In eastern Turkey, the hot desert winds cause the whole community to become cross and irritable. I have there seen a missionary, a man of unusual strength of character, shut himself up in his study all day because he knew that he was in danger of saying something disagreeable. I cite this case because, among the people whom I have known, missionaries are, on the whole, most completely masters themselves and the least likely to let minor circumstances turn them from the Christ-like lives which they are striving to live day by day before the native communities. For this same reason, to return to our immediate subject, I quote the remark of a missionary in Central America when we were discussing the morality of the country. He was a most austere man, a member of a small and extremely devout sect, and his whole being was devoted to preaching the gospel. Speaking of his own experiences, he said, When I am in this country, evil spirits seem to attack me. I suppose you would call them something else, but that is what I think they are. When I am at home in the United States, I feel pure and true. But when I come here, it seems as if lust were written in the very faces of the people. In all the evils which have just been mentioned, laziness, anger, drunkenness, and immorality, social causes undoubtedly play an important part. A strong public opinion would save many a young northerner from drink and immorality, and would keep him faithful to his work. A clear religious faith or a high ideal of duty would do the same thing. Good homes, proper dress, and many other material changes would help greatly. So too would a study of how it has come to pass that certain tropical races, in spite of their environment, have developed comparatively high moral codes to which they strictly adhere, while a few have actually learned the lesson of industry. Along with the social aspect of the question, however, and neither more nor less important goes of physical we must discover to exactly what extent physical conditions help or hinder the development of strong character. That is the purpose of the chapters that follow. End of section 3 Section 4 of Civilization and Climate by Ellsworth Huntington This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4. The Effect of the Seasons In comparing Teutons with Negroes, or tropical people with those of the temperate zone, we have been following a method as old as the days of Aristotle. Such comparisons have led to most interesting generalizations, not only at the hands of Aristotle himself, but of many other men such as Montesquieu, Humboldt, and Ratzel. Yet the importance of climate as a factor in civilization is still in doubt. For instance, no one denies that South Africa is confronted by a grave race problem, but many say that it is purely economic, and has nothing to do with climate. They support this view by strong arguments. Thus we are left in uncertainty. The only way to remove this is to devise some method whereby to separate the effects of climate from those due to all other causes, whether economic, historic, 
social, religious, racial, or something else. Accordingly, the rest of this volume will be devoted to an investigation of the exact effect of various climatic factors upon selected groups of people, and to an attempt to discover how human energy and other qualities would be distributed if all the Earth's inhabitants were influenced like these particular groups. In the study of climate, one of the most puzzling features is the diversity of opinion among persons of good judgment. For instance, at what seasons do people work fastest in the northern United States? Some will say the winter, some the spring, a considerable number the fall, and a few the summer. Most will say that they are least efficient in summer, but others believe that they are at their worst in the early spring or late winter. Again, ask a dozen friends whether they work best on clear days or cloudy. The majority will probably answer that the first clear day after a storm is by all means the best. A small number will perhaps think the matter over more carefully, and then say that after a storm the clearness of the air and the brightness of the sun are certainly inspiring, but one really accomplishes more when it rains. This divergence of opinion is due largely to the fact that climatic effects are of two kinds, psychological and physiological. We are always conscious of the first, but often unconscious of the second. The two are admirably distinguished in Helpak's book on Geophysics, Erscheinungen. An example will make the matter clear. It is well known that at high altitudes, the number of red corpuscles in the blood increases enormously, and the capacity to absorb oxygen and to give out carbon dioxide is correspondingly modified. Yet many people can go to altitudes of 5,000 feet or more without realising that their physiological functions have been altered. To cite my own case, up to the age of 21, I had never been a thousand feet above the sea. Then I went to live in an altitude of 4,500 feet. The only physiological effect of which I was conscious was unusual sleepiness for the first few months. But whether this was due to the altitude or to the dryness of the air, I do not know. For two or three years, I have never thought of the physiological effect of the altitude until one day, happening to have climbed to a height of 7,000 feet, I began to run uphill. I lost my breath and became tired so quickly that I was alarmed and thought I must be sick. I was much relieved when it occurred to me that the altitude was not favourable for running uphill. Manifestly, my physiological functions were different from what they were at sea level, although I was unconscious of it. On the other hand, psychologically, I was daily conscious of living in a place where the air was extraordinarily clear, and where the mountains were always in sight across a splendid plain 1,200 feet below us. Presumably, both your physiological and psychological conditions had an appreciable effect upon the work of every day, but which was the greater it is impossible to tell. In this connection, Lehman and Pedersen state an interesting fact. In Denmark and Norway, they made a series of daily tests of the strengths of three individuals by means of a dynamometer. They found that the change of atmospheric pressure due to ascent of two or three thousand feet makes no appreciable difference. A similar descent, however, is accompanied by a marked increase in strength which disappears within three or four days. They suggest that this may be due to the persistence of abundant red corpuscles when people come down from high places. The red corpuscles multiply very rapidly under the influence of low pressure, but are slower in disappearing when the pressure once more increases. Thus, for the first day or two after a person had come down from the mountains, more than the normal amount of oxygen may be absorbed, and muscular strength correspondingly increased. Possibly this is why mountaineers are generally so irresistible when they descend upon the plains in sudden raids. My colleague, Professor H. E. Gregory, suggests that this may account for the fact that in the horse races of the pioneer days of the southwestern United States, the poor, scrawny animals brought down from the mountains by the Indians usually belied their appearance and outran the better-looking animals of the white men. They may have had an excess of red corpuscles. Professor Gregory adds that in some of the highland regions of South America, there is a strict rule that, before a race, the competing horses must spend a certain number of days at the race course. This may have arisen because the animals, which race directly after coming from the mountains, are apt to win. There is considerable doubt as to the truth of this theory, 
but it illustrates the possibility that we may be deeply influenced by atmospheric conditions of which we are almost unconscious. In our opinions as to the effect of the seasons or of daily changes of weather, the relation between psychological and physiological influences is probably the same as in the case of altitude. The external conditions which we see and feel make a greater impression than those which prevail within our bodies. For example, most of us think that in the northern United States we work fast in winter. As a matter of fact, the statistics of 10,000 people show that we work slowly. The ordinary impression is apparently psychological. In order to keep warm out of doors in winter, we walk fast and this leads us to think that we do everything rapidly. Again, the blue sky, clear air, bright sunshine and fresh colours of the first day after a storm are unquestionably inspiring. But does that inspiration make us work any better? May not lead to a nervous excitement which actually hinders our work by causing us to look out at the beauties of nature or to be less concentrated in other ways. The actual figures show that, taking the year as a whole, on dull days, especially the second such day when a storm begins to clear, we accomplish more than on bright days, even though we grumble about the clouds and the dampness. A bright day certainly makes us cheerful, but its chief helpfulness, so far as our work is concerned, is felt when it is a change from the monotony of a series of dull days. Clouds and rain produce exactly the same rejoicing when they succeed prolonged clear weather of the kind that we praise so highly. In America, I have never seen so much rejoicing over a bright day as I have seen in Turkey when the first rain fell after the long subtropical summer with its truly superb weather. The rejoicing was in part due to the fact that the coming of the rains means good crops. But I have again and again seen exuberant joy among people to whom the crops made no difference whatever. I have seen Americans shout for joy because the clouds had come, and run out into the rain to let the cool drops refresh their faces. The questions which have just been asked, and the possibilities that have been suggested, show how indefinite are our ideas of the effect of climate. We understand its psychological effects fairly well. We know little of its physiological effects, however, except when they are extreme or unusual, or when people are sick or in some other pathological condition. We need to determine how ordinary people are influenced by ordinary conditions of weather. That is, the purpose of our present discussion. The most feasible way to do this, as has already been said, is to take groups of people who live in a variable climate and measure their efficiency under different conditions of weather. The best and fullest test of efficiency is a person's daily work. If the subject does not know that he has been tested, so much the better. Peace workers and factories are doing exactly what is required for our purpose. Accordingly, to begin with New England, I have taken the daily records of about 300 men and 250 girls, most of them for a complete year. The records are distributed over the four years from 1910 to 1913. The 550 people were employed in three factories in the cities of Bridgeport, New Britain and New Haven, in the southwestern part of Connecticut. In all cases, the officials in charge of the factories were most courteous and helpful in assisting me to obtain the necessary data, and I wish most warmly to express my gratitude to all concerned. In the selection of operatives for such a purpose, various conditions must be fulfilled. In the first place, there must be peace workers who are paid according to their work and not at a fixed rate per day. In the second place, they must be employed in factories where their output is not limited by restrictions imposed by unions, or by the fear that if they earn too much, wages will be reduced. They must be doing work that is of essentially the same kind every day, so that their wages will not vary much because they are sometimes engaged upon new and unfamiliar tasks, or upon easy tasks at some times and hard ones at others. Furthermore, the same people must work steadily for month after month throughout the year, if possible, and without taking much time off, as is such a common practice among factory hands. Finally, they must be working where there is abundant incentive to steady, faithful work, where the conditions of air and light are reasonably good, and where accurate daily records make it possible to determine not only the daily wage of each individual, but the average efficiency per hour or per day of standard length. The number of factories where all these conditions are fulfilled is small, for they demand special types of occupation and a high standard of management. 
The three factories from which data have been obtained all meet the requirements. I explained what I wanted to the superintendent or to some other responsible official in each case. He then selected the group or groups of operatives whom he thought proper and placed the figures in my hands. There was no selection on my part, and in each case I have used all the figures, omitting only a few obvious errors amounting to perhaps a quarter of one percent. An investigation such as is here set forth may follow two modes of procedure. One is to take a few persons and investigate each minutely in order to eliminate all accidental variations. The other is to take many people and get rid of the personal variations by averages. The wages of a workman depend upon many factors aside from the weather. One man has been scolded by his wife because he did not earn enough last week. Another wants to buy some clothes for his little boy, and a third was drunk last night. A sore toe may have far more influence than any possible climatic variation. To ferret out all these accidental circumstances is out of the question. Fortunately, they do not occur every day, and most people work weeks at a time without being much influenced by them. Moreover, when large numbers of people work in different cities and during different years, the individual circumstances neutralise one another. The day that John Jenkins is disturbed because his boy has run away, Tony Albano is working hard because he is going to be married. Hence, by taking 500 people, we are able to eliminate accidental and individual circumstances, and thus to reach a reliable result. All three of the factories where our data are obtained make hardware, but the work varies greatly. In one factory where Italians are the predominant nationality, brass sockets for electric lights and other little brass fittings are made. One group of people here was engaged in tending machines. Some were turning out screws. Others were putting pieces of sheet brass into automatic machines which turn out perforated plates. The work requires little skill, but much quickness and concentration. Another group, composed largely of Italians, was engaged in rolling and drawing hot brass, a heavy and somewhat difficult kind of work requiring considerable strength. It is difficult because the brass must be used hot, and hence the men must work at abnormally high temperatures. At another factory, the one from which the largest number of records was obtained during three successive years, there were two main groups of men and two of women. The girls from 16 to 20 years of age were Americans by birth, but of varied descent, being chiefly Irish, Germans, Scandinavians, English, and other North Europeans. Their work was the packing of hinges and screws, which are first wrapped in tissue paper and then placed in pasteboard boxes. This is a light, easy task in which dexterity and accuracy in picking up the right number of pieces are particularly important. For the first week or two, when screws are packed, the tips of the fingers become sore, which makes the work proceed slowly. If a girl is changed from packing hinges to packing screws, her wages fall off for a time, but such changes are not frequent and do not appreciably influence our figures. The men at this factory were of all ages, and were the same races as the girls. They are engaged in grinding and buffing the hinges. The first operation is hard, heavy work. The hinges are held upon rapidly revolving emery wheels in order to grind them to a smooth surface. The other operation, buffing, is similar except that it is easier, for the hinges after being ground are polished upon rapidly revolving cloth balls covered with emery dust. In the third factory, the operatives were of North European descent, almost all being native-born. Practically all, both girls and boys, were young, only a few being over twenty years of age. The older girls leave to be married, and the boys, who are comparatively few in number, go elsewhere to find harder and hence are better paid work. The work consists of the preparation of armatures and other wire coils for electrical purposes. Some operatives wind the wire upon rapidly revolving spools, others put together the various parts of an armature. The work is light and not tiresome. It requires much dexterity and accuracy. Strings have to be tied at particular spots. Pieces of paper must be inserted, the machines must be stopped when the right point has been reached, and little ends have to be grasped and inserted in their proper places. Taking our three factories together, the work ranges from the hardest to the lightest. It is of many kinds, requiring different degrees of strength and skill. The wages depend not only upon the amount of work completed, but the number of pieces rejected. In other words, the wages represent 
not only speed, but accuracy. Let us now turn to the actual performance of the operatives. This is summed up in figure 1. The four upper solid lines represent the work done week after week, each year from 1910 to 1913. In figure 1, the work of only about 410 people has been used. The rest have been omitted because the figures are not complete for a whole year. In only one case has there been a deliberate omission of figures which cover an entire year. That was the Italians who draw hot brass and are subject to abnormal conditions of temperature. The method of procedure has been defined for each working day the average hourly wages for each group of operatives. Hourly wages have been used instead of daily so as to make it possible to compare half days with whole. Figure 1 is displayed on the page, the effect of the seasons on factory operatives in Connecticut, solid lines, and at Pittsburgh, dotted lines. If part of the operatives were absent on any particular day, they are simply omitted, and the average for the rest was taken. When the daily averages had been found, they were averaged together by weeks. In doing this, a half day, such as the Saturdays in summer, was given only half as much weight as a whole day, and days when part of the operatives were absent, or when the machinery was shut down for a while, were given a correspondingly smaller weight. Thus allowance is everywhere made for irregularities in the number of employees and the length of time that they work. The final process consisted of combining the different groups. In order that each individual may have the same importance, all the figures have been reduced to percentages. In this way, if a girl earned a maximum wage of 12 cents an hour, it is called 100%. While the man's maximum wages was 30 cents, the sum also was called 100%. Thus the variations in the wages of the girl and the man had the same weight in our final computations. Because of the enormous amount of work which would have been entailed, it was not possible to reduce the wages of each individual to percentages, but only those of each group. Had it been possible to work out each individual's wages separately, the results shown in our curves would practically have been more striking than is now the case. In Figure 1, the height of the curves indicates the efficiency of the operatives at various seasons for four successive years. The fifth curve, heavier than the others, is the average of the preceding four. Turning to the upper line, we see that in early January 1910, the efficiency of about 60 factory operatives in Bridgeport was 88% as much as during the week of maximum efficiency that year. By the middle of the month, it had fallen to 86%. Later it rose fairly steadily to 96% at the end of April. Then it dropped a little, rose still higher in June, and fell off distinctly during the summer, but not so low as in winter. During the autumn it rose steadily until early November, when it reached the highest point of the year, after which it fell rapidly. In the same way each curve may be traced week by week. I shall return to them shortly. Meanwhile, it would be advantageous for the reader to look them over and draw his own conclusions, picking out the features which are common to all, and noting those which show different degrees of intensity from year to year. In Figure 1, it will be noticed that the solid lines never reach 100%. This is partly because they have been smooth, and partly because they have been corrected to compensate for the increased efficiency due to practice. The process of smoothing, as everybody knows, is used by mathematicians to eliminate minor variations, and thus permit the main thread of a curve to be more apparent. It merely takes off the high points and the low. The figures for three weeks are averaged, and the average is used instead of the original figure for the middle week. In the present case, and in practically all the curves in this book, the process of smoothing has been performed twice on each curve. If the letters A to E represent the average wages for five successive weeks, the figure actually used for the middle week, C, is retained from the following equation. C equals a plus 2b plus 3c plus 2d plus e divided by 9. This process of smoothing can add nothing to a curve. It simply takes away the less important details. If carried far enough, it will produce straight lines. In addition to smoothing the curves, I have corrected them for the effects of practice. The curves for 1911 and 1912 and 1913 are all based on the same factory in New Britain. When the wages for each year are averaged, we find that those for 1912 were 1.5% higher than for 1911, 
and those for 1913 were 1.5% higher than for 1912. This means that constant practice caused the average employee, including both old hands and new, to be 1.5% more skillful at the end of the year than at the beginning. Hence, from January onward, the curve raises a little until in December it is 1.5% higher than it would be if the operatives had not grown more skillful. To eliminate this, we simply tip the entire curve, raising the January end by three quarters of 1% and depressing the December end by the same amount. The fluctuations, of course, remain unchanged. In Figure 1, if there had been no correction, the highest and lowest points of the upper curve would lie at the points indicated by the crosses, and the other curves would be changed in corresponding ratios. There had been no change at the end of June. Turning to less technical matters, let us consider the degree of resemblance in the four upper solid lines of Figure 1. All are unmistakably low in January. Then from February to June, we note a general rise, varied by minor fluctuations which differ from year to year. At the middle or end of June, all reach a distinct maximum, although in 1912 and 1913 it is of slight proportions. Next we have a drop during the summer, pronounced in 1910 and 1911, but not at all prominent in 1912 and scarcely noticeable in 1913. Following this, there comes a series of irregular fluctuations, differing from curve to curve, but in each case culminating in a strong maximum at the end of October or the beginning of November. Six weeks later, in the middle of December, another slight maximum is suggested, and then all the curves drop suddenly. In the average curve, the minor fluctuations tend to disappear. They are more or less accidental, and represent peculiar conditions which pertain to one year. But not to others. The features that have been named, however, show no sign of disappearing. They are five in number, namely an extremely low place in midwinter and a less pronounced low place in midsummer, a high point in June, a still higher point at the end of October, and a hump in mid-December. Much the most variable feature is a low place in summer. This is highly significant, as we shall shortly see. Before we discuss the cause of the variability of the summers, let us consider the meaning of the curves as a whole. In the first place, it is evident that, although details may vary from year to year, the general course of events is uniformly from low in the winter to high in the fall, with a drop of more or less magnitude in summer. To what can this be due? Did the factories shut down in January, or run on part-time, or decreased work because of lack of orders? or to overhaul the machinery and so forth. Do the high wages in October and November indicate a special rush of orders at that time? Any variations in the way in which the factory is running must be reflected in the wages of the operatives. But in the present case, this does not apply to the main variations, although it may apply to minor details. In neither of the two factories here considered were the responsible heads able to offer any explanation of the peculiarities of the curves on the basis of factory management or the exigencies of business. Both are engaged in making staple articles, the chief demand for which comes in the spring when building operations begin. There is no Christmas rush on hinges and electric light sockets. After Christmas, the factory is shut down for a few days at the beginning of the year, but that ought to increase rather than diminish the hourly earnings. When operatives are working only part-time, they feel the need of earning as much as possible each hour. If part of the hands are laid off, that would increase the average hourly wages, for the weaker ones would be dropped and the average ability of those who remain would be high. In this connection, it is important to understand that in these factories, a man is free to work as hard as he wishes at any time of the year. The managers have deliberately adopted the policy of getting as much work as possible out of each operative. Overhead charges for interest, superintendents, bookkeeping, salesmen and other outside expenses and also the charges for unproductive labour such as engineers, janitors and the like are no greater no matter how hard the productive employees work. If the producing operatives should doubt their output, most of the other expenses would scarcely increase at all. Hence, it would not only be possible to pay double wages for double work, but it would be profitable to the factory, even if it paid perhaps $2.50, 
who now pays one dollar. In view of these conditions, both factories have adopted systems whose special object is to encourage extra exertion. In one case, part of the men work upon what is known as a premium plan. The management and the men have agreed that the various tasks shall be rated according to the number of hours which they may fairly be supposed to require. If a man performs an eight-hour task, he is to be paid for eight hours' work, no matter whether he does it in six hours or ten. If, however, he finishes the work in less than the stipulated time, he goes to work at another task for the rest of the period. For half of this time, he is to be paid while the factory gets the benefit of the other half. For example, if an eight-hour task is finished in six, the operative works two more hours. He is then paid for nine hours, although he has only worked eight, while the factory gets ten hours' work and pays for nine. Thus, both are the gainers. In one case, the managers make a mistake in deciding upon the number of hours needed for a certain task. It has never been done quickly, and no one knew how rapidly it might be done. The man who does it soon earned ten or twelve dollars a day, where he formerly earned perhaps two and a half or three. Inasmuch as the management had agreed not to change the rates, they stuck to their bargain. The task only occupies one day each month, and the matter is not serious. Moreover, even though the operative earns such high wages, the work actually costs the factory less than what he was earning two dollars and a half. In the other factory, the girls are stimulated by bonuses. That is, they are not only paid for their work, but if they do more than is expected, they are paid a bonus. For example, if a girl's wages averaged about a dollar a day, and she did work worth one dollar and twenty cents, she did not receive one dollar twenty cents, but one dollar twenty-five cents, or even one dollar forty cents. The factory finds this worthwhile because so much more can be produced without any increase in charge for interest, office work, or other overhead expenses. When this bonus system was first introduced, it produced only a slight effect. The girls did not seem to care about the bonuses and made a little effort to get them. Then the management realized that the parents were getting the extra money, and so it made no difference to the girls, most of whom gave their pay envelopes unopened to their fathers or mothers. Thereafter, the bonus was not put in the pay envelope, but was handed out in loose change. The girls kept it and began to work hard. In the third factory, whose figures are not extensive enough to be used in figure one, by which enter into other computations, a similar system is employed. A limit is set for each task. If the work is performed within that time, a bonus is paid. Otherwise, the operatives received only the regular pay, no matter how much time they spend. The introduction of this system has increased the output of the factory enormously, inasmuch as the various systems of bonuses and premiums are equally applicable at all times of the year, it seems impossible to find in the factories themselves any reason why earnings should be very low in January, moderately low in July, high in June, and very high in November. We seem forced to search outside of the factories for the reasons for our seasonal fluctuations of wages. Such things as panics, hard times, or strikes would certainly cause a general change in the conditions of work but nothing of the kind occurred during the period under consideration. Moreover, such events do not recur at the same time each year. Aside from the reasons, the only event which recurs regularly year after year at the same time, and which is important enough to cause variations in wages, is Christmas. Its effect can be seen, unmistakably, in each of the solid year occurs. In that for 1910 it appears in the little hump which culminates during the next to the last week in December. In the other three, it comes a week earlier because this factory does not pay the week's wages on the Saturday of the week in question, but a week later, after there has been time to check up the work and make allowances for that which is poorly done. Hence, money for Christmas must be earned before the middle of December. If there were no such thing as Christmas, the wages would probably drop off in the way shown by the dashed line in the average curve of figure 1. After Christmas, the wages probably drop somewhat lower than would otherwise be this case, for there must be a reaction from the previous effort, but it is noticeable that the wages do not reach their lowest ebb directly after Christmas, but keep on falling for nearly a month. Something else keeps them low, 
The Christmas hum is significant chiefly because it shows, unmistakably, that an outside stimulus which applies to all the operatives produces a distinct result. We may probably infer that the other permanent features of our curves are also due to some outside force which influences all the operatives. That force must be connected with the seasons, and it must be far more powerful than Christmas, for its effects are far greater. There seems to be no recourse except to ascribe the fluctuations of the curves to climate. The verity of the conclusions just reached is strongly confirmed by a comparison with other regions and other types of human activity. Figure 2, which, for convenience, is here divided into two overlapping portions, presents a series of curves arranged according to climate. Those from regions with cold winters and cool summers being at the top, and cool winters and hot summers at the bottom. The curves range from the Adirondacks in northern New York to Tampa in southern Florida, and include one from Denmark. With them, I have repeated some of the curves of figure 1 for the sake of comparison. The most remarkable feature of this series is that although there is great diversity of place and of activity, all the curves harmonize with what would be expected on the basis of figure 1. Figure 2a is displayed on the previous page, human activity and the seasons. Figure 2b is displayed on the previous page, human activity and the seasons. The first curve, a, is based on the work of Lorassen Brown a physician who has published records of the weight gained by patients suffering from pulmonary tuberculosis at a sanatorium at Saranac Lake in the Adirondacks. A gain in weight in this disease is a favourable symptom, for one of the most marked effects of tuberculosis is a cause of wasting away of the flesh. In the present tabulation, the patients who lost weight are not included, and a drop in the curve does not indicate loss of weight, but merely a decreased rate of gain. If the patients who lost weight were also included, however, the form of the curve would still be the same. According to Brown, the Adirondax, as everyone knows, having long cold winters, while the summers are delightfully bracing, being warm enough to be pleasant, but never hot enough to be debilitating. Hence, from about the 1st of April to the end of September, the sick people make a marked gain. During the other six months, although they may gain more than would be the case in their own homes, they do not find the climate nearly so advantageous as in summer, and the disadvantage increases until the snow disappears. The next curve, B, is a repetition of the Connecticut curve for 1913. That year the winter was by no means so severe as is ordinarily the case in the Adirondacks. Hence the curve does not remain low quite so long as does A, and does not begin to fall so soon. The summer, however, was almost as cool as among the Adirondacks, and hence there is no drop during July. The next pair of curves represents a year with a hot summer in Connecticut, C, and the death rate for 15 years in the state of New York, D. The curve for deaths has been turned upside down, so that high places present few deaths, that is, high vitality corresponding to high energy in the factory operatives. In New York State as a whole, the effect of the summers is very different from what it is in the Adirondacks. The city is sweltered for a few weeks in July, and that sends the death rate up enormously, especially among children who are quickly taken sick, and who either die after a few days' illness or recover. That is why the curve drops so sharply in midsummer. In the winter, on the contrary, although it drops almost equally low, the maximum number of deaths per day does not come till March, although by that time the average energy of operatives has risen considerably. This is because people become sick in January and February, especially those who are elderly, and finally die after lingering illnesses quite unlike those of children. The death rate of other places might be used quite as well as that of New York. The Japanese rate, for example, is as follows. The figures being those for the 10 years beginning with 1899. The figures represent percentages of the normal. Those for the state of New York, computed on the same basis, are added in parenthesis. A table is displayed on the page, comparing the months to total numbers. Here the course of events is almost the same as in New York, but with significant differences which harmonize with the climates of the two places. Winter in Japan is less severe than in New York and its effects do not last so long, 
for the highest mortalities in February instead of March. The Japanese summers, on the contrary, are characterized by prolonged heat and also by great humidity, especially during the rainy season from July to September. At the end of this period, the mortality is at a maximum. The debilitating effect of the summer lasts so long that November and December have a higher death rate than May and June. The late spring is especially favourable, not only because of its own excellent character, but because it follows a winter which is not severe enough to be highly disadvantageous. Curves E and F represent the strength of 90 school children in Copenhagen as measured by Lehmann and Pedersen, and the average energy of factory operatives for four years in Connecticut. The Danish measurements were carried on during the school years of 1904 to 1905, when 60 children were tested weekly, and 1905 to 1906, when 10 were tested daily. By combining the two years into one and making allowance for the fact that children grow stronger from month to month just as factory operatives grow more skillful, we obtain curve A in figure 2, since neither summer nor winter is especially severe in Denmark, the dip at the two seasons is the same. The maxima in June and November are almost synchronous with those in Connecticut. The minima are both delayed six or seven weeks, but the winter minimum of March agrees with the maximum death rate in New York. The summer minimum ought possibly to come in July or August, but the figures for those months are not obtainable, for during that time the schools in Copenhagen have vacation. In addition to this, we should expect Danish curve to lag a little behind that of Connecticut because of the maritime climate. Inasmuch as Denmark is constantly swept by west winds from the ocean, it does not so quickly grow cool in the winter, nor warm in summer, as does Connecticut, where the prevailing winds are from the continental interior. Thus it appears that the strength of Danish children and the energy of factory operatives in Connecticut have an almost identical relation to seasonal variations of climate. Judging by curves C to F in figure 2, one might hazard the hypothesis that man is subject to a seasonal rhythm which repeats itself wherever he goes without regard to the climate. On this basis, one would expect a maxima of efficiency in June and November in all parts of the world. In curves A and B, however, we have already seen that where the summers are particularly favourable and the winters unfavourable, this rhythm breaks down, and the June maximum and summer minimum disappear. If we go farther south to places where the winters are favourable and the summers very hot, we find a change in the opposite direction. For the winter minimum tends to disappear, and the summer minimum greatly increases and shoves the two maxima more and more into the winter until the two coalesce. This is evident in curves G to L. These represent variations in the wages of peace workers in southern factories, compiled according to the method used in Connecticut. Curve G shows the work of 65 Anglo-Saxon girls in a tobacco factory in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. They were pasting labels on cans. Notice how their winter minimum comes in early May instead of June. In September, the curve drops suddenly. This is because at that time, the effects of the war began to be felt. The price of cotton fell so low that the South was in great distress, and the sale of the goods made by this factory began to be curtailed. Therefore, the girls were not given as much work as they could do. Curves H and I are from cotton mills in South California and Georgia, and each represent two mills. In South Carolina, the two mills are close together at Columbia, but in the other case, they are 15 or 20 miles apart, one being in Georgia, near Augusta, and the other across the Savannah River in South Carolina. The operatives in all cases are of pure Anglo-Saxon stock, chiefly of the poor white class. Men and women are included in nearly equal numbers. Part are weavers, while others engaged in the occupations known as slubbing, spooling, and speeding, ten machines which spin the thread and wind it on bobbins, ready for the weavers. In all cotton factories, the air in the weaving room, and to a less extent in the others, is kept at a high temperature and a high humidity. This is necessary because when the air becomes cool, or especially when it becomes dry, the thread is apt to break and cause blemishes in the cloth. Hence, in factories where high-grade goods are manufactured, the inside temperature is so abnormal and the amount of goods produced depends so largely on the breakage that it is almost impossible to obtain satisfactory figures. In the factories here considered, however, nothing but coarse cloth is manufactured. 
the breaking of the thread does little harm, and relatively slight attention is paid to the temperature and humidity of the weaving rooms. Moreover, for slubbing, speeding, and spooling, the temperature and humidity make far less difference than for weaving. Hence, the variations in the amount of goods produced per person depend largely on the energy of the operatives in watching their machines and preventing them from standing idle because of broken threads, empty bobbins, or other accidents. The exigencies of business, that is, the demands for goods, make no difference to the operatives, so far as their production per hour is concerned, for the machines run at a uniform speed where their factory runs one day a week or six. The cotton mill curves are essentially the same as that of the tobacco factory. In each there is a double spring maximum due to accidental circumstances, but the true maximum would probably come about the end of April. In I, the spring maximum comes still earlier, that is, in mid-April, as is appropriate to a place so far south. The autumn maxima, on the other hand, come later than in Connecticut, one being in early December and the other toward the end of November. The work of carpenters in Jacksonville, as shown in Curve J, is different from anything else that is here considered because it is performed out of doors. The 15 men per year whose records are here used were engaged in making the same kind of repairs time after time. A careful record of the hours that they spend is kept, but the number varies greatly on account of the weather. If it rains, they cannot work. Summer is a rainiest period, but that does not tend to diminish the amount of work done per hour. In fact, it increases it. The rain comes in hard showers, and while it is falling, the men rarely try to work, and the time is not reckoned. When the rain is over, they work better than before because the air is cooler, although still far from being cool. In winter, on the contrary, from December to March, the rain is a pronounced hindrance. It often comes in the form of drizzle, and the carpenters try to keep on working while it is falling. Moreover, after the rain, the wood is wet, there is apt to be a chilly wind, the hands feel numb, and everything is opposed to great efficiency. Yet in spite of this, more work per hour is done in February, the worst winter month, than in May, June, July, or August. If these men were to work in well-protected sheds, which were heated on the occasional cool days, there is little doubt that in December their curve would reach a maximum higher than that now reached in November, while even if the following months were not still better, they would at least show no pronounced drop. The lower two curves, K and L, represent the work of cigar makers at Jacksonville in northern Florida and Tampa in the southern part of the state. Those in Jacksonville were mostly Cubans, nearly two-thirds being Negroes, and the rest of Spanish descent. At Tampa, only a handful of Negroes is included, but a large sprinkling of real Spaniards is found among the Spanish Cubans. The curves of the cigar factories are compiled on a different basis from the others. The reason is that there are no definite hours. The factories are open 12 hours a day, usually from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. The operatives saunter in as they please, provided they do not come later than 8 a.m. and leave when they choose although an attempt is made to let no one depart before 4 p.m. While at work, they sit close together at tables and talk volubly except when a hired reader is vociferating the news from a Spanish newspaper. At some time in the morning, they go out for lunch, but are rarely gone as much as half an hour. Otherwise, they stay at their work till it is finished. Since there are no fixed hours, we cannot measure the exact earnings per hour, as we have done in other cases but only the earnings in proportion to the time that a man might have worked if he had chosen to do so. In other words, we measure partially the actual capacity for work and partially the inclination to work. In general, the two seem to vary together, but the work of the New York State Commission on School Ventilation has shown that during short periods of high temperature, the capacity may remain unimpaired, while the inclination declines. In the practical work of life, a lack of inclination is almost worse than a lack of capacity. During the warmer half of the year, the possible working time in the Florida cigar factories may be properly reckoned as eleven and a half hours. In winter, however, the light at morning and evening is not adequate for the somewhat exacting work of cigar making. Therefore, the men are not allowed to begin so early as in summer, nor to work so late. 
The exact time depends on the degree of cloudiness as well as the height of the sun. The factory managers say that in December the working time is curtailed an hour and a quarter or more for the month as a whole. In order not to make the winter production appear unduly large, I have reckoned that during the shortest week, not month, the working time is an hour and nine minutes, that is, 10% less than in summer. Before and after that date, it steadily increases to the solstices when it reaches the normal. Thus we get the lower curve for Tampa. It drops low in summer and rises to a single maximum in winter. At Jacksonville, the variations in the length of the working day on account of light are less than at Tampa because a lower grade of cigars is made, and hence the men are allowed to work under less favourable conditions of light. Inasmuch as the exact work of dark mornings and evenings cannot be determined, I have drawn two lines at each end of the curve. The lower shows the wages if no allowance is made for light, and the upper if the full tamper allowance is made. The actual truth lies between the two. For our present purpose, this uncertainty makes no difference, since in either case we have the summer minimum and winter maximum which all our other studies would lead us to expect in this latitude. The exigencies of business have more effect on the work of the cigar makers than on that of the other operatives employed in Figure 2, but they do not determine the main fluctuations of the curves here used. In some cigar factories, to be sure, if business is slack, the employees are often not allowed to make more than half or two-thirds usual number of cigars. For this reason, I have omitted two factories whose figures I worked up, but whose curves I finally found to be almost wholly controlled by the supply and demand of the business. In the three factories which were finally used, however, that is, one at Jacksonville and two at Tampa, the operatives are only rarely placed on a limit. It is too expensive, especially where high-priced cigars are made, for four cigars a day have to be allowed to each man for smokes. Each man smokes his full number, if not more, no matter whether he makes 100 cigars or 200. The rush season for cigars begins in June or July and becomes increasingly intense until about the middle of November, by which time most of the Christmas orders have been received. Business is dullest in January and February. The operatives, however, know nothing about this except that they see that men are taken on or discharged. The frequency of changes in the number of employees makes the cigar maker's life hard, and accounts for much of his proverbial shiftlessness. Another thing which affects the wages of cigar makers is the dampness of the air. During the warm, damp days, so characteristic of the Florida summer, the tobacco is very pliable and easily worked, while on dry winter days its brittleness causes it to break so that the work is hampered. If it were not for this, the difference between summer and winter would be intensified. The most striking proof of the effect of the seasons is yet to be recorded. It consists of a series of data corresponding to those of the Connecticut factories, but based on the work of operatives in a large factory engaged in making electrical apparatus at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The employees whose wages were investigated were employed in winding wire coils, assembling the parts of motors and other similar operations which demand accuracy and speed. The admirable way in which the records of this company are kept renders the figures of great value, but lack of time and funds has made it necessary to limit the present investigation to monthly, or in 1912, bi-weekly averages of hourly earnings. For this reason, the resulting curves, which have been inserted as fine dotted lines in Figure 1, page 59, are smoother than those of Connecticut, where the daily earnings have been utilised. The number of piece workers on which these Pittsburgh curves are based is shown in the following table. 1910, approximately 950 men and girls in winding section. 1911, approximately 750 men and girls in winding section. 1912, 27 girls, winders, 42 men, tinners, blacksmiths, painters. In this case, all the operatives were especially steady hands who worked throughout the year. In the few cases where they were absent, interpolation has been resorted to. And this year's curve is more reliable than the others which are based on all the operatives in a given section or in the whole factory without regard to whether they worked steadily. 1913. Approximately 7,000 men and girls in the entire factory. The general form of the curves of Pittsburgh and Connecticut 
is obviously the same. In 1910, notice a deep dip in January and the moderate drop in summer. The next year, 1911, presents quite a different aspect. Because of the hot summer, the depressions in January and July are almost equally deep. The difference between the highest and lowest points is less than in most years, and the autumn maximum does not rise above that of May or June, as is usually the case. The curves for 1912 both show a deep depression in winter, which lasts unusually long. During the summer, on the contrary, there is not so great a decrease in efficiency as during the previous two years. Finally, in 1913, both curves rise steadily from midwinter to late fall, with only a slight drop in summer. The agreement between the curves for Connecticut and Pennsylvania is far too close to be accidental. At Pittsburgh, just as the other factories, variations in the total number of employees form an accurate measure of the demand for work, but these, by no means, vary in harmony with the actual production prerogative. Often the average amount of work done by a given group of individuals, or by all the piece workers, declines when the number of operatives increases, but quite as often the reverse is true. Hence the conditions under which the factories are run do not explain the variations in wages. Moreover, it stands to reason that the same irregular variations would not occur season after season in an electric factory in Pittsburgh, and in brass and hinge factories in Connecticut 400 miles away, unless all were under the same control. The only common controlling factor which varies in harmony with the curves of figure 1 is the general character of the seasons. This is essentially the same in both places. We have now seen that from New England to Florida, physical strength and health vary in accordance with the seasons. Extremes seem to produce the same effect everywhere. The next question is whether mental activity varies in the same way. Lehman and Peterson made a series of tests of the ability of school children in addition. Their general conclusion is that mental work varies in the same way as physical, but reaches its highest efficiency at a lower temperature. This agrees with the investigations of a few other scientists, and with the general conclusions of the world as summed up in the older age. No one is worth a tinker's dam on whom the snow does not fall. Before we can accept this, however, tests are needed on a large scale. The most feasible method at present seems to be by means of the marks of students in such schools as West Point and Annapolis. There the young men live an extremely regular life with a minimum of outside distractions. The recitations are graded with great severity and regularity, and a given subject is often taught six days in a week. The marks are handed to the heads of departments at frequent intervals and are posted where the students can see them. No class is taught in divisions of more than 10 or 12, so that every student has a full opportunity to show how well he is prepared. In order to avoid all chance of favouritism, the instructors do not keep the same division month after month, but change every few weeks. Altogether, it would be hard to devise a system which more thoroughly eliminates the human and accidental factors. As an instructor at West Point put it, we are not really teachers. We are just put here as officers who see whether the cadets have studied their books and to decide how many marks to take off. This is preeminently true in mathematics where the solution of a problem is either right or wrong, and can be marked accordingly. When I broached my plan to the superintendents of the two academies, it was received with much interest, and every facility was placed to my disposal. I take this opportunity to express my warm appreciation of their courtesy. Some of the instructors were commissioned to see that the proper records were available. The marks of individuals were, of course, not necessary. The various marks for each day or week were merely added, and averaged. The data here employed embrace the following. 1. The weekly averages in mathematics for the first year, or entering class and upon for the six academic years beginning with 1907 to 1908, and ending with 1912 to 1913. These classes recite six times a week. 2. The daily marks of first year class in English and Annapolis for the year 1912 to 1913. This class recites four times a week. 3. The daily marks in mathematics for a year and a half for the class entering West Point in 1909 and 1910. Recitations are held six days a week. The classes at Annapolis average about 220 in number, and those at West Point about 120. 
The entire number of students whose marks have been used is between 17 and 1800, but as some of the marks cover a period of a year and a half, the total is equivalent to about 1900 students for a single year. All these marks have been combined into the three lower curves of figure 3. Before discussing them, a few words should be said as to the method of preparation. Figure 3 is displayed on the page, seasonal variations of mental compared with physical activity. The systems of marking at the two academies are quite different. At Annapolis, the Department of Mathematics tries to keep the average as nearly uniform as possible. If the instructors discover that the average is rising or falling, they mark more severely or leniently to counteract it. At West Point, on the other hand, the marks regularly been high at the opening of the term and fall steadily toward the end. There is no attempt to keep them at a uniform level, but the instructors merely mark harder and harder or give more and more work as time goes on. Both systems tend to mask the effect of the seasons. The influence of the deliberate attempt to keep the marks at a uniform level at Annapolis is largely overcome by using a series of six years. The irregularities of one year counteract those of another except where special circumstances such as vacations interpose a disturbing element at the same time each year. In the English department at Annapolis, there is less stringency about keeping the marks at a uniform level, and those of a single year show clearly the normal seasonal trend. At the end of the year, however, I have omitted the two weeks before examinations because there was then a sudden spurt accompanied by abnormally high marks. Otherwise, all the Annapolis marks, without exception, have been employed in computing the curves of figure 3. At West Point, it has been necessary to eliminate the effect of the steady fall. The method is the same as in the correction for increasing practice. In order to eliminate the effect of such things as football games, holidays, examinations, reprimands, or other circumstances which clearly have nothing to do with climate, I have omitted all the days whose marks fall more than 10% above or below what would be expected at that particular date. Omissions of this sort are such a common procedure in astronomical and physical measurements that the mathematician requires nothing more than a mere mention of what has been done. To the layman, it may seem that they are of great importance. In reality, they really alter the general form of the final curves. For exceptionally high figures balance exceptionally low. In the second curve of figure 3, the effect is slight except upon the first weeks of January. Third, the minor maximum which occurs just after the Christmas recess is only about half as large as it would be if no data were omitted. At Annapolis, it is not necessary to omit the days of special events because the marks are not subject to such wide fluctuations. It is interesting to notice that the classes in mathematics there are influenced by the vacation, which comes at the end of January, just as at West Point. The English marks, on the contrary, are uninfluenced, probably because English is an easier subject than mathematics. Moreover, as it is taught fewer days per week, and hence has less weight in determining the final marks for the work of the whole year, the students do not devote so much energy to it. By this time, the reader has doubtless interpreted figure 3 for himself. The upper line is a standard average curve for factory operatives in Connecticut. It is the same as the average curve of figure 1, except that it begins in September instead of January. It is placed here to permit a comparison of the physical work with mental the curves of mental activity all resemble it in having two main maxima, in fall and spring. At West Point, where the climate is essentially the same as in Connecticut, the mental maximum in the fall comes about ten days later than the factory maximum, while the spring maximum comes two and a half months earlier. Both occur when the mean temperature is a little above 40 degrees Fahrenheit. At Annapolis, the maxima are, as it were, pressed toward the winter. The fall maximum in English, to be sure, begins early in November, but lasts till the middle of December. Since it represents the work of only a single year, it is less important than the curve of mathematics, whose fall maximum does not come till the first half of December. The spring maximum of both curves comes in the middle of March. At Annapolis, just as at West Point, the time of best work is when the mean temperature is not far from 40 degrees. Summing up the matter. We find that results of investigations in Denmark, Japan, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New York, Maryland, the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida are in harmony, 
The orchard that except in Florida, neither the winter nor the summer is the most favorable season. Both physical and mental activity reach pronounced maxima in the spring and fall, with minima in midwinter and midsummer. The consistency of our results is of great importance. It leads to belief that in all parts of the world, the climate is exercising an influence which can readily be measured and can be subjected to statistical analysis. It justifies us in going on with confidence to ascertain exactly what effect is produced by each of the climatic elements, such as temperature, humidity, and pressure. End of section 4 Section 5 of Civilization and Climate by Ellsworth Huntington this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 5. The Effect of Humidity and Temperature Having seen that both physical and mental energy vary from season to season according to well-defined laws, let us now investigate the special features of seasonal change which are most effective. Temperature is far the most important, but before considering it, let us discuss those of minor importance. One of these is light. Many students have ascribed great influence to sunlight, and to its variations from season to season, or from one part of the world to another. For example, C. W. Woodruff, an army surgeon, has written an interesting book on the effect of tropical light on white men. Its main thesis is that the backwardness of tropical countries is due to excessive sunlight. The actinic rays at the blue end of the spectrum, especially those beyond the limits of vision, possess great chemical power, as is evident from the fact that, by their aid, photographs can be taken even when no light is visible to the naked eye. Such rays, when they fall upon the human body, are thought to stimulate the cells to greater activity. At first this is beneficial. If it goes to excess, the cells apparently break down. The process is analogous to the ripening of fruit. A moderate change in the green tissues produces the highly favourable condition of ripeness. More brings on decay. Thus, while the return of the light after the winter of the temperate zone may be beneficial, excessive light may be highly injurious. So far as our factory operatives are concerned, no effect of light is to be discerned in the south, while in Connecticut it is at best only slight. The heavy line next to the bottom in figure 1, page 84, shows that from mid-September to the middle of November the amount of work increases, although the days are growing shorter. This is exactly opposite to what would be expected if the shortness of the days were of primary importance. Moreover, in June, when the days are longest, we find a sudden drop. If the length of the days had much to do with the matter, there is no reason why more work should be done in November than in June. Nor shall we find that a shortening of the days during September is accompanied by the same kind of increase in efficiency which is seen in March when the days, although of the same length as in September, are growing longer instead of shorter. For all these reasons we assign only slight importance to variations in the amount of light. Nevertheless, some effect can apparently be detected. Compare the two lower curves of figure 1. In spite of the low efficiency occasioned by the winter's cold, the curve of work begins to rise sooner than does the curve of temperature which is placed below it. The first appreciable lengthening of the days in January may cause this by its cheering and stimulating influence. The line of reasoning applied to light applies also to the possibility that the variations of the curve of work depend on the extent to which people are shut up in the house. Obviously, this has nothing to do with the two maxima in November and May, nor with the minimum in July. In November, people's houses have been shut up for a month more or less, while in May and July, they are wide open, or at least as wide open as they ever are. The extremely low minimum in January, however, is probably due, at least, in part, to the necessity of shutting up the house in winter. In October, the weather becomes so cold that people begin to shut up their houses. They live in stuffy, unventilated quarters and fail to take exercise in the open air. By the middle of November, this has had time to produce an effect which naturally becomes more and more marked as the weeks go on. This would harmonize with the decline of energy from November to the middle of January. 
In January, however, the decline ought not to cease if it is due chiefly to confinement within the house. It ought to continue until about the middle of March, for not till that time do people in Connecticut begin to let in the outside air, and not even then to any great degree. As the curve of work has risen distinctly by that time, some other factor must intervene, presumably the increase of light to a slight extent and the rise of the temperature to a larger extent. A third factor to be considered at this point is the relative humidity of the atmosphere. A sharp distinction must be drawn between the humidity of the outside air and that which prevails within doors. Physicians, students of factory management, school superintendents and many other people have repeatedly discussed the supposed harmful effects of the dry air in our buildings during the winter. A much more fully attested fact is the harmful influence of great humidity during hot weather. We are more conscious of this than of the harm arising from excessive dryness. This does not necessarily mean that the total effect is worse than that of dryness. However, for hot humid days are much rarer than the winter days when the air in our houses is drier than that of the majority of deserts. So far as our curves of work are concerned, humidity does not seem to be responsible for the fluctuations except as it is influenced by temperature. In other words, the average humidity of the outside air from season to season does not vary in such a way as to cause maxima in May and November, and minima in January and July. The average humidity of the outside air in November and in January is not greatly different. Nevertheless, the inside humidity is probably an important factor in causing the low efficiency of midwinter. The relation of work and humidity among the factory operatives in Connecticut is illustrated in Figure 4. There the year has been divided into three parts. One, winter. Two, spring and autumn. And three, summer. In each part, all the days having a given humidity have been averaged together, and the smooth results have been plotted. The heavy solid lines represent what I believe to be the true conditions when other disturbing elements are removed, while the dotted lines show the actual figures. In winter, the dampest days are unmistakably the times of greatest efficiency. We may shiver when the air is raw, but we work well. Figure 4 is displayed on the page. Relative humidity and work in Connecticut. This is partly because in winter, the dampest third of the December's January's, etc., averages nearly 2 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than the driest third. Moreover, moist air at any given temperature feels warmer than dry, and hence is less likely to cause people to overheat their houses. In the spring and fall, when the temperature ranges from freezing to 70 degrees, with an average of about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, the best work is performed with a relative humidity of about 75%. In other words, neither the dry nor the wet days are the best. The summer curve is the most complex of the three. It rises first to a maximum at 60 or 65%, then falls, and once more rises to a higher maximum. The first maximum seems to be due to humidity, the second to temperature. A hot, damp day is unquestionably debilitating. The majority of the dampest days in summer, however, are comparatively cool, for they accompany storms. The coolness counterbalances the humidity, and people's efficiency increases. Hence, we disregard the right-hand maximum and conclude that with an average temperature of 65 degrees to 70 degrees, a relative humidity of about 60% is desirable. The most unmistakable feature of the curves as a whole is that they show a diminution of work in very dry weather. This presumably has a bearing on the low level of the curve of energy in winter. At that season, the air in our houses ought to have a humidity of 60 or 65% but most of the time the figure is only 20 or 30. On very cold days, the percentage is still lower. For instance, if the outside air has a temperature of 14 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 10 degrees Celsius, and it contains all the moisture it can hold, which is usually not the case, its relative humidity when it is warmed to 70 degrees Fahrenheit will be only 12%. Even on days when the outside humidity rises to 100% and the temperature is 40 degrees the air in an ordinary steam-heated house has a relative humidity of only 35%, which is far below the optimum. Apparently, this extreme aridity is debilitating. 
it probably dries up the mucous membranes in such a way as to increase our susceptibility to colds. In this way, it may be an important factor in causing February and March to have the highest death rate of the year. There has been a good deal of discussion as to the actual importance of atmospheric humidity and no small amount of disagreement. We shall return to the matter later when we study health. While the effects of light, of closed houses, and of excessive dryness explain part of the fluctuation of the curve of work, they have little bearing on any season except the winter. Another matter which may be suggested in this connection is vacations. These, like many other conditions of human life, are largely seasonal. Do people work fast in the fall because they have been rested by vacations? In professional occupations and in business, this certainly seems to be the case, but not among factory operatives. As a rule, such people do not take summer vacations. They usually stop work at irregular intervals, or else after Christmas when many factories shut down or work on part-time for a few days to prepare for the new year. The form of our main curve, however, shows that neither at this time nor in summer do vacations produce any appreciable stimulating results. If they were the cause of fast work, the curve ought to be the highest within a few weeks after the people return to work. But this is not the case. During the vacation period of July and August, the amount of work is moderately low, and in early January, after the Christmas break, very low. At the end of August, it begins to increase, and increase steadily for two and a half months. The maximum in November is so long after the vacation period that it can hardly have anything to do with it. What has just been said has an important practical application. There is a common idea that people need vacations in summer. Of course there are strong arguments for this, since pleasant recreation is then possible out of doors. Nevertheless, the need is apparently greater in winter than in summer. To meet this, it is probably wise that work should be light during the winter. Already, as everyone knows, many factories run on part-time during the first few weeks of the year, and now we see that there are strong physical reasons for this. Another important suggestion afforded by our curves is this. If the operatives of a factory or people engaged in any other kind of work are to be speeded up, the time to do it is when nature lends her aid. To speed up at the end of January is analogous to taking a tired horse and expecting him to win a race. Later in the year, however, during the spring, especially in May, people may apparently be pushed to the limit and will not suffer, because their energies are naturally increasing. This is still more the case in October and early November. After the middle of November, pressure may produce important results, as we see at Christmas. Nevertheless, the chances are that if continued, it will produce undue exhaustion, followed by a serious reaction. Possibly the nervousness of Americans is due partially to the fact that although we relax somewhat in summer, we keep ourselves at higher pressure through the winter, when the need of relaxation is greatest. Turning now to temperature, we see that in figure 1, page 84, the lower curve, showing the march of temperature through the year, and the Connecticut curve, just above it, are similar in many ways, both of low and midwinter. From February onward, they rise together until about the middle of June. Then the efficiency curve falls while the other goes on rising, a condition which fully accords with ordinary experience. The fall of the efficiency curve begins when the average temperature has risen to about 68 degrees. When the temperature stops rising, the work stops falling, and then remains nearly steady through July. At the end of July, the mean temperature has fallen to about 71 degrees. During the succeeding period of favourable temperature, the two curves disagree, for the amount of work goes up while the temperature falls. When the average temperature falls below 48 degrees, however, and begins apparently to be unfavourable to physical exertion, the curve of work turns downward. Thereafter, if we omit the Christmas hump and use the dotted line, the temperature and the amount of work decline together until they reach the lowest point in January. It is worthwhile once more to call attention to the somewhat surprising fact that in southern New England, contrary to our ordinary opinion, low temperatures seem to be much more injurious than high. This by no means indicates that high temperature is favourable. Let us consider the effect of the high temperatures of the four successive summers shown in figure 1, page 84. 
Figure 5 displayed on the following page. Average weekly temperature during the summers of 1910-13 to 13 in Connecticut. Compare the summer dip in the Connecticut curve, that is, the area below the horizontal lines, with the heavily shaded areas of Figure 5, which shows the average temperature each week during the four summers from 1910-1913. to 1913. The black portions indicate weeks having an average temperature night and day of over 73 degrees. The size and distribution of these periods of extreme heat are in close correspondence with the amounts by which the curves of figure 1 drop below the horizontal lines during the summers. This is illustrated in the following little table. The line marked Deficiency in Work indicates the amount by which the efficiency of the operatives diminished because of the hot weather, that is, the area below the horizontal lines in figure 1. The year when the diminution was greatest is reckoned as 100 and the others in corresponding ratios. The other numbers show the area of the heavy black shading in figure 5 and represent the intensity and duration of the hot weather. Here too, the year of maximum heat is represented by 100 and the others by proportional values. A small table displayed on the page comparing the year to deficiency in work and severity of heat. In each case, 1911 stands highest 1910 next, and then 1912 and 1913. In 1911, the heat not only was extreme, but lasted long, three weeks at one time and two at another. The death rate for July 1911 in Massachusetts was 50% greater than in the preceding June. In 1910, the hot weather was not so severe. It lasted four weeks instead of five, and was divided into three parts instead of two. In 1912, the number of hot weeks was the same as in 1910. One was extremely hot but the rest were not bad. Moreover, they did not come together, and the last was separated from the others by three cool weeks during which people had time to recover, which was not the case in 1910. Finally, 1913 was a very mild year with only two extreme weeks, which were separated by three moderate weeks. An examination of Figure 5 makes it clear that only the extreme weeks are harmful. Thus, 1911, was a truly terrible summer and 1913 a delightful one. Yet during 1911, the temperature remained above 69 degrees for only 8 weeks, while in 1913, it remained above that figure for 12 weeks. Thus it appears that if the average temperature does not rise above about 70 degrees, and if the noon temperature rarely exceeds 80 degrees, the physical capacity of European races in the United States does not suffer any serious diminution. A slight further rise, however, only 4 or 5 degrees, produces disastrous consequences. A single week of such weather does no great harm, but when several weeks come together, people rapidly become weakened. The weakening is greater than appears in our diagrams, for during hot spells, many of the operatives, particularly the girls, stop work entirely or stay at home in the afternoon. Those who remain are the stronger ones, and naturally their wages are higher than that general average. Moreover, in 1911, the heat was so intense that the factory was shut down for two or three days. Thus, if allowance is made for these facts, the difference which a few degrees make between two summers, such as 1911 and 1913, becomes even more pronounced. The full effect of a hot summer, especially when it is very damp, may be gauged by the death rate in Japan. Page 95. September is there 18% worse than the average instead of 3% better, as in New York. The relation between the temperature and the amount of work in winter during the four years under discussion is not so pronounced as in summer, but can easily be detected. The hot summer of 1911 was followed, as frequently happens, by an uncommonly cold winter. The reason for both is the same. Usually hot weather in New England is commonly due to the movement of heated air from the interior toward the coast, particularly from the southwest to the northeast. Cold winters are due to a similar transportation of air from the interior, this time from the northwest. The interior of a continent, as is well known, cools off very rapidly in winter and becomes hot rapidly in summer. When these conditions are carried from the interior to the coasts, they bring to New England what climatologists call a continental climate instead of the more maritime climate which otherwise prevails. The effect of the cold winter of 1911 to 1912 can easily be seen in the curve for 1912 in figure 1, page 84. 
That year, the average temperature where the factories are located was 19.0 degrees for the first five weeks, compared with an average of 32.7 degrees for the three other years whose curves are given. For the next five weeks, the temperature was 24.4 degrees, compared with 35.3 degrees. The effect of this is seen in the low position of the 9-12 curve of work far into the spring. The fact that the energy of the operatives remained low after the temperature began to rise suggests that the effect of extreme conditions may last long after more normal conditions begin to prevail. The same thing is suggested by the fact that after the summer of 1911, the curve of work does not rise so high in November as in the preceding May. During each of the other three years, the November maximum is higher than its predecessor. Although a single winter and a single summer are not enough to prove that the effect of extreme conditions does not persist for many months, they suggest that a long stay in an adverse climate may produce results which last for years. In spite of a previous statement, it appears that our plan of escaping from positive extreme heat by taking summer vacations in the mountains or at the seaside is wise. Equally wise is the growing habit of getting away from the severe cold for a while in winter. The only trouble is that those who most need such a change are really the ones who get it. If people could spend the summer on the main coast, the winter in Georgia, and the rest of the year in New York, they ought to be able to do the best kind of work at all seasons, almost without the necessity of a vacation. Figure 6 is displayed on the previous page, the effect of the days of the week on peace workers. The effect of temperature may be shown in more ways than have yet been presented. Let us determine how far as people work on days having various temperatures, no matter in what month they occur. The very cold days, of course, all come in winter, but may be in December, January or February. The very hot days come anywhere from May to September, while days with a temperature of about 50 degrees occur in almost every month of the year. The method can be illustrated by taking all the Mondays, all the Tuesdays, the Wednesdays, and so forth, and averaging the work of each day of the week. This has been done for 230 people. The results are shown in figure 6, which is inserted to show exactly how our results are obtained, and how necessary it is to have a large number of people. We are striving to separate the effects of one single condition from those of a vast number. We start with the wages of individuals, which vary from day to day for hundreds of reasons wholly unconnected with the day of the week or the weather. The variations are so great that even if a man is influenced by the approach of payday, for example, we should probably not be able to detect if we merely looked at his wages for a month or two. Therefore we average all the people of a department together and obtain results such as appear in figure 7. This shows the actual wages, in percentages of the maximum, which were earned by 170 people divided into five departments during five weeks in January and February, 1913. There is little uniformity in these different lines. Where one goes up, the other goes down. Yet closer examination shows that in at least four out of the five departments, the wages during the last two weeks were a little larger than during the earlier weeks. The variations of the different curves are in part due to the persistence of individual vagaries which have not yet been averaged out, and in part to conditions affecting whole departments. For example, a foreman is cross one day and good-natured the next, a belt breaks and delays work, or some of the operatives converse so much that their work suffers appreciably. If a number of departments are averaged together, these accidents, as well as those which pertain to individuals, disappear but not until a great many people are considered. Figure 7 is displayed on the previous page. Variations in daily wages, 5 departments, 170 people, and New Britain, Connecticut. To find the effect of the days of the week, we take data such as are illustrated in Figure 7, select all the Mondays, Tuesdays, and so forth, and average each day. This gives a curve of Figure 6. Here we begin to detect a certain degree of uniformity, although the accidents and peculiarities of each department are still in evidence. On the whole, however, the curves are higher at the end of the week than at the beginning, or, to be sure, are irregular, and the two lower, not counting the heavy line, slope in the opposite direction to the rest. The fact that the remaining five slope in the same direction shows, however, that these different people in different factories and during different years were subject to a common influence. 
Finally, we average all the departmental curves, giving each a weight proportional to the number of operatives. Thus, we obtain the heavy lower line of figure 6. This is still irregular, for although 230 people are included, all influences older than that of the days of the week are not yet eliminated. Nevertheless, the wage is clearly increased toward the end of the week. If the operatives were paid by the day instead of by the piece, this would probably not be the case. They would work slowly at the end of the week by reason of being tired. With the piece workers, on the contrary, other considerations are dominant. If they work a trifle slowly on Monday, they can make it up tomorrow. On Tuesday, they can be slow and make it up on Wednesday. But a few who fell behind on Monday are beginning to work harder. So it grows from day to day until on Friday, and especially Saturday, many feel that their earnings for the week are insufficient and hence make an extra effort. In some cases this may not be true, as in the curve next above the average curve. Yet it remains a general truth. And the lower curve of figure 6 is a concrete expression on the fact that in the factory under discussion, there is a difference of at least 2% between Monday and Saturday. Figure 8 is displayed on the following page human activity and mean temperature. Possibly the real difference is greater, and is obscured by the circumstances. In the cigar factories of Florida, it rises to a far greater value, for the Cubans are much disinclined to work after a holiday. Not only are about 10% of the operatives absent on Mondays, but those who are present come so late or are so indisposed to work that they accomplish only about 80% as much work as on other days. This is so important a matter that allowance for it has been made in computations where individual days rather than weeks are concerned. The figures for each day of the week for 780 men at Tampa are as follows. Monday, 81.9%. Tuesday, 98.7%. Wednesday, 99.8%. Thursday, 100%. Friday, 98.3%. And Saturday, 97.9%. The other days are reckoned as of equal weight but the figures for Monday may have increased in the ratio of 82 to 100. By the employment of a method similar to that used with the days of the week, we obtain the curve shown in figure 8. These are based on varying numbers of people, from 1 to over 700. It all show the same general character. With the exception of G and H, which are distinctly the least reliable, the physical group all reach a maxima at a temperature between 59 degrees and 65 degrees. Even the two less reliable curves reach their maxima within the next 4 degrees. All the curves decline at low temperatures, that is, on the left and also at high. The irregularities at the extreme limits are largely due to the fact that there the number of days is so small that exact results cannot be hoped for. Figure 8 with the brief statements which accompany the respective curves, tells the whole story so plainly that it scarcely seems worth while to amplify it. Several points, however, may well be emphasised. For instance, below a certain temperature, which varies from curve to curve, a further reduction does not seem to produce much effect. People apparently become somewhat hardened, or else conditions within the warmed houses do not change much in spite of a change in the outside air. Another noticeable thing is that the curve for girls has greater amplitude than that for men in the same region. Part of this is due to the inclusion of the group of Italians, already referred to, who are engaged in drawing hot brass and hence are benefited by the coldest kind of weather. Even if they were omitted, however, the girls' curve would still vary more than that of the men. This seems to indicate that either because of their sex or because of their age, girls are more sensitive than men. Another point brought out by the curves is that as we go through the more southerly climes, the optimum temperature of the human race becomes higher. It is important to note, however, that the variation in the optimum is slight compared with the variation in the mean temperature of the places in question. For instance, in Connecticut, the optimum seems to be about 60 degrees for people of North European stock. This is about 10 degrees higher than the mean temperature for the year as a whole. In Florida, on the other hand, the optimum for Cubans is about 65 degrees, which is 5 degrees lower than the mean temperature for the year at Tampa. In other words, with a difference of 20 degrees in the mean annual temperature, and with a distinctly northern race compared with the southern, we find that the optimum differs only about 5 degrees Fahrenheit. 
This seems to mean that for the entire human race, the optimum temperature probably does not vary more than 10 or 15 degrees. We have not yet pointed out all the important matters suggested by the curves of figure 8. Above the optimum, the curves in general begin to decline quite rapidly, but then cease to do so, and at higher temperatures are not so low as would be expected. This is largely because in hot weather, many operatives, especially the girls and the Cubans, do not feel like work, and so stay away from the factories. Those who come in spite of the heat are the strongest and most efficient. Naturally, their average wages are higher than those of the ones who stay away, and hence the general level of our curves is too high in the portions based on the hottest weather. The mental curve, however, falls off very rapidly at high temperatures. This is because the students are obliged to be present on hot days, just as on others. They must recite whether they wish or not. Hence their curve is more reliable than the others. In this connection, some experiments carried on by the New York State Commission on Ventilation are of interest. In an attempt to determine the most favourable conditions of ventilation, the Commission placed several groups of persons in rooms where their temperature and humidity were under exact control and measured their strength, mental activity, food consumption and other conditions. The experiments last six or eight hours a day and each set of subjects was tested for several weeks. Three temperatures were used, namely 68 degrees, 75 degrees and 85 degrees. No appreciable effect upon strength could be detected nor upon mental activity and various other functions. This is probably because the experiments were not sufficiently prolonged. That is, the subjects were in the experimental rooms only a third or a quarter of each day, and hence their condition did not have time to change appreciably. Although the subjects did not lose in actual strength, however, their inclination to work declined at high temperatures, even within six or eight hours. Thus far, we have been dealing with large bodies of people. It is peculiarly important to find that no matter how small the number, the same relation to temperature is discernible. One of the curves in figure 8 shows the speed and accuracy of three children who wrote upon the typewriter a few stanzas from the Fairy Queen, or a page from George Eliot daily for a year, and weekly for another year. The records were kindly placed in my disposal by Professor J. McKay Cattle. I have corrected them for the effect of practice and have combined speed and accuracy in such a way that each has the same weight. At one period, for some unknown cause, the efficiency of the children declined greatly for two months or more. If this were eliminated, their maximum would come to a lower temperature than now appears, probably not much above 60 degrees. In the curves of individuals, we are fortunate in having careful tests made by two psychologists, Lehman and Peterson, and Copenhagen. They tested their own strength daily with a dynamometer, and their curves, copied directly from their monographs, are before us. One is uncommonly regular with a maximum at 64 degrees. The other less regular has its maximum at 59 degrees. The agreement of Danish curves based on single individuals in New England curves based on hundreds is highly important. The last thing to be considered in figure 8 is the mental curve at the bottom. It is based on so large a number of people and is so regular that its general reliability seems great, although I think that future studies may show the optimum to be a few degrees higher than is here indicated. It agrees with the results of Lehman and Peterson. Furthermore, from general observation, we are most of us aware that we are mentally more active in comparatively cool weather. Perhaps spring fever is a mental state far more than a physical Apparently, people do the best mental work on days when the thermometer ranges from freezing to about 50 degrees, that is, when the mean temperature is not far from 40 degrees. Inasmuch as human progress depends upon a coordination of mental and physical activity, it may be that the greatest total efficiency occurs halfway between mental and physical optima, that is, with a mean temperature of about 50 degrees. Curves such as those of figure 8 are not more peculiar to man alone. They are apparently characteristic of all types of living creatures. To begin with, plants, many experiments have determined the rate of growth of seedlings at various temperatures. The commonest method has been to grow different sets of seedlings in large numbers under conditions which are identical, except in temperature, and then to measure the average length of the shoots. In all cases, growth is slow at low temperatures, 
increases gradually with higher temperatures, reaches a maximum like that of man, and then falls off quickly. The course of events, however, is not always so regular as here indicated. The curve of wheat, for example, as worked out by MacDougall, is given in figure 9. The peculiar double maximum there seen appears in each case where careful tests are made. It seems to be due to some inherent quality of the plant, and is of special interest in our present study, because we shall soon come upon an allegious case in man. Figure 9 is displayed on the page, growth of wheat at various temperatures, after MacDougall. When many species are averaged, such irregularities disappear, and we obtain the curve at the bottom of figure 10, which has been prepared by MacDougall on the basis of his own measurements, and others given in such works as Perfer's Physiology of Plants. Many of the lower plants, such as marine algae, have their optima at lower temperatures than those here indicated, and the same is probably true of arctic species. On the other hand, certain low algae which grow in hot springs must have their optimum at a temperature above that of ordinary plants. These differences are immaterial. We are now concerned only with the fact that so far as plants have been measured, their response to temperature resembles that of man. Apparently we have to do with a quality which pertains to all kinds of living beings, and is presumably an inherent characteristic of protoplasm. The nearest approach to pure protoplasm is found in unicellular organisms, whose bodies show only the beginnings of differentiation into parts having separate functions. The Infusoria furnish a good example. One of these, Paramoceum, has been carefully studied by L. L. Woodruff. Figure 10 was displayed on the page, Mean Temperature and Vital Processes in Plants, Animals and Man. Its original purpose was to determine whether it was possible for this organism to keep on reproducing itself without conjugation for any great length of time. Under the conditions of nature, the small motile cells often spontaneously develop a median cell wall and ultimately divide into two new individuals, thus reproducing the species. The process, however, does not go on indefinitely, for when two cells come in contact they fuse with one another and then begin a process of fusion which, like the other process, ends in two individuals. Thus we have two types of reproduction, asexual and sexual, which apparently give rise to the same kind of paramousia. Woodruff's purpose was to determine whether asexual reproduction can persist indefinitely, or whether it leads in time to extinction. He has shown that if the media of nutrition contain a sufficient number of elements, paramousium can reproduce itself indefinitely by the asexual method. Between May 1st, 1907 and May 14th, 1914, he had carried his cultures through 4,417 generations without conjugation. In the spring of 1924, the Paramusia were still thriving after about 14,000 asexual generations. In the course of this work, he has found that the rate of cell division is an accurate test of the conditions under which protoplasm exists. For example, when extracts from nephritic kidneys or certain other diseased organs are added to the nutrient solution, even though they are present in such small quantities that they cannot be detected by chemical analysis, they make their presence evident by a falling off in the rate of fission. One of Woodruff's most important lines of work has been to test the relation of his infusoria to temperature. From many experiments he finds that their activity corresponds closely to Van Hoff's law of chemical activity. According to this well-established law, chemical reactions of most kinds at ordinary temperatures become nearly three times as active with every rise of 10 degrees Celsius. Even in inorganic chemical reactions, however, and far more in those of the living cell, there is a distinct limit where the rule breaks down. This limit forms the optimum of the species. At higher temperatures, the degree of activity declines, and finally death ensues. On the basis of these conclusions, Woodruff's data permit us to draw the second curve from the bottom in figure 10. The next higher curve shows the amount of oxygen absorbed by the common crayfish at various temperatures. The most extensive work on this subject appears to have been done by Brunnell. The facts here given are taken from the summary by Putter in his Verklachend Physiologie. 
The amount of oxygen absorbed by an animal is an excellent measure of its physical activity. When supplemented by measurements of the amount of carbon dioxide given off, and of the speed with which certain other metabolic or catabolic processes take place, it gives a true picture of the animal's general condition. Apparently, these various processes follow Van Hoff's law, just as do the growth of plants and the cell division of the infusoria. The optimum in the three cases does not vary greatly, that for plants being about 86 degrees, for paramecium 83 degrees, and for the crayfish 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Physiologists are not yet fully agreed as to the cause of the phenomena shown in these curves, although there is little doubt as to the general facts that they imply. One hypothesis may be briefly stated. According to Putter's summary, the most probable explanation is that activity goes on increasing according to the ordinary chemical law until it becomes so great that the organism is not capable of absorbing the necessary oxygen. That is, at a low temperature, the creature easily gets what oxygen it needs and gives it out again in the form of carbon dioxide or of other oxidized products which remove the waste substances from the body. As the temperature rises, the normal increase in chemical activity takes place. The animal is still able to get rid of all its waste products, and thus its life processes are strengthened. With a further rise of temperature, a chart sets in. The chemical process which breaks down the tissues of the body becomes still more active, but the supply of waste products to be eliminated by oxidation becomes so great that they cannot all be removed. This is because, in every organism, there is a distinct limit to the amount of oxygen which the creature can mechanically convey to different portions within a specified time. If the supply of oxygen is not sufficient to oxidize all the waste products, some of these will remain in the system. They act as poisons. Their first effect is to diminish the organism's activity. If they accumulate to too great an extent, death ensues. The discussion of this hypothesis must be left to the physiologists. They must decide whether the hypothesis which explains the curves of cold-blooded animals and plants is also applicable to warm-blooded animals. There can be little doubt, however, that variations in the rate at which metabolism takes place in the human body play a part in the variations in efficiency which we are here studying. The researches of Thompson illustrate the way in which we are beginning to discover the truth. In Manchester, England, from April to July 1910, and again in March 1913, he measured the percentage of CO2 given off in the breath of four individuals under different conditions of temperature, humidity, and pressure. From his figures, given in the Manchester Memoirs, I have compiled the following tables. A table is displayed on the page. 1. Percentage of CO2 exhaled by four persons under different conditions of temperature. 2. Percentage of CO2 exhaled by four persons under different conditions of humidity. The interpretation of these tables is difficult, and I can merely offer a suggestion. An increase in the proportion of CO2 exhaled from the lungs obviously indicates an acceleration of the metabolic processes which break down and consume the bodily tissues. This liberates energy which may manifest itself in at least three ways and possibly more. It may give rise to heat, which is used to maintain the body at the normal temperature. It may be used to accomplish physical or mental work, and it may cause an excess of heat, which gives rise to further metabolism of a harmful nature. In the first part of the table, the percentage of CO2 is comparatively high at the lowest temperature recorded by Thompson. The do decrease with only slight irregularity till the thermometer reaches 62 degrees Fahrenheit. This is close to the temperature which we have found to be the optimum. Below that point, the increased metabolism is probably needed to keep the body warm. At higher temperatures, increased production of CO2 is again apparent. This perhaps means that too much chemical activity is taking place, and that toxic substances are accumulating in the way suggested by Putter. At the optimum, according to this interpretation, the body does not have to use an undue portion of its strength in keeping warm, nor is it injured by too great stimulation. Thus it is in the best condition for work. The second part of the table shows that in the driest weather which England enjoys, metabolism is more active than in wet weather. Perhaps part of this is due to the fact that in dry air the body loses water and is cooled by evaporation, and hence requires more heat than in wet air of similar temperature. There is more to the matter than this, however, 
but further measurements are needed before an adequate explanation can be offered. All that can be done here is to point out the fact that, in man, as in the lower organisms, activity varies according to temperature. This is evident in figure 10, where the dotted upper line is the curve of mental activity, while the accompanying solid line shows conditions if all accidental irregularities could be removed. The third line, in the same way, represents the physical activity of both men and women in Connecticut. I have not used the figures from the south because they are not quite so reliable as those from Connecticut. Finally, the second line from the top shows physical and mental activity combined, each being given the same weight. It may be taken as representing man's actual productive activity in the things that make for a high civilization. The resemblance of the human curves to those lower organisms is obvious. In general, the lower types of life, or the lower forms of activity, seem to reach their optima at higher temperatures than do the more advanced types and the more lofty functions such as mentality. The whole trend of biological thought is toward the conclusion that the same laws apply to all forms of life. They differ in application, but not in principle. The law of optimum temperature apparently controls the phenomenon of life from the lowest activities of protoplasm to the highest activities of human intellect. End of section 5section six of civilization and climate by osworth huntington this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings in the public domain for more information or volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by leon harvey chapter six work and weather the effect of a given climate depends on two primary factors one is the character of the seasons as expressed in averages such as are furnished by our weather bureaus the other is the changes from day to day, that is, the weather. The boy quoted by Mark Twain was nearly right when he defined the difference between weather and climate as being that climate lasts all the time and weather only a few days. Two climates may be almost identical in their seasonal averages, and yet differ enormously in their effect on life, because in one the change from day to day is scarcely noticeable, while in the other there are all sorts of rapid variations. The old Irish woman who was driving her pigs to market in a pouring rain did not realise it, but she gave expression to a truth of the greatest importance. When a friend pitied her for being out in such weather, and she replied, Indeed, it's bad, but sure it's thankful I am to have any kind of weather. The change from day to day to another depend largely upon our ordinary cyclonic storms. In such storms, the barometer goes down and then up, the wind changes in direction and velocity. The air becomes humid, clouds gather, rain usually falls, and then clear skies and dry air prevail. The temperature also changes, often rising before a storm and falling afterward. Although the exact sequence depends on the location of a region in respect to the ocean and to the centre of the storm, the daily range of temperature also varies. For a dump and cloudy weather, the nights do not become so cool nor the day so warm as when the air is clear. To understand the influence of the weather, all these conditions must be investigated. Most of them, however, appear to be of relatively slight importance when considered by themselves. For instance, Lehman and Peterson could find no appreciable effect of the pressure of the atmosphere, except when low pressure prevails a long time. The decrease in efficiency at such times, however, is probably due more to prolonged cloudiness and as attendant circumstances than to the barometric conditions. My own work leads to the same result. The curves of efficiency compared with pressure are so contradictory that it does not seem worthwhile to publish them. The same is true of the range of temperature from day to night, and of the direction and force of the winds. I have no doubt that all these matters are important, and that some day their effect will be worked out. In general, however, their influence is exerted indirectly through changes in temperature and humidity. In hot weather, a great range from day to night is unquestionably highly favourable, but at ordinary temperatures, it seems to make no special difference, except through its effect upon the mean temperature. As to the winds, Dexter, in his book on weather influences, shows that they produce a marked effect upon the nerves, 
as is indicated by the unruliness of school children in Denver when high south winds prevail. Part of this is doubtless due directly to the wind, but the unseasonably high temperature and extreme dryness which accompany it are probably more important. Yet we are all conscious of the effect of a steady high wind. Some people are stimulated. I have seen a small boy who was usually very quiet climb to the top of a tall tree when a violent wind came up and swing in the branches, singing at the top of his voice. For a while such stimulation is probably beneficial, but if continued day after day it makes people excitable and cross. A striking example of the effect of a prolonged wind is seen in eastern Persia in the basin of Sistan. During the summer, from June to September, the so-called wind of 120 days blows so violently from the north that in the oasis trees cannot grow except under the lee of high walls. The acrid wild melon, which ripens its beautiful little green and yellow fruit in the desert, does not spread its slender branches in all directions after the common fashion of plants. The gales crowd the branches into a sheaf, which points so uniformly in one direction a little to the west of north that it can safely be used as a compass. When Europeans have to endure this wind, they say that it is one of the most trying experiences imaginable. Not only does it render them irritable, but it deadens their initiative and makes them want to stay idly in the shelter of the house. The natives, although possessed of many good qualities, are inert and inefficient even in comparison with their fellow Persians who live farther to the north and west. On the whole, we may probably conclude that occasional short-lived gales and frequent light or moderate winds are beneficial, while long periods either of steady calms or of gales are depressing. Aside from the conditions of weather already mentioned, there are two whose effects appear plainly when curves are constructed according to the method described above. One is a change of temperature from one day to another, and the other is a character of the day as to clouds and sunshine. In considering changes of temperature from one day to the next, we deal with the mean temperature of each day and not with the extremes. A change of as much as 50 degrees is rare. Suppose that the thermometer stands at 60 degrees at sunrise, rises to 80 degrees by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, then falls rapidly to 50 degrees at sunset, and to 40 degrees by midnight. Suppose also that the next day the temperature is 40 degrees at sunrise, rises a little above 55 degrees during the day, and falls again to 45 degrees at night. The two days would be very different, and we should speak of them as being marked by a very great change in temperature, a difference of 40 degrees within 10 hours. Yet the average of the first day would be about 64 degrees, and of the second, 49 degrees, a difference of only 15 degrees in the mean temperature. On the basis of this supposition, the reader can estimate the importance of the various degrees of change indicated in figure 11. At the left, the curve showed the average efficiency on days when the temperature has fallen. In the middle are the days with no change, and at the right are the days characterized by a rise. Taking only the two upper curves, those for men and girls in Connecticut factories, the resemblance is striking. When we consider the heterogeneous character of the original materials, the resemblance is still more important. The men's curve is based on 120 men at Bridgeport in 1910 and 1911, and on 180 men at New Britain in 1911, 1912 and 1913. The girls' curve is based on 196 girls at New Britain in 1911, 1912 and 1913, and on 60 girls at New Haven in 1913 and 1914. Even when the girls and men are working in the same factory, there is no reason, aside from the weather, why their wages should be high on the same day. The chief difference between the two curves is that the one for the girls varies more than that for the men, and reaches its maximum slightly farther to the right. Apparently here, just as in the case of mean temperature, the girls, because of their age or sex, are more subject to the influence of the weather than other men, and hence their curve dips deeper. Let us now interpret the upper curves, beginning at the middle. There they fall to the lowest level. This means that when the temperature of today is the same as that of yesterday, people work more slowly than after a change, no matter whether the change is upward or downward. A variable climate is therefore highly desirable if people are to be efficient. Perhaps the most surprising feature is that the lowest point of the physical curve and a depression of the mental curve, C, come not at zero degrees 
but at minus one degrees. The zero point is low, lower than any point of the physical curves except minus one degrees. Hence our conclusion as to the injurious effect of uniform temperature is justified, but that does not explain the curious dip at minus one degrees. Figure 11 is displayed on the page, human activity and change of mean temperature from day to day. The repetition of the same phenomenon in each of the three upper curves, and a similar occurrence at minus 2 degrees and minus 3 degrees, respectively, in the two curves of the winter, in Florida strongly suggests that we are confronted by a peculiarity which pertains to man as a species, in the same way that a double optimum of mean temperature pertains to wheat as shown in figure 9. Possibly a slight fall in temperature causes people to shiver, as it were, and only when the fall is slightly larger is the circulation of the blood so stimulated as to increase the activity of the various organs. In the south it may be that people's blood is more sluggish than in the north, so that the reaction due to cooler weather does not follow quite so soon, and hence the period of shivering is not over until the fall in mean temperature amounts to more than about 3 degrees. I do not assert that this is so, but it is the only explanation that comes to mind. To go on with our interpretation of the physical curves, a slight rise of temperature seems to be favourable, but beyond that the favourable effects of increased heat, which are strong in cold weather, are neutralised by the unfavourable effects in warm weather. In fact, our personal experience tells us that even when the heat is not extreme, a sudden rise may make us uncomfortable and lazy, as often occurs in the spring. In spite of this, however, a rise is in general better than uniformity. When the temperature falls, on the other hand, a distinct stimulus is received, provided the fall amounts to as much as 4 degrees. The best effects are seen when a fall of from 6 degrees to 9 degrees with girls, and of 7 degrees to 11 degrees with men. Here again the implication is that men are on the whole less sensitive than girls. An extreme drop is not so favourable as one of the more moderate dimensions, especially for the girls. Taking the physical curves as a whole, the greatest amount of energy would be expected in climates where the mean temperature first rises 2 degrees or 3 degrees a day for a few days and then drops 4 degrees to 8 degrees a day. If the changes are greater than this, the effect is still stimulating, but not so beneficial as under the more moderate conditions. If there is practically no change, on the contrary, the level of efficiency lies with the low central depressions of our curves and is less than under either of the other conditions. Mental work resembles physical work, but with interesting differences. When the temperature falls greatly, mental work seems to suffer more than physical, and declines as much as when there is no change. It receives a little stimulus from a slight warming of the air, but appears to be adversely affected when the air becomes warm rapidly. This last statement, however, must be qualified. The physical curves are based on the complete year, and the conditions of summer have an opportunity to balance those of winter. The results show the net effect for all seasons combined. The mental curves, on the other hand, do not include the summer vacation, which lasts from the middle of June to the 1st of September at West Point, and from the middle of May to the 1st of October at Annapolis. If this were included, the effect of a pronounced lowering of the temperature would be more noticeable than at present for such a lowering is naturally more stimulating in July than in January. In another respect also, the curve of mental efficiency needs modification. It is based on figures from two climatic provinces, namely southern New York and Maryland. The great decline at times, when the temperature rises rapidly, is due largely to conditions in Maryland, where the hot days of the spring are much more debilitating than in New York. The students belong to a race which has never learned to endure sudden heat, Hence, they feel it strongly. If allowance is made for the two conditions just mentioned, the mental curve will approach much more closely to the physical. A drop of temperature amounting to 8 degrees or more will appear more stimulating than it now seems to be the case, and a rapid rise will not seem so harmful. Hence, the general conclusion for both physical and mental activity will be essentially the same. It may be summed up thus. Taking the year as a whole, Uniformity of temperature causes low energy. A slight rise is beneficial, but a further rise is of no particular value. The beginning of a fall of temperature is harmful, but when the fall becomes a little larger, it is much more stimulating than a rise. 
When it becomes extreme, however, its beneficial qualities begin to decline. This conclusion must, of course, be appropriately modified according to the season. A cold wave in January is very different from one in July. In our curves, we have given January and July an opportunity to neutralise one another. They have not done so. This means that after all allowances have been made for the seasons, the total effect of cold waves is decidedly beneficial, and the warm waves slightly so. Frequent changes, therefore, are highly desirable. Let us pass on now to the Florida curves. Here we find a curious difference between summer and winter which is not easy to understand. Let us leave that for a moment, however, and consider only the two winter curves. Their general resemblance is marked. The differences at the extremities are not important because the number of days there concerned is very small. It must be remembered that the two curves are from independent and rival factories. The position of any particular point in either curve depends upon a number of days scattered irregularly through the months from October to March. Aside from a genuine effect of climate, there seems to be no possible way in which 400 men in one factory in 1913 could be made to work so that their curve would be the same as that of 380 men in another factory in the two years 1912 to 1913. Here, as in Connecticut, West Point, and Annapolis, we are apparently dealing with a peculiar quality which is inherited in the human species. One of the Florida curves, E, is low at zero degrees, while the other is medium. This means that days when there is no change in temperature are not particularly favourable. At plus two degrees to plus four degrees, however, both are fairly high, which indicates that a moderate rise of temperature is favourable. A further rise seems to be harmful. The effect of a slight fall of the thermometer has already been discussed. A further fall is beneficial. The most notable thing about curves D and E is a maximum from minus 4 degrees to minus 7 degrees. It comes at about the same place as the mental maximum, and is similar to the Connecticut maximum except that the people in the far south do not seem to be able to stand such extreme changes as do those in the north. In fact, it seems most significant that the Connecticut men, who are the strongest of our various groups, are most stimulated by a strong change of temperature. The Connecticut girls come next, but, being less sturdy, they do not profit quite so much by rigorous conditions. The mental curve is largely determined by Annapolis, and as the climate there is less severe than in Connecticut, the students seem to feel more keenly the effect of extreme changes, although they are stimulated by those of moderate dimensions. The same is still more true with the people of Florida in winter. Finally, during the summer, the Floridians are stimulated by a slight drop of temperature provided it is not enough to make them feel chilly, but enough to start their blood in motion. A greater drop it makes them feel cold, while even the slightest rise of temperature in the long monotonous summer is unfavourable. We are ready now to sum up our results. The outstanding point is that changes of temperature, provided they are not too great, are more stimulating than uniformity, while a fall is more stimulating than a rise in the latitudes now under consideration. The effect of changes depends largely upon the degree to which people are inured to them. When they are weakened by a long hot period like that of the Florida summer, even a slight cooling of the air brings relief and activity, provided it does not go so far as to make people feel chilly. When the same Floridians become wanton to the somewhat sterner, albeit mild air of the winter, the first effect of a lowering of the temperature may be to make them shiver, but soon they are stimulated and work fast. They are not so tough, however, as to be able to get benefit from the occasional days when really strong cold waves sweep down upon them. On the other hand, a rise of temperature stimulates them, unless it is of considerable severity. Farther north the same applies except that, being tougher, the people are more benefited by strong changes. Judging by the difference between summer and winter in Florida, it looks as if a little hardening would cause even the Cubans to respond favourably to changes at least as severe as those in Maryland, thus making the left-hand part of their curve like C in figure 11. Taking it all in all, the one thing that stands out preeminently is that a fall from 4 degrees to 7 degrees is everywhere stimulating, provided people are accustomed to it. Man is not the only organism that is benefited by the changes of temperature. Numerous experiments have shown that plants are subject to a similar influence. 
If a plant is subjected to unduly low or high temperature, its growth is retarded. As the temperature approaches the optimum, the rate of growth increases. When the temperature is maintained steadily, however, not only does the increase cease, but retrogression sets in, and the rate of growth declines. A moderate change of temperature away from the optimum, and then back again after a few hours checks this decline and keeps the plant at a maximum degree of activity. Thus conditions where the thermometer swings back and forth on either side of the optimum are distinctly better than where the optimum is maintained steadily. Thus it seems to be a law of organic life that variable temperature is better than uniformity. The physiological process by which frequent changes of temperature affect the body is not yet known. The best suggestion seems to be that of Dr. W. B. James. It is universally recognized that one of the most important of the bodily functions is the circulation of the blood. The more active and unrestricted it is, the more thoroughly is the whole system nourished and purified. Provided it does not impose an undue strain on the heart or arteries, Anything that stimulates the circulation appears to be helpful. Changes of temperature are a powerful agent to this end. Witness the effect of a bath, either cold or very hot. Few things are more stimulating than a Swedish bath. An attendant holds two hoses, one with cold water and the other with hot, and plays them alternately upon the patient. A man goes into such a bath with hanging head and dragging feet. He comes out with head erect and a new spring in his walk. Apparently, frequent changes of the temperature of the air produce much the same effect. No one change produces so pronounced an effect as a Swedish bath, but the succession of stimuli due to repeated change throughout the year must be of great importance. Before leaving this subject, let us taste the effect of changes in still another way. Let us see what happens during an average series of days, such as make up or common succession of weather in New England. The ordinary course of events is first a day or two of clear weather, then a day or two of partially cloudy weather, next a cloudy day with or without rain, and finally another cloudy day during which rain falls. Then the sky clears in preparation of another similar series. On this basis I have formed the six groups indicated at the top of figure 12. At the left, the efficiency on all clear days which follow cloudy or partially cloudy days has been plotted just as in another diagram, we plotted the efficiency on Mondays. Next come the clear days which follow another clear day. If several of these follow in unbroken succession, they are all included, but a third or fourth clear day is rare. In the next group come the partially cloudy days which follow either a clear or a cloudy day. The great majority follow clear days. A second partially cloudy day is much rarer than a second clear day, and a third is still rarer. The first cloudy day, the fifth column, includes cloudy days which follow either clear or partially cloudy days. Finally, the sixth column includes not only the second cloudy day, but the third and fourth if such are recorded. In general, this column represents days when a storm comes to an end, while the one on the left of it represents the time when a storm first becomes well established. The rest of the diagram, to the right of the sixth column, is merely a repetition of the part already described. It is inserted to show how an ideal series of storms would repeat itself. Figure 12 discloses some surprising facts. For instance, the first day is characterized by the slowest work in the two upper curves, and by almost the slowest in the third. Figure 12 is displayed on the page, the stimulus of storms. Our impression of the stimulus of the bright clear air after a storm receives a flat contradiction. It is apparently psychological, not physical. The second clear day makes a better showing than the first. It stands high in two curves, and low in only one. The first partially cloudy day is high in one curve and medium in two. The second partially cloudy day is medium in all three. The same is true of the first cloudy day. The last cloudy day is as surprising as the first clear day. In each of the three curves it stands highest. People work fastest at the end of a storm. In the lower curve of figure 12, the whole matter is summed up in a single line. Here we see that during an average spell of weather, people are least efficient on the clear days, moderately efficient on the partially cloudy days, on the first cloudy day, and most efficient at the end of the storm. We may tell ourselves that this is unreasonable, but when we think it over, 
we are likely to be aware of its truth. Before a storm we may feel depressed, but at the end, when the rain or snow is almost over and the air begins to have the excellent quality which makes us forget all about it, we bend to our work with a steadiness and concentration which are much less common at other times. Helpak emphasizes this in his book on the psychological effect of geographical conditions. We fail to appreciate largely because the aesthetic impressions of a beautiful clear day are felt much more consciously than are the physiological conditions which throw us vigorously into our work. Each storm with its changing skies, varying humidity, and slow rise of rapid fall of temperature is a stimulant. Each raises our efficiency. This ends our survey of the effect of climate upon daily work in the eastern United States. We have considered the influence of the seasons, of mean temperature, of humidity, of winds, of changes of temperature from day to day, and of the character of each day as relation to storms. We have also seen that although different races, or people under decidedly diverse climatic environments, are at their best at slightly different temperatures, the differences are inconsiderable, the changes of temperature are as valuable to one as to the other. The question now arises whether the climatic effects are really of great importance. In Figure 12, the stimulus of the succession of clear and cloudy days amounts to only 1%. In Figure 11, changes of temperature from day to day produce a variation of only a little over 2%, if we omit the irregular and unreliable extremities of the curves. In Figure 4, the maximum effect of humidity appears to be only 3%. In figure 8, however, the differences are greater, for the effect of mean temperature upon the girls in Connecticut is 7%. Finally, in figure 1, the effect of the seasons reaches nearly 9% when four years are averaged, and nearly 15% for individual years. These figures are far from representing the full importance of the various factors. This will readily appear from a little consideration. In the preceding paragraph, the percentages increase in proportion to two conditions. First, the degree to which the influence of a single factor is separated from the influence of all other factors. And second, the length of time during which each factor is able to exert its influence. The smallest figure, 1% in figure 12, does not represent any individual factor, unless it be cloudiness. It does not even represent the fluctuations which attend an individual storm for the days were selected without regard to their position in a cyclonic disturbance, but simply according to their cloudiness. The variations shown in the curve are due to many factors, including mean temperature, changes of temperature, relative humidity, and others of minor importance. As no two of these are necessarily at their maximum at the same time, they neutralize one another. Moreover, a given condition lasts only a day in most cases, and has no opportunity to produce any great effect. In the curve of changes of temperature from day to day, which shows the next larger effect, a single factor is singled out. Its full force can by no means be seen, however, for the humidity often varies in such a way as to neutralize it. Moreover, the effects of especially low or high temperatures may often completely overshadow any stimulus arising from the, the mere fact of a change. Furthermore, the effect of changes of temperature rarely continues more than two days. For example, if the thermometer averages six degrees lower on one day than on the preceding, it may happen that there will be a further drop before the next day, and there is far more chance that the temperature will rise a little or remain stationary, or fall so little that it will not be stimulating. Hence, the effect is rarely cumulative, and the influence of a single day must usually stand by itself. Much the same is true of relative humidity, except that by heating our houses we artificially induce long periods of great aridity. The effects of mean temperature, on the other hand, have a greater opportunity to show their full importance, though they, too, are hampered. Relatively low or high temperatures last many weeks, which makes it possible for the effect of day after day to accumulate. Yet our curves by no means show the full effect, for a cold day with a mean temperature of 30 degrees may come in November, at a time when efficiency is still at its highest. It produces its normal effect, but a single, unpropitious day, or even a week, does not suffice to depress people's vitality to a degree at all approaching the low limit reached after two months of cold weather. Likewise, a day with the most favourable temperature, not far from 60 degrees, 
may be sandwiched between very hot days in July or between two cold days in March. Hence, people will display little energy on those particular days, and the average efficiency at the optimum temperature will appear correspondingly lower than it ought. Finally, the seasons have more opportunity than the individual climatic elements to produce their full effect. Even here, however, the variability of our climate does not allow any special combination of circumstances to work long unimpeded. Warm waves break the cold periods of winter, and cool waves come in summer. Storms are more active in winter than in summer, and hence their stimulus works towards overcoming the effect of prolonged cold. Moreover, no single season is of great duration, and extreme conditions do not last long enough to produce their full effect. From this we may conclude that the total influence of climate upon energy is much greater than appears in any one of our curves. The difficulty of determining the exact proportions of any individual influence may be made clear by an example. We know that man's power to work depends upon food, drink, sleep and clothing. Suppose that while he was still supplied with these in normal quantities, we were to try to measure the effect of each. We should test his strength at stated intervals after he had eaten his meals, or after he had had a drink. We should find out how many hours he slept each night, and compare that with his work. We should measure his achievements before and after he put on his spring underwear or fall overcoat. We might get results but it is highly doubtful whether they would be as distinct as those here discussed. We have no difficulty in measuring the effect of food, drink, sleep, or clothing, for we can easily vary them to suit the needs of our experiment. With climate, the case is different. We must take it as we find it, and must experiment on people who are constantly subject to its influence. Some day we shall test people first in one climate and then in another, but that will be difficult because it takes a considerable time for climate to produce its full effect. Being obliged to search for the effects of climate without being able to change them in accordance with the needs of our experiment, we are in almost as difficult a case as the experimenter who should desire to determine the effect of the amount and kind of food consumed by a group of individuals, but who had no control over how much they ate. They might allow him to measure what was set before them at each meal, and what remained when it was over, but they would eat as much as they liked and when they liked. He would get results, if he did his work carefully, but they would by no means represent the full effect of food. The influence of climate upon men may be likened to that of a driver upon his horse. Some drivers let their horses go as they please. Now and then a horse may run away, but the average pace is slow. Such drivers are like an unstimulating climate. Others whip their horses and urge them to the limit all the time. They make rapid progress for a while, but in the end they exhaust their animals. They resemble climates which are always stimulating. In such climates, nervous exhaustion is likely to prevail and insanity becomes common. A third type of drivers first whip their horses to a great speed for a mile or two and then let them walk slowly for another mile or two. They often think that they are accomplishing great things, and they are better off than the two types already mentioned, but they still have much to learn. They are like a climate which has a strong contrast of seasons, one being favourable and the other unfavourable. Still a fourth kind of driver may whip his horse sometimes, and sometimes let him walk. But what he does chiefly is to urge the animal gently with the voice, then check him a little with the rein. By alternate urging and checking, he conserves the animal's strength, and in the long run can cover more distance and do it more rapidly than any of the others. Such a driver resembles a climate which has enough contrast of seasons to be stimulating but not to create nervous tension, and which also possesses frequent storms whose function is to furnish the slight urging and checking which are so valuable in the total effect, although each individual impulse is almost unnoticeable. End of section 6《Section 7 of Civilization and Climate by Ellsworth Huntington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 7 Health and Atmosphere. We have investigated the relation of the weather to human energy. 
Let us do the same for health. In a previous chapter, we saw that variations in the death rate in New York and Japan and the gain in weight among tubercular patients exhibit seasonal fluctuations, much like those for workers in factories. As a means of measuring health, deaths are more important than disease for two reasons. First, experience has shown that when several years are averaged together, the death rate is an almost perfect measure of the number and severity of the diseases which afflict a community. Second, the records of disease are very scanty and imperfect. They have never been tabulated on a large scale for the entire population. Only in rare cases can the records of certain diseases be used as well as those of deaths. Accurate mortality records, on the contrary, have now been kept for many years. The health of practically every community varies in response to the seasons. In the northern United States, most physicians are far busier in February and March than in May and June. In July and August, the demand for their services increases again, especially among children. Then come the best months of the year, especially October, when good health and good spirits abound. Different types of disease, to be sure, display different seasonal adaptations. Those of the respiratory organs, for example, reach a maximum in winter, while those of the digestive tract are more numerous in summer. Admitting, then, that both energy and health show marked seasonal variations, our aim is to determine how closely the two sets of variations are in harmony. Part of the answer is illustrated in Figure 13. Figure 13 is displayed on the page, Seasonal Variations in Energy and Health. The upper line, A, represents variations in the efficiency of factory workers in Connecticut from January 1910 to December 1914, as already given in Figure 1. The second line, B, is the similar curve for Pittsburgh. The two lower lines illustrate fluctuations in health in Connecticut, C, and Pennsylvania, D. They are the curves of the death rate inverted so that high parts indicate good conditions or few deaths, and low parts, poor conditions or many deaths. Thus permitting easy comparison with the efficiency curves, it is obvious not only that the two efficiency curves and the two health curves run almost parallel, but that there is also a close parallelism between health and efficiency. Aside from the weather, all possible causes of such parallelism seem to be excluded, for epidemics, business disturbances, and the like do not occur in such a way as to explain the similar fluctuations into diverse phenomena hundreds of miles apart. Note how closely the four curves agree, even in details. Low efficiency during January 1910 is followed by a month or two by very poor health. During the spring, both efficiency and health improve. Then comes the summer with a mild tendency toward a drop in all the curves, and the autumn with the main maximum of the year. In 1911, the parallelism of the four curves is again evident, as is the lag of the mortality curve after that of efficiency. In 1912 and 1913, the sag of all the curves in summer diminishes and disappears. For those years, it will be remembered, had only short periods of really hot weather. The similarity of the four curves, especially in the summer, would be still more marked were it not for the deaths of children under two years of age have been embedded in the mortality curves. Since many other observations point in the same direction, we conclude that unfavorable weather, such as commonly prevails in January, has a media effect in reducing people's vitality and energy. Hence their work falls off. At the same time, they become more susceptible to disease. Accordingly, in due time, the number of deaths increases. Naturally, the greatest mortality lags several weeks after the lowest efficiency. It takes time for bacteria to produce infection, and for infection to lead to death. The lag is longer in winter, when respiratory diseases are the chief enemy, than in summer, when digestive diseases with their more rapid course are the chief foes. The agreement between health and energy is thus so close that both appear to depend upon essentially the same fluctuations of the weather. It is especially important to determine the relation of the weather to mental as well as physical health. Hence, peculiar interest attaches to certain studies of mental abnormalities carried on by Norbury. He finds that the admissions to psychiatric hospitals show that mental disorders in their incipiency and recurrence parallel the efficiency curves of Huntington. Maximum in the spring, minimum in the autumn. His curves show that certain maxima of admissions for mental disorders occurs in the following periods. Civil hospitals in New York State, 1916-1921, June. 
Norbury Sanatorium in Jacksonville, Illinois, 1900 to 1923, May. Massachusetts State Hospital, 1922 to 1923, May and June. State Hospitals, Northern United States, 1922 to 1923, March. After the maximum, the diminution in emissions is, in all cases, very rapid. The number of emissions fell to the lowest point at the following periods. New York State Hospitals, September, February. Dr. Norbury's Sanatorium, October, February. Massachusetts State Hospital, November, February. State Hospitals, Northern United States, August, February. Across the Atlantic, insanity in London reaches a distinct maximum in May and is low from July to February. Almost identical conditions prevail as to suicide, except that the fall from the high point in June is not so rapid as in the case of insanity, although the maximum is reached earlier, that is, in November and December, instead from July to February. As to the nervous disorders in continental Europe, Garnier states that general paralysis in Paris follows a seasonal course almost identical with that of insanity in London. Now, nervous breakdowns, insanity, suicide and paralysis, as normally shows, are all due mainly to the same cause, namely fatigue of the nerves. Such fatigue, he says, is apparently controlled to a large degree by the seasons. But just as the maximum number of deaths lags some weeks or even a month or two after the time when the weather produces the lowest efficiency in factories, so the maximum effect of fatigue of the nerves lags still more, and the greatest number of nervous breakdowns may occur three or four months after the period of least efficiency as measured by daily work. The universality with which the bodily functions respond to the seasons may be judged from two other recent investigations. In one case, Hess has shown that among infants the phosphates of the blood, which are an essential element for growth, show a pronounced seasonal tide. During the year covered by his observations, the percentage of phosphates in the blood stood at 4.34 mg per cent during June and July 1921. It may have risen higher during the succeeding months, but no records were kept. In December it had fallen to 3.92, and in March to 3.58. Presumably it would have fallen still lower, but whenever the phosphates fell below 3.75, the children were treated with ultraviolet light, which effectively increases not only the phosphates, but also the calcium and probably other important elements of the blood. It has been found by many authorities that the children's disease known as rickets follows a seasonal course like that of the phosphates and is connected more or less closely with the amount of ultraviolet light. For our present purposes, however, the important point is that the essential phosphates in children show the same general seasonal variation as a death rate, and as mental breakdown among adults, the lag being perhaps greater than in the death rate, but less than in mental collapses. Another case of seasonal fluctuations is discussed by Porter of the Harvard Medical School. In cooperation with the Health Department of Boston, monthly records of the weight of several thousands of the younger school children were begun in 1909 and continued until 1919. Among the boys born in 1905, the average increase in weight from month to month during the years 1911 to 1918 was as follows. January to February, gain 0.18 pounds. February to March, gain 0.47 pounds. March to April, gain of 2.2 pounds. April to May, reduction of 0.16 pounds. May to June, gain of 0.05 pounds. June to July, gain of 0.5 pounds. July to August, gain of 0.80 pounds. August to September, gain of 0.93 pounds. September to October, gain 0.96 pounds. October to November, gain 0.16 pounds. November to December, gain 0.68 pounds. December to January, gain 0.98 pounds. In interpreting this table, allowance must be made for clothing. In May, the children exchange their winter clothes for those which are somewhat lighter, while about the end of September, the opposite change takes place. Allowance must also be made for the long summer vacation with its opportunities for outdoor play, which naturally causes the children's weight to increase rapidly. If allowances is made for these two facts, the regularity of the seasonal trend of growth is intensified.
From January onward, the children grow slowly. In the spring, after the phosphates have reached the minimum, at the very time when grown people are most subject to mental breakdowns, the children practically cease to grow. Not until the summer vacation begins do they recover from the effect of the winter. In the summer, the fourfold advantages of freedom from school, favourable weather, much outdoor life, and a more varied and healthful diet than at other seasons cause rapid gain in weight. This game seems to be checked somewhat when school begins, but is resumed during the late fall and early winter. In spite of confinement in school, little outdoor play, and a diet relatively poor in vitamins and other important elements, the children gain weight more rapidly in December than in any other month except, perhaps, at the end of the summer vacation. The chief favourable factor appears to be the climate, the stimulus of which does not disappear until the advent of really cold weather. The sudden decline in the children's rate of gain during January appears to correspond closely with the drop in the efficiency of factory workers at about the same time, but the effect on growth lasts much longer than does the more direct effect upon activity. Among the many other instances of seasonal fluctuations in human health, one of the most remarkable is illustrated in Figure 14. Figure 14 is displayed on the page, Seasonal Variations of Conceptions and Death in Japan, 1901 to 1910. The upper line indicates for each month the average daily number of conceptions which resulted in the birth of living children in Japan during the 10 years from 1901 to 1910. A pronounced maximum in June is followed by a diminution of 46%, which culminates in September at the end of the long, hot, humid summer. Then comes a recovery which is checked but not reversed during the winter, and which resumes its course during the delightful spring weather of April, May and June. The second curve shows the average number of deaths per day. It is almost exactly the reverse of the curve of conceptions. In other words, during the months when many people are sick and die, the number of conceptions is either very low or else a large number of conceptions result in miscarriages or stillbirths. The most extraordinary feature of Figure 14 is the fact that the curves of conception and mortality cross one another in September. The same fact is illustrated in the lowest curve, which indicates the excess of conceptions over deaths. In June, the conceptions which give rise to living children outnumber the deaths by nearly 2.5 to 1. In September, the conceptions are less numerous than the deaths. No seasonal variations in farm work or social custom seem competent to explain more than an insignificant part of the great contrast between May and September. The explanation seems to be that the hot, humid summer saps the vitality of the Japanese, especially the women, so that they are physically unable to reproduce themselves. If the weather which prevails in July and August should prevail throughout the year, the Japanese as a race would apparently diminish in numbers instead of increasing with disquieting rapidity. Under such circumstances, natural selection would presumably work with great vigour. A race might arise capable of withstanding the most intense tropical conditions, but it would presumably differ from the present Japanese in many qualities such as energy and initiative. It would be easy to multiply examples, but space forbids. All sorts of physiological conditions appear to vary from season to season in essentially the same way, except that some responses, such as the energy of people in good health, lag only a little after the climatic conditions. Others, such as diseases and the rate of reproduction, lag several weeks and still others, such as the growth of children and the occurrence of nervous breakdowns and suicides, lag still farther. In the case of the mental disturbances, the lag is so great that it almost seems as if the onset of stimulating weather after a period of unfavorable weather had the effect of causing a sudden collapse. In reality, the real state of affairs may perhaps be this. The winter months produce an effect like that of driving a horse without rest, and as rapidly as possible over a bad road. When a stretch of good road is reached, the driver, to whom we may liken the weather, whips the animal to his topmost speed, and the tired beast soon breaks down. Let us now try to analyse the effect of the seasons upon health, and determine the relative part played by temperature, humidity, and variability. A study of about 9 million deaths by means of climograss, as described in World Power and Evolution, leads to the conclusion that the optimum or most favourable condition for human health is an average outside temperature of about 64 degrees Fahrenheit, 18 degrees Celsius, for day and night, 
a relative humidity of about 80%, and a fairly high degree of storminess, or at least of variability from day to day. This means a climate in which the midday temperature rises to 70 degrees more or less, while that of the night falls below 60 degrees. With the rise in temperature, the noonday relative humidity declines to perhaps 60%, or during the cool night it rises high enough so that dew is precipitated. But a constant succession of clear days is not desirable. There must be occasional rains and variations in temperature, wind and cloudiness from day to day. Tampa experiences such conditions at the end of February, New Orleans in March, Asheville in May, Atlantic City in early June, Seattle in August, Nantucket and Boston in September, and Portland, Oregon in October. At the season when people go in largest numbers to many famous health resorts, the majority of such places enjoy climatic conditions closely approaching those which are ideal for physical health. A table is played on the page. Effect of Temperature on Health and Strength The preceding table illustrates the type of statistical evidence on which is based the conclusion that a mean temperature of 64 degrees Fahrenheit is the optimum. The experimental evidence will be illustrated later. Columns A, B and C explain themselves. Column D indicates the approximate percentage by which a change of 10 degrees Fahrenheit raises or lowers a death rate when the temperature ranges between 30 and 60 degrees. When all seasons are taken together, the net effect of a rise of temperature under such conditions is to lower the death rate, while a fall increases the death rate. This, however, applies only to a rise or fall in which the new condition of temperature endures for some time, as in the change from season to season. In 12 of the 18 cases in this table, the optimum outside temperature was from 62 degrees to 75 degrees Fahrenheit and in five cases, 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Two of the cases where the optimum falls to 60 degrees or lower were piecework in Connecticut factories. This may be because such work involves mental as well as physical activity. We have found some evidence that the optimum temperature for mental work is considerably below that for physical work. Naturally, an occupation where mental and physical alertness are both needed would be most favoured by a temperature between the best temperatures for the body and the mind. As to the low optimum of the North Italians, 58 degrees, I have no explanation. The cause could perhaps be detected by a study of the other elements of the weather, such as humidity and wind, or of local diseases such as malaria. It is worth noting, however, that Campani, from an analysis of 24,500 deaths in Milan, obtains results closely similar to those here set forth. His results, to be sure, are especially important in respect to the variability rather than temperature. He finds that deaths are least numerous just after storms while the wind is blowing. They are most numerous in still air during the periods of stagnation and after periods with little change of temperature. Changes of temperature are beneficial in North Italy just as in America. Among the three cases of the preceding table, where the optimum temperature is above 65 degrees, one represents Cubans of Spanish descent, but with a good deal of coloured admixture, and a second represents Negroes. In the first case, life in a tropical climate has presumably raised the optimum temperature somewhat. In the second, although the Negroes here dealt with lived largely in the parts of the United States from Maryland northward, they probably still retained an ancestral adaptation to a slightly warmer climate than that which is best for the white race. It is worth noting, however, that the Cubans have spent practically their whole lives where the coolest month averages about 70 degrees and the hottest over 80 degrees, while the ancestors of the Negroes have dwelt for untold generations in regions still warmer. Nevertheless, the optimum for both groups, 68 degrees, seems to be lower not only than the average temperature of their homes, but than the average for the coolest months in those homes. I might add that for Negroes, the optimum humidity seems to be a little higher than for white men. This again may be an inheritance from a former environment. Such differences between diverse races suggest that permanent physiological change takes place whereby races become adjusted to diverse climates. The slightness of the differences, however, suggests that such adjustment is very slow and incomplete. An earlier and more fundamental adjustment to climate appears still to be largely dominant, 
and may represent the climate under which man's chief physical evolution took place. As for the extreme variation in California, where 70 degrees appears to be the best temperature, I am inclined to think that it is due to accident. The California results depend largely on two cities, San Francisco, where the mean monthly temperature never reaches 70 degrees, and Los Angeles, where conditions of wind and humidity may account for the favorable conditions during the months of high temperature. It is interesting to note that the average of the six extreme cases in the table is 64.2 degrees, against 63.9 degrees for the 12 medium cases. It must be borne in mind, however, that the best temperature is not the same in dry climates as in moist. We shall return to this later. The conclusion that an outside mean temperature of about 64 degrees Fahrenheit is the optimum for Europeans agrees closely with the conclusion now widely accepted that an inside temperature not above 68 degrees and preferably lower is the ideal. The effects of deviations from this ideal have been the subject of many careful experimental investigations, among which those carried on by the New York State Ventilation Commission under the chairman of Professor C. E. A. Winslow are especially notable. The results of these experiments, as set forth in a volume entitled Ventilation, are so important that I shall conclude this chapter by quoting several pages which perhaps which pertain not only to temperature, but to all other atmospheric conditions. The work of previous investigators, from Hermans to Leonard Hill, has made it abundantly clear that extreme high atmospheric temperatures are highly prejudicial to human health and comfort, and that it is to such temperatures, rather than to chemical pollution, that the most serious effects of bad air are due. The most important result of our experiments has perhaps been the demonstration that even moderately high temperatures, between 24 degrees and 30 degrees Celsius, 75 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, are accompanied by demonstrable harmful results. A body temperature and circulatory phenomena. We find that the rectal body temperature exhibits a definite relation to the temperature of the atmospheric environment. The body temperature when observed at 8 a.m. during the summertime, showing a fairly close parallelism with the average temperature of the outdoor air for the preceding night. In our experimental chamber, we found that at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, the rectal temperature and heart rate tended to fall. The Crampton index of acetone increased, the resistance of the peripheral portion of the circulatory system rose, and the velocity of the blood flow was correspondingly lessened. At 75 degrees Fahrenheit, the rectal temperature, heart rate, and Crampton index changed but slowly. At 86 degrees Fahrenheit, with 80% relative humidity, the rectal temperature and heart rate rose. The Crampton index fell, the peripheral resistance decreased, and the velocity of blood flow increased. The final average results obtained under the three atmospheric conditions were as indicated below. A table is displayed on the page comparing the rectal temperature, heart rate reclining, heart rate standing and Crampton index to the temperatures and relative humidity. We are not prepared to say whether the maximum heart rates attained at 75 degrees Fahrenheit as compared to 86 degrees Fahrenheit are significant, but it is clear that rectal body temperature bears a direct and the Crampton index an inverse relation to atmospheric temperature. After vigorous physical work, the return of the heart rate to normal was somewhat more prompt at 68 degrees Fahrenheit than at 75 degrees. Systolic and diastolic blood pressure showed no very definite relation to temperature between 68 degrees Fahrenheit and 86 degrees Fahrenheit, but at 101 degrees Fahrenheit, blood pressure as well as rectal temperature and heart rate showed marked increases. B. Other physiological phenomena. The rate of respiration was slightly increased by moderately high temperatures, from an average of 17.9 at 68 degrees Fahrenheit to 19.3 at 75 degrees Fahrenheit and 19.7 at 86 degrees Fahrenheit. While at 101 degrees Fahrenheit, the increase was very marked. The dead space of the lungs, the volume of the supplemental air, the alkaline reserve of the blood, the respiratory quotient, the carbohydrate metabolism, the protein metabolism, and the total metabolism show no demonstrable relation to atmospheric temperature under the conditions studied in our experiments. C. Comfort and mental efficiency. So far as the sensations of the subjects are concerned, 
as evidenced by their votes as to the comfortableness of the experimental chamber. The difference between 68 degrees Fahrenheit and 75 degrees Fahrenheit is comparatively slight, but a temperature of 86 degrees Fahrenheit with 80% relative humidity is distinctly uncomfortable, the average votes falling sharply whether this condition is reached. This discomfort is not, however, accompanied by any inability to perform mental work, such as naming of colours and opposites, cancellation, mental multiplication and addition. Subjects urged to maximal performance did equally well under both conditions. The conditions being maintained for four hours a day on five consecutive days or for eight hours a day on four consecutive days. Longer hours of exposure continued for a prolonged period might of course yield different results, even when the subject was left free to work or not, as much mental work was accompanied at 75 degrees Fahrenheit as at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, although in one short experiment a temperature of 86 degrees Fahrenheit did seem to diminish the inclination to do mental work. At 75 degrees Fahrenheit, typewriting, which involves a certain amount of neuromuscular activity, seemed to be slightly diminished while performance in mental multiplication was actually increased. In general, however, we have no clear evidence that moderate overheating impairs mental efficiency. D. Influence of atmospheric humidity. Somewhat exhaustive studies of the alleged influence of atmospheric humidity upon mental achievement and comfort have yielded entirely negative results. With relative humidities of 50% and 25% respectively, all other conditions being the same, there was no significant difference in the votes of the subjects as to their subjective sensations of comfort, no difference in temperature of the air next to the chest, or in pulse rate, and no difference in the performance of a long series of complex neuromuscular tasks specifically designed to test the alleged influence of a dry atmosphere upon nervousness and efficiency. Longer periods of exposure might of course produce effects not detected by us, but it seems clear that exposure to a relative humidity as low as 25% at a temperature of 75 degrees Fahrenheit for 8 hours a day on 5 days a week does not produce any demonstrable harmful effects. E. Physical work. We have demonstrated, on the other hand, a very marked and significant influence of atmospheric temperature upon the performance of physical work. An increase of room temperature from 68 degrees Fahrenheit to 75 degrees Fahrenheit caused a decrease of 15% in the physical work performed by men who were not compelled to maximum effort but were stimulated by a cash bonus, and an increase from 68 degrees Fahrenheit to 86 degrees Fahrenheit with 80% relative humidity causes a decrease 28% in the physical work performed under conditions of maximal effort. The fall at 75 degrees Fahrenheit was most marked in the afternoon hours when fatigue effects were called into play. F. Susceptibility to disease. Finally, we have found very definite evidence of the harmful influence of moderately high atmospheric temperatures, particularly if followed by a sudden exposure to low temperatures in promoting susceptibility to bacterial infection. We find that rabbits maintained at a temperature of 86 degrees Fahrenheit show a distinctly delayed formation of hemolysins and a slightly reduced agglutinative power as compared with animals kept at 68 degrees Fahrenheit and that rabbits kept at 76 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit are then chilled to 20 to 50 degrees or chilled first and kept at 79 degrees Fahrenheit are much more susceptible to infection than animals kept at 65 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Exhaustive observations of the nasal mucosa of human subjects shows that in a warm atmosphere there is an increase, in a cool atmosphere a decrease in the swelling, moisture and redness of the nasal mucous membranes. Sudden change from a hot to a cold atmosphere, particularly when combined with draughts, produce a moist and distended but anemic condition of the mucosa, presumably highly favourable to bacterial infasion, and workers who have been habitually exposed to high temperatures show a marked excess of atropic rhinitis. Hot moist air, as in the case of laundry workers, seems to be much more harmful than hot dry air, as in the case of furnace men. 2. The effect of chemically vitiated air upon physiological state, upon comfort, and upon efficiency. In parallel with our experiments upon the effect of temperature, we also study the possible influence of air, 
chemically vitiated by human occupancy, but at the same temperature and humidity as fresh air used as a control. The factor of air movement was excluded by the use of room fans to stir up both fresh and stale air so that no difference existed save the very slight changes in oxygen and carbon dioxide and the more obvious changes in odiferous organic constituents due to respiration and effluvia from the body. A. Physiological reactions, comfort, mental efficiency, and resistance to infection. In most of the reactions studied in our experiments, the influence of chemical vitiation of the atmosphere appeared to be absolutely nil. Temperature and humidity being the same, we compared fresh air containing 5 to 11 parts per 10,000 of carbon dioxide with vitiated air containing 23 to 66 parts and found no difference in body temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, Crampton index, rate of respiration, dead space in the lungs as the doses of the blood, respiratory quotient, rate of heart production, rate of digestion, and protein metabolism. Comfort votes indicated that the subjects were quite unable to distinguish from the standpoint of sensation between the fresh and the stale air conditions. The performance of mental work was quite unaffected by the chemically vitiated atmosphere. In a special series of animal experiments, guinea pigs exposed to strong fecal odours for considerable periods failed to exhibit any increased susceptibility to inoculations with foreign bacteria or to injection of diphtheria toxin. B. Physical work. In regard to the performance of physical work, on the other hand, there appeared to be a distinctly harmful influence of the vitiated air. Temperature and humidity being the same, our subjects performed 9% less work in stale than in fresh air, a difference less marked than that produced by warm as compared with cool air, 15%, but apparently significant. When both unfavorable conditions were combined in warm and stale air, only 77% as much physical work was performed as in cool fresh air. C. Appetite and growth. Finally, we found a marked influence exerted by stale air upon the appetite for food, as determined by serving standard lunches to parallel groups of subjects in stale and fresh air, respectively, but with the same temperature and humidity. In the four different series of experiments, which were successfully completed on this basis without the intrusion of interfering factors, the excess of food consumed under fresh air conditions was respectively 4.4, 6.8, 8.6, and 13.6%. Since the probable errors involved in these experiments were relatively very slight, it seemed evident that the chemical constituents of vitiated air may not only diminish the tendency to do physical work, but also the appetite for food. This conclusion is strengthened from another direction, by demonstration that exposure to strong fecal odours causes a restraining influence upon the rate of growth of guinea pigs, during, but not after, the first week of exposure. 3. Practical Conclusions in Regard to Ideal Conditions of Ventilation The experiments of the Commission have in general confirmed the conclusion of earlier investigators that the first and foremost condition to be avoided in regulating the atmosphere of occupied rooms is an excessively high temperature. We have found that even slight overheating, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, produces the following harmful results. 1. A burden upon the heat-regulating system of the body, leading to an increased body temperature, an increased heart rate, and a marked decrease in general vasomotor tone as registered by a fall in the Crampton Index. 2. A slight but definite increase in rate of respiration. 3. A considerable decrease in the amount of physical work performed under conditions of equal incentive, a decrease amounting to 15% at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and to 28% at 86 degrees Fahrenheit. 4. A markedly abnormal reaction of the mucous membranes of the nose, leading ultimately to chronic atmospheric chronitis, and when followed by chill, producing a moist and distended condition of the membranes calculated to favour bacterial invasion. In animals exposed to high atmospheric temperatures, particularly when followed by chill, diminishes the protective power of the blood and markedly increases general susceptibility to microbic disease. For these reasons, we believe that the dangers of room overheating are far more serious in their effect upon human health and efficiency 
that has generally been realised, and that every effort should be made to keep the temperature of the schoolroom, the workroom, and the living room at 68 degrees Fahrenheit or below. With regard to the problem of relative humidity, it is obvious that a high moisture content combined with high temperature must always be harmful, since the effect of a humid atmosphere is to decrease the heat loss from the body by evaporation. The specifically harmful influence of unduly low humidity which has been postulated by various writers upon ventilation has, on the other hand, not been apparent in our investigations. Our results in regard to the influence of the chemical composition of radiated air temperature and humidity effects being excluded, have been generally negative. In two respects, however, our experiment suggests that some chemical constituents of the air of an unventilated room may be objectionable. Such air appears, one, to decrease the appetite of human subjects for food, and two, to diminish substantially the amount of physical work performed under conditions of equivalent stimulation. We may conclude, then, that the primary condition of good ventilation is the maintenance of a room temperature of 60 degrees Fahrenheit or below without the production of chilling draughts, but that it is also important on account of certain subtle but real effects of radiated air upon appetite and inclination to work, though to provide for an air change sufficient to avoid a heavy concentration of effluvia, such as was associated in our experiments with a carbon dioxide content of 23 to 66 parts per 10,000. Except in respect to humidity at moderate and low temperatures, this long quotation reinforces the conclusions set forth in this book and in World Power and Evolution. It brings out the extreme sensitiveness of human health to atmospheric conditions. It shows that temperature is undoubtedly the most important factor. It has experimental proof to the widespread opinion that as soon as the temperature rises much above 70 degrees, man's capacity and inclination for physical work decline and his susceptibility to disease increases. If high atmospheric humidity is added to high temperature, as in many tropical countries, the harmful effects are shown to be much accentuated. The fact that the Ventilation Commission detected no effect of high temperature and humidity upon mental work seems to mean merely that when people are subjected to moderately adverse conditions for short periods amounting to less than 20% of the time, for a few weeks, that physical handicaps do not become pronounced except to exert a measurable influence upon the mind. It seems only logical to suppose that if the adverse physical conditions arising from high temperature and high humidity were to continue and produce their full effect, the mental powers would ultimately suffer. Thus even this phase of the Commission's work is not inconsistent with the conclusions of this book. In the same connection, it is interesting to note that although the Commission made no experiments on the effect on variability, its report contains in several places the specific suggestion that variability may be an important but unconsidered factor. The only point wherein the Commission's conclusions radically differ from my own in respect to humidity, a subject which we shall consider in the next chapter. In spite of this discrepancy, the report of the Ventilation Commission, in its main aspects, confirms the general conclusions of this book as to the relative depressing effect of tropical climates, regardless of specific diseases, and as to the beneficial effects of relatively cool, variable climates. End of section 7。section 8 of Civilization and Climate。by Ellsworth Huntington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 8 Mortality, Moisture, and Variability. Inasmuch as there is some disagreement as to the effect of atmospheric moisture upon health, it will be well to examine the evidence carefully. On the basis of the deaths in Paris from 1904 to 1913, Besson, the chief of the service physique et meteorologique of that city, has come to the conclusion that on the whole, when the humidity increases, the mortality from diseases of the respiratory organs decreases two or three weeks later. If one examines each season separately, one finds that this rule fails only in summer when there is no clear result. 
according to a widespread opinion, humidity acts in an unfavorable manner upon human health. The result announced above cannot fail to surprise many people. One sees that an increased number of deaths from diseases of the respiratory organs is on an average preceded not by an increase but a decrease in the humidity. To test this further, Besson divided the winter months into two groups, one with a mean relative humidity below 86% and averaging 82.4, and the other above 86% averaging 89.2. He found that the deaths per week, when relatively high or low humidity prevailed, and the succeeding weeks averaged as follows. A table is displayed on the page comparing the deaths per week in low humidity and high humidity compared to the average of high over low humidity in percent of low. It seems clear that during these 10 years in Paris, the drier weeks of winter, even though they were quite moist, were accompanied by a slightly increased death rate from respiratory diseases and were followed in the next two weeks by a death rate about 3% higher than that which followed the moist weeks. Besson ascribes part of this effect to the direction of the wind, but the effect of the wind must be reduced largely through humidity and temperature. What part is played by temperature in the results for Paris is not clear. A study of my own includes temperature as well as humidity, and gives results almost identical with those of Besson. I used the deaths from pneumonia in New York City during the year beginning in April 1917, and compared them with the weather on the day of death and on the preceding day. All the days of any given temperature were divided into two equal groups on the basis of their relative humidity. Here are the results for the 7,200 deaths from lobar pneumonia, those for bronchopneumonia were somewhat similar, but much more irregular, presumably because the number of deaths was only a third as great. The table is displayed on the page. Average death per day from lobar pneumonia on same day as given weather conditions and on succeeding day. New York, April 1st, 1917 to March 31st, 1918. The obvious fact here is that at all temperatures, the moist days were better than the dry, as appears in the lower line. The same thing holds true whether we consider the deaths on the same day as the humidity or on the succeeding day. While Besson's data seem to show that dryness renders people susceptible to the initial attack of pneumonia, which results in death after a fortnight, more or less, the New York data suggests that when the disease nears its crisis, a dry day may turn the balance toward death, whereas a moist day turns it toward life. In cold weather, however, this effect is slight, for when the temperature is below 45 degrees, the moist days in the preceding table reduce the death rate by only 4.5% on an average, at the temperatures of 56 degrees to 70. On the other hand, an additional grain and a half of water vapour per cubic foot of space or a difference of roughly 20% in relative humidity, is associated with a diminution of about 80% in the death rate. This is especially important because these are the temperatures at which our houses are kept, or ought to be kept most of the year. It adds another to the bits of evidence which indicate that for respiratory diseases, a dry climate is worse than a moist one. The opposite belief has perhaps become traditional, largely because in drier climates, people live out of doors. Other things being equal, it is always more helpful to live outdoors rather than indoors. In this connection, it might be added that Besson's conclusions as to the relation of temperature to the death rate from respiratory diseases agree with mine as to the similar relation to deaths from each of the two main types of pneumonia. At temperatures between freezing and 60 degrees Fahrenheit, there is an almost perfectly regular decline in the number of deaths as the temperature rises. Then the decline becomes less and less marked until a minimum is reached at about 72 degrees. At higher temperatures, a slight increase makes itself apparent, but does not go far because there are only a few days in either Paris or New York when the mean temperature rises much above 75 degrees. Still another investigation, that of Greenberg, who studied the monthly deaths from pneumonia in New York, Boston, Newark and Providence, agrees with the two already cited as the effect of both temperature and humidity upon pneumonia. Such close agreement makes it practically certain that the humidity of the air, as well as the temperature, is an important element in determining the death rate from respiratory diseases. 
The need of certainty as to the effect of atmospheric humidity is so great that I shall sum up a number of other examples in the form of a long table which the non-scientific reader can skip. Since the effect of humidity varies according to temperature, we must carefully distinguish between temperatures above and below the optimum of 64 degrees. At the optimum temperature in every one of the groups of deaths listed in section A of this table, the best conditions of health prevailed when the relative humidity averaged 70% or more for day and night together. At higher temperatures, a relative humidity which averages above 70% for day and night together does very decided harm. At the optimum temperature, the effect of humidity seems to be at a minimum, and a humidity above 70% does little harm. A lower humidity, although somewhat harmful, has less effect than at other temperatures, the increase in the death rate ranging from 5 to 15% according to the degree of dryness. This may be one reason why the New York Ventilation Commission found no clear effect of low humidity. The main experiments were performed at temperatures close to the optimum. At temperatures below the optimum, the effect of humidity upon the death rate is very clear, much more so than at the optimum. For example, at a temperature of about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, a difference of only 10% in humidity appears to produce approximately the effect shown in section A of the following table. The table is displayed on the following page. Effect of humidity on the death rate. A. Increase in monthly death rate accompanying a decrease of 10% in relative humidity at a temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit. B. Increase in monthly death rate accompanying a decrease of 10% in relative humidity at all temperatures December, March, 1900 to 1914. C. Increase in daily death rate, accompanying a decrease of 10% in relative humidity at all temperatures during the influenza epidemic in New York City. September, December, 1918, and Boston. October, 1918, April, 1919. This table represents all the available mortality data, except those already mentioned and certain others to be given shortly. Practically all the evidence seems to point in the same direction. In 21 out of the 23 sets of data in the table, the moister days or months have an advantage over the drier. The negative figures for Boston, NOS, 22, and 23 may be accidental, or may mean that Boston's famous east winds, unlike the moist winds in most places, are really too damp. Taking the table as a whole, an increase of 10% in humidity at low temperatures is correlated with an average decrease not far from 6% in the death rate. Let us now turn to quite a different investigation. In Boston, I made a study of the number of deaths following operations performed in different kinds of weather. On the basis of about 2,300 deaths after operations from 1906 to 1915, the addition of a grain of moisture per cubic foot of space to the air within doors would have diminished the death rate as follows provided the inside air thereby acquired the qualities pertaining to the outside air moistened by nature. A table is displayed on the page. Apparent effect of one grain of water per cubic foot of air in diminishing the death rate after operations in Boston, 1906 to 1915. Because of the small number of deaths, this table is irregular, but the irregularities have little significance. At temperatures below the optimum, the death rate was higher after operations performed in damp weather, than after those performed when the air was dry. This was especially true when the moist weather continued a day or two after the operations. At high temperatures, however, the effect of humidity is not at all the same as at low, as appears in Figure 15. Figure 15 is displayed on the page, post-operative death rate in Boston in relation to humidity and temperature. Dry conditions are shown towards the left, moist towards the right. The height of the lines shows the number of deaths per day succeeding operations performed when various conditions of relative humidity prevailed at 8am. The broken lines A, B and C indicate the number of deaths in cool weather. Note that regular decline towards the right. High humidity was evidently an advantage. Now contrast the dotted lines with the solid line. A indicating the effect of humidity when the temperature at 8am was above 70 degrees. Under such conditions, far more than in cooler weather, dry air was bad. Moderately moist air with a relative humidity of 50 to 60% was better than even the moistest air at lower temperatures. 
But note how rapidly the death rate after operations performed in hot weather rises if high humidity is added to great heat. Nevertheless, the evil effects of very damp hot days in Boston do not appear to be so bad as those of very dry hot days. This study of surgical operations seems to afford strong evidence of the extreme sensitiveness of the human body to variations in humidity as well as temperature. The fact that it gives a different result at temperatures above and below the optimum tends to establish confidence, for the results at high temperature and high humidity are in perfect accord with common experience and with the experiments carried on by such organizations as the New York Ventilation Commission and the laboratory of the American Society of Heating and Ventilating Engineers at Pittsburgh. In other countries as well as in France, Italy and the United States, whence our data have thus far come. These statistics seem usually to indicate that extreme dryness is harmful to health. Other things being equal, the death rates appear generally to be higher in dry regions than in moist. For example, Lucknow and Cairo in dry climates have death rates far higher than Madras and Bombay, which are moist and tropical. Mexico City on its high, cool, but dry plateau, and Johannesburg and Madrid in somewhat similar locations have exceptionally high death rates in view of their temperature and latitude. In Mexico and India, the dry season of March, April and May has a decidedly higher death rate than the succeeding wet season. This happens in spite of the fact that the temperature in Mexico City during May averages 65 degrees and is almost ideal, while in July it averages a degree or two core and is almost equally ideal. In India, on the other hand, both the dry spring and the wet summer are hot, so that the wet season is very muggy. Yet the people have a sigh of relief when the rains come, for it brings hope of a diminution of disease, as well as of good crops. Let us turn to variability or storminess, another factor which seems to cooperate with temperature and humidity in determining the effect of climate. This factor is especially important because of its bearing on change of climate and their effective history. In World Power and Evolution, the study of climographs based on 8 million deaths in France, Italy and the United States suggests that people's sensitiveness to changes of temperature is almost directly proportional to the uniformity of their climate. For example, in San Francisco, a change of only 7 degrees in the mean monthly temperature, 50 degrees January, 57 degrees July, is associated with a change in the death rate from 16.4% above normal to 11.7% below, or about 4% for every degree of temperature. At St. Paul in Minneapolis, a change from a mean temperature of 12 degrees in January to 67 degrees in June is accompanied by a change in the death rate from 5.5% above normal to 6.9% below, or only 0.23% for each degree of temperature. In the same way, a difference of about 9 degrees Celsius between January and May in Naples is accompanied by a difference of 35.3% in the death rate whereas in Milan a difference of 16 degrees Celsius in temperature is associated with a difference of only 26.8% in the death rate. Put in another way, this means that the apparent effect of a given change of temperature is 2.3 times as great in Naples of the south as in Milan of the north, and over 17 times as great in San Francisco with its remarkably uniform climate as in St. Paul and Minneapolis with their severe winters and many storms at all seasons. In other words, where great changes of weather take place, people become hardened to them. The reality of this hardening is demonstrated again and again by the way in which northerners who move to the tropics lose their power of resistance to even the slightest change of temperature, but regain it after a few years of renewed residence in a severe climate. The relation between variability and the power to resist disease seems quite clear but as yet there seems to be no conclusive evidence as to the relative importance of variations from day to day, such as accompany storms, and of variations from season to season. The evidence which will now be set forth pertains to changes of temperature from day to day. In world power and evolution, one of the most important lines of evidence has to do with variations of temperature from one day to the next in New York City. A study of about 400,000 deaths during a period of eight years from 1877 to 1884 shows that when the temperature falls, the death rate also falls, while a rise in temperature is regularly accompanied by a corresponding rise in the death rate. This happens not only in summer, 
when one would expect it, but at all seasons, including even the winter, when one would surely suppose that warm weather would be beneficial. And so it is in the long run, but the immediate change toward warmth is temporarily harmful. In this investigation, instead of applying the absolute number of deaths, as in previous cases, the change in the number of deaths from one day to the next has been used. This is done partially in order that the greater frequency of days with abrupt changes of temperature in winter than in summer may not confuse our results. It is likewise because in dealing with changes of temperature, the natural question is whether such changes have any effect in changing the death rate. The upper part of figure 16 illustrates another investigation of the same kind in respect to daily deaths from pneumonia in New York. The left-hand side of the diagram indicates the conditions which prevail when the mean temperature of the day of death is higher than that of the preceding day, while the right-hand side indicates that the temperature has fallen. The two solid lines indicate the summer relationships from April to September, A being lobar pneumonia and B bronchopneumonia. The dotted lines show winter conditions, C lobar and D bronchopneumonia. The significant points about these four curves are as follows. 1. They are all essentially alike. This suggests that they all conform to the same definite physiological law. Figure 16 is displayed on the page, relation between deaths from pneumonia and influenza and interdunal changes of temperature. 2. Every one of them is low at the two ends and high in the middle. This seems to indicate that under normal conditions, such as prevailed in the year ending in March 1918, Patients suffering from either form of pneumonia are less likely to die on days when there has been a marked change of temperature in either direction than on days when there is little or no change. This conclusion applies to both summer and winter, but is more true in summer than winter. Hence, for pneumonia patients, a variable climate seems better than one that is uniform. The agreement of the curves with our conclusions derived from factory work and with those of Campani in Italy is noteworthy. 3. A drop of temperature, on an average, is decidedly more effective than a rise in lowering the death rate. This again agrees with the results of our factory investigation. The lower part of figure 16 shows the results of a similar investigation of the influenza epidemic in the latter part of 1918. Because of the enormous variations in the death rate, I have here used the percentage rather than the actual number of deaths by which each day's death toll differed from that of the preceding day. Both New York, Southern Lines, and Boston, Dotted Lines, have been included. The investigation has been broadened to include 1. The number of cases in which influenza A and pneumonia B attacked a patient, or at least in the case of Boston, were reported to have done so, and 2. The number of deaths from influenza C and pneumonia D. The significant points in figure 16 are as follows. 1. All the lines except that for deaths from pneumonia in Boston, C, slope in the same way, thus indicating that a rise of temperature is worse than no change, and that a fall is much better than either. This disagrees with the preceding investigation of normal pneumonia, but that may be simply because the lower part of figure 16 includes only the winter months, and not those of the spring, when the advent of warm days would be beneficial. The average changes in the rates for all the conditions shown in the lower part of figure 16 amount to an increase of 14.1% in the deaths and illnesses on days with a strong rise of temperature and 3.4% of days with little or no change, whereas on days with a strong drop of temperature, the change takes the form of a drop of 18.4%. This means that for all the days when the temperature was markedly different from that preceding days, no matter whether it was higher or lower, there was an average drop of 2.2% in the rates of disease and death against the rise of 3.4% on the days of comparatively uniform weather. In other words, here, just as in normal pneumonia, the variable weather had an advantage over the uniform weather. This conclusion is quite contradictory to the usual ideas, but it is supported by many other bits of evidence. One such bit is found in the following data as to the average number of deaths per day in Boston hospitals after surgical operations when specified changes of temperature took place between the day of an operation and the succeeding day. Small table displayed on the page comparing the interdiurnal change of temperature to 
the daily deaths December to February, and the daily deaths between March to November. The first column suggests that in winter the changes of temperature are too severe in Boston, so that days with only a little change have an advantage of about 4% over the days with a violent change. From March to November, however, the conditions are quite different. Operations performed on days with the smallest changes are followed by 41% more deaths than are those performed when the temperature changed most strongly from the day of the operation to the next day. Thus, for the year as a whole, the variable weather displays a distinct advantage just as in New York. The net result of our studies thus far is the conclusion that temperature, humidity, and variability all play important parts in determining variations in health and mortality from day to day, month to month, season to season, and year to year. For each climatic factor, there appears to be a distinct, optimum, or most favourable condition, but this varies considerably in response to differences in the other factors. Thus the optimum temperature in dry weather is not the same as in wet, and presumably is not the same in variable weather as in that which is uniform. The high level of the optimum temperature which we found in California may possibly be due, in part, to the uniformity of the weather. Again, a degree of humidity, which is highly favourable at a temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, may work severe harm at 80 degrees, just as a degree of variability, which is highly beneficial in warm weather, may be too extreme in the midst of a cold winter. In the rest of this chapter, I shall describe certain investigations in which the three climatic factors of temperature, humidity, and variability are analysed in reference to the influenza epidemic in 1918. The investigation of influenza was carried out by a committee on the atmosphere and man, appointed by the National Research Council of the United States. A mathematical method known as partial correlation coefficients was employed. This method has a remarkable quality of picking out and isolating the effect of any one among a number of factors, as in an experiment. In the present case, the committee had set itself the completion, or at least the extension, of a task already begun by Professor Pearl of John Hopkins University. The task was to ascertain whether any environmental conditions were responsible for the great differences in the mortality of the influenza epidemic of 1918 from one city to another. During the ten weeks of the main epidemic, Philadelphia, for example, had a death rate from influenza and the resultant pneumonia four times as great as that of Milwaukee, while the death rate of Pittsburgh was twice as great as in the neighbouring and similar city of Cleveland. Before the committee's investigation was finished, the following 22 factors had been examined. A. Factors of Human Environment Demography 1. Age proportion of inhabitants of various ages 2. Sex number of females per 100 males 3. Density of the population persons per acre within city 4. Rate of growth from 1900 to 1910 B. Factors of geographical position 5. Distance from Boston, where the epidemic began. 6. Longitude. 7. Latitude. C. Physiological factors. Normal death rates in 1915, 1916 and 1917 from 8. All cases. 9. Pulmonary tuberculosis. 10. Organic diseases of the heart. 11. Nephritis and acute Bright's disease. 12. Typhoid fever. 13. Cancer and other malignant tumours. D. Radical factors. 14. Percentage of Negroes, 1920. 15. Percentage of foreign-born, 1920. E. Industrial factor. 16. Percentage of population engaged in manufacturing, 1919. F. Climatic factors. 17. Mean temperature for day and night. 18. Change of mean temperature from one day to the next. 19. Absolute humidity. Weight of water vapour per cubic foot of space. 20. Relative humidity, or percentage of possible water vapour. 21. Weather, a combination of NOS, 17 and 20. 22. Climatic energy, as defined in this book. Directly or indirectly, these 22 factors embrace most of the conditions which may have been effective in causing people's power resistance to the epidemic to vary from city to city. Sanitation and medical practice fail to appear in the list because their degree of excellence cannot easily be expressed in figures. 
but the death rate from typhoid fever is generally supposed to be an unusually good measure of sanitary efficiency. While other death rates are, in most places, a fairly good index of the excellence of the medical service, almost the only important field which the factors do not cover is that of variations in the disease-bringing bacteria, so far as such variations are due to causes not included in our table. When all these various factors are investigated by means of the most exact and delicate mathematical method yet known, the only one which shows any conclusive casual relation to the destructiveness of this particular epidemic is the weather. In the work which ultimately led to this conclusion, the Committee on the Atmosphere in Man took the death rate from influenza and pneumonia during the ten weeks succeeding the outbreak of the epidemic in each of the 36 large cities in the United States. These ten weeks cover the first, and in most places, much the more important outbreak. The committee also obtained data as to the temperature, relative humidity, absolute humidity, and change of temperature from one day to the next. The weather data were tabulated for periods of 10 days, beginning 70 days before the onset of the epidemic, and continuing 50 days thereafter. Previous to the 30th day before the epidemic, there is evidence of no real relationship between any weather condition and the destructiveness of the influenza. During the 30 days just before the onset of the epidemic, however, the temperature and especially the absolute are distinguished from the relative humidity show a distinct relation to the succeeding death rate. This means that if the weather was warm during the month before the influenza reached a city, the death rate was high. If the amount of moisture in the air was great, the conditions were still worse. At Boston, for example, from the 20th to the 11th day before the epidemic, the temperature was higher than during the corresponding period in any other cities except New Orleans, New York, and Los Angeles. This was natural, for the epidemic broke out in Boston earlier than elsewhere. In places like St. Paul, Toledo, and Grand Rapids, the cool and fairly dry autumn weather, which prevailed for a month before the epidemic apparently, gave people a certain degree of stored-up vigour which stood them in good stead and lessened the ravages of the disease. If the temperature was variable, as in Cleveland, Columbus, and Richmond, and especially if it fell during the ten days after the onset of the epidemic, the death rate was lower than where the contrary conditions prevailed. On the other hand, high relative humidity during the ten days before the onset was associated with a relatively high death rate. Cambridge, New Haven, and New Orleans suffered most in this respect. The dampness perhaps made it easy for the bacteria to be transmitted. Droplets of water in the air may act as carriers of the bacteria, or may preserve their virility. From the 10th to the 30th days after the onset of the epidemic, the virulence of the bacteria was apparently so great that the state of the weather made no difference in the death rate. At any rate, there is no evidence that the immediate weather conditions had any effect in overcoming the sudden and sweeping character of the infection. After the 30th day, however, there came another change, and the apparent effects of temperature and absolute humidity again rose high. This was a time when in most places the disease reached its maximum and began to decline. At that time, cool and moderately dry weather once more was associated with a low death rate. This does not necessarily mean that cold weather is favourable at the time of an epidemic. In fact, quite the contrary may be the case, for very low temperature may be as bad as high. Labrador suffered greatly in the epidemics of 1918. Having reached the conclusion that atmospheric conditions influenced the severity of the epidemic, the next step was to find a numerical expression for the weather by combining the temperature, humidity, and variability according to their apparent importance. When this has been done, the method of partial correlations was used to compare the weather with the severity of the epidemic and with all other factors which showed any sign of being important, namely, deaths from tuberculosis, deaths from all causes, deaths from heart disease, and climatic energy. The weather proved to be the only one whose correlation coefficient was more than four times the probable error, and hence large enough to be significant. The final partial correlation coefficient when the four other factors named above were held constant, that the elimination amounts to 0 0.57. This is 7.6 times a probable error, which means that there is only one chance in hundreds of millions that we are being misled by accidental agreements between the weather and the death rate. 
Thus, to quote the report of the committee, the statistical fact is clear. The weather which means primarily the weather just before the onset of the epidemic, or at or just after the climax, is the one factor thus far investigated which shows a clear, pronounced and persistent relation to the destructiveness of the epidemic. This does not mean that the weather was in any sense a cause of the epidemic. It is even possible that the weather may be related to the epidemic only indirectly, as is the case with the death rate from heart disease, although no factor capable of producing this result has yet been suggested. Even if the weather is a casual factor in producing variations in the virulence of the epidemic, there is no reason to think that it is the only factor. If the degree of relationship between two variables is proportional to the square of the correlation coefficient, as is sometimes held, the weather, even if it is a direct agent, may be responsible for no more than a third of the variations from city to city. Nor do our high correlation coefficients mean that the weather had anything to do with setting the date of the epidemic or with determining the severity of the 1918 epidemic compared with other epidemics. Neither do they prove anything as to the effect of the weather in other countries, although elsewhere a relationship similar to that found in the United States seems probable. For instance, the British government estimates that in India the death rate from the epidemic was about six times as great as in the United States, while scanty reports from other tropical countries indicate a similar excessive mortality. The one thing which seems clear from the present investigation is that the weather is the one factor whose apparent relationship to the epidemic is not seriously reduced or modified when other conditions are held constant. The results of this investigation should be qualified in still another respect. It is not necessary to suppose that other epidemics will show exactly the same relationship as the epidemic of 1918, even though they may be strongly influenced by the weather. In the first place, the epidemic of 1918 was so peculiar in its virulence, its rapid dissemination, its fatality for persons in the prime of life, and in other respects, that it may well have been peculiar in its climatic relationships. In the second place, the epidemic occurred at a season when the approach of cold weather normally exerts a strong stimulating effect in the United States. It is well known that from August to October, or even November, the death rate normally declines. The epidemic seems to have reflected this condition, just so far as the weather approaches the conditions which prevail at a time when the autumn mortality is lowest. The ravages of the epidemic were checked. At some other colder season, relatively low temperature and low humidity might be as harmful as high temperature and high humidity appear to have been in September, October and November 1918. As a matter of fact, the epidemic of February and March 1919 shows only a small positive correlation between the monthly death rate and the temperature. Other conditions, perhaps other conditions of weather, were then dominant, or possibly some cities were too cold while others were too warm a condition which would make the use of correlation coefficients impracticable. Finally, even if the weather should prove to be an important factor in causing variations in the virulence of influenza, we still have little evidence as to how its effects are produced. Presumably, the weather gives to the human being more or less power of resistance to disease, but it is not improbable that the weather also has an important effect upon the vigour, reproductive rate, or transmission of the disease bringing bacteria. End of section 8. Section 9 of Civilization and Climate by Ellsworth Huntington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 10 Health and Weather. This chapter deals with two investigations of the relation between health and the weather. They seem to me the most conclusive evidence yet available along this line, because the various weather elements are more clearly separated than in most cases, and because there is no danger of confusing the effects of different seasons. The first investigation pertains to the weather day by day. It is by far the most extensive which daily data have been employed. It presents a cooperative effort carried on by the Committee on the Atmosphere and Man of the National Research Council of the United States and the Metropolitan and New York Life Insurance Companies. 
In addition to the author, those most closely concerned in planning the work were Dr. J. Arthur Harris, of the Carnegie Institution's laboratory at Cold Spring Harbor, and Dr. L. I. Dublin, of the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. But many suggestions were received from others. The results appear to be fairly conclusive as to main temperature and changes of temperature, but are inconclusive as to relative humidity. In order to obtain an adequate series of daily mortality data, the committee was obliged to go back to the years 1882 to 1888 in New York City. At that time, and for a few years previous, the actual day of death was recorded, and the facts were summarized by days and published in the annual reports of the New York Board of Health. This highly valuable record has not since been equaled, either in New York or elsewhere, so far as I am aware. The committee used three sorts of mortality data. 1. Deaths of children under 5 years of age. 2. Deaths of persons over 5 years of age. 3. Deaths from pneumonia. In order to avoid errors due to the growth of population and the improvement in medical practice, each year was treated as a separate unit, and each category of deaths was reduced to percentages of the average number of deaths per day in that particular year. For the phase of the investigation here under discussion, the method of partial correlation and coefficients was employed. For the layman, it may be well to repeat that by this method, the effects of different factors can be separated as in an experiment. In order to avoid periods when the temperature is sometimes above and sometimes below the optimum, the months of December to March were chosen. This is also advisable because the effect of the various climatic elements in winter is less understood than their effect in summer. One aim of the work was to eliminate the effect of the seasons and determine whether a mere departure of the weather elements from the normal for any special month has any effect. Accordingly, in preparing the data for the correlation, coefficients each month was treated as a separate unit, and the departures of all kinds were reckoned from the averages for December, January, and so forth. This made it possible to ascertain, almost beyond question, that the weather day by day causes small variations in health which are superposed upon the large seasonal variations. The committee used three elements of the weather. 1. The mean daily temperature. 2. The interdurinal change of mean temperature from one day to the next. And 3. The mean daily relative humidity. In nature, the effects of these three elements are inextricably mixed, but the method of partial correlation sorts them out. The results of this sorting appear in figure 17, the day marks zero is a day on which a given condition of weather occurs. The weather elements on each such day have been compared with the deaths on that day, and on each of the 14 succeeding days. Figure 17 is displayed on the previous page. Correlation between weather elements and daily deaths in New York City, December to March, 1882-1886. to The lengths of the bars in figure 17 indicate the size of the partial correlation and coefficients. The three diagrams on the left show the relation between mean temperature and the deaths in our three categories when the interdurinal change of temperature and the relative humidity are held constant and thus eliminated. The three central diagrams show similar coefficients for change of temperature when mean temperature and relative humidity are held constant, while the right-hand set apply to relative humidity when mean temperature and changes of temperature are held constant. When the bars of figure 17 lie above the central line, the coefficients are positive. That is, a high condition of the weather, such as high humidity or high temperature, is associated with a high death rate. Where the bars are below the central line, the reverse is the case. High temperature, for example, being associated with few deaths. But note that in studying changes of temperature, our purpose is not to discover the effect of a small change compared with that of a large change, regardless of whether the temperature rises or falls. It is to discover whether the effects of a rise and of a fall are the same or different. Accordingly, the average condition has been counted as that in which there is no change of temperature from one day to the next. A rise of temperature has been given a plus sign, and a fall a negative sign. Hence, in the central column of figure 17, a bar above the line means that a high death rate is associated with a rise in temperature while the bar below the line means that the death rate is high when the temperature falls. 
The degree of significance of the bars in figure 17 may be judged from the shading. Where the bars are lightly shaded, their length is less than three times the probable error. This means that they have little or no significance. When the light shading reaches its greatest length, that is, when the coefficient is three times the probable error, there is one chance in 22 that a bar of this length would be produced accidentally, even our two sets of figures have no real relation. Suppose for a moment that the death rate and the relative humidity have no real relationship. Nevertheless, with figures the size of those here used, we should accidentally get a correlation of 0 0.075, three times the probable error, once in every 22 correlations. The three diagrams on the right of figure 17 depict 45 correlation coefficients. Hence, mere chance would be likely to give us two that rise as high as 0 0.075. What we actually find is two which rise a little above that level. The areas marked by diagonals indicate values between three and four times the probable error. Now, the likelihood that a coefficient of any particular size will be produced accidentally decreases very rapidly as the coefficients become larger. Thus, while there is one chance in 22 that a coefficient will be three times the probable error, there is only one chance in 142 that it will be four times the probable error. Among the 90 coefficients in the first and second columns of figure 17, mere chance would not be likely to give more than one coefficient rising to the outer limit of the diagonals, but as a matter of fact, we have 11. If the coefficient is five times a probable error, there is only one chance in 1,341 that it is due to accident, not to a real relationship. If six times, only one in 19,307, 427,000. 8. 14 million 700,000. For all practical purposes, a coefficient 8 times a probable error gives full certainty of a relationship of some sort. In general, we may say that in figure 17 or any similar diagram, the conditions that suggest a relationship are 1. Coefficients more than 3 times a probable error. 2. A considerable series of coefficients all having the same sign and hence all falling either above or below the central line. 3. A series of coefficients which systematically change from high values to low, or from positive to negative, or vice versa. The conditions which are generally agreed to amount to practical proof of a relationship are 1. Individual coefficients which rise to at least 6 times the probable error. 2. Several successive coefficients rising to at least 4 times the probable error. 3. A considerable series of coefficients which systematically and persistently change their values in some orderly sequence such as from three or four times the probable error on the plus side to an equal value on the negative side. All three types are represented in figure 17. We are now ready to interpret that figure. Bear in mind that the length of the columns indicates the degree of relationship between deaths and weather elements, and has nothing to do with the actual number of deaths. Remember also that when we speak of temperature in what follows, we mean temperature after the effects of relative humidity and interdernal change of temperature have been eliminated by means of partial correlations. In similar fashion, relative humidity and changes of temperature mean those two factors individually after the other two have been eliminated. To begin in the upper left-hand corner, the position of the bar for day zero above the central line in diagram A indicates that during the 726 days from December to March in the six years under discussion, High temperature, on any particular day, tended to be accompanied by a large number of deaths of children under five years of age on that same day. The small size of the bar, however, indicates that this relationship is too small to be considered seriously. On the other hand, the temperature on any given day had a pronounced relation to the deaths during the next three days, as appears in the heavy black shading of days one to three. High temperature was systematically followed by a low death rate, and low temperature by a high death rate. Inasmuch as we are dealing with only a single day's weather, and inasmuch as the largest coefficient, negative 0 0.167, is seven times the probable error, the total effect of the mean temperature for all days on the deaths among children must be great. On the fourth day after a given temperature, however, it has practically disappeared. 
Diagram B suggests that the reaction of older persons to the outside temperature is similar to that of little children. Curiously enough, however, on the day when a given temperature occurs, the effect is stronger than among the children, while on succeeding days the opposite effect is weaker and is somewhat more delayed. Probably the immediate harmful effect of high winter temperature arises from the fact that when the outer air is unusually warm for the season, our houses are likely to be kept too warm, especially on the first day of such warmth. On the other hand, when unusually cold days arrive, many houses which have been too warm become cooler, and that is helpful, but soon the fires are pushed and the old condition of hot, stuffy rooms returns. In diagram C, showing the relationship between the mean temperature and the deaths from pneumonia. The most important feature is the fairly regular decline from a moderately high level on the left to a low level on the right. This apparently means that temperatures which are high for the season tend to cause death among pneumonia patients, but have a good effect in preventing other people from contracting the disease, so that death rate from pneumonia falls off after about two weeks. Further comment on these first three diagrams is unnecessary. They confirm the results obtained in other ways, and show that the temperature of even a single day plays an appreciable and measurable part in determining the general health of the community. Look now at the middle column of figure 17. This depicts the relationship between the death rate and the change of temperature from one day to the next when the mean temperature and the relative humidity are both eliminated by means of particular correlations. Among children less than five years old, as appears at the top, a rise of temperature tends strongly to cause many deaths on the day when it occurs and on the succeeding day, while the drop acts in the opposite fashion. So strong is this effect that the largest particular correlation coefficient, 0.202, is 8.4 times the probable error. As much as there is scarcely one chance in 100 million that so large a coefficient should be accidentally obtained, we may be practically certain that changes of temperature from one day to the next, regardless of the mean temperature, exerts an important effect upon the health of young children. The suddenness with which this effect comes to an end is noteworthy. The portion of diagram D from the third to the fourteenth day is typical of the coefficients obtained when there is no relationship between the two sets of phenomena. Diagram E indicates that among older people, changes of temperature from day to day have almost the same effect as among children, a rise being harmful and a drop beneficial. In this case, however, the relationship is not so marked as among the children. The delay is greater and there is a reaction on the fifth day. Thus the harm done by a rise of temperature, or the good done by a fall, is partially neutralised by effects of the opposite kind a few days later. But the neutralisation is only partial, as appears from the greater size of the shaded areas above than below the zero line. Pneumonia patients, diagram F, present another case where effects of opposite types occur at different times. People suffering from this disease are probably harmed somewhat by a rise of temperature, on the very day when it happens, and are similarly helped by a fall, but these effects are too slight to be significant. Two days after a given change of temperature, on the contrary, the pneumonia patients show a distinct benefit if the change has been toward warmer conditions. They are harmed by a change in the opposite direction. This occurs regardless of whether the actual mean temperature is high or low, for that factor has been eliminated by our partial correlations as has relative humidity. The changes themselves appear to be the effective agent. But how about the relatively high positive correlation of the 11th day in diagram F? There is about one chance in 150 that this is due to accident, whereas there is only one in about 50,000 that the larger coefficient of the second day is accidental. Nevertheless, the positive correlation on the 11th day may be significant. If so, it presumably means that a rise of temperature is accompanied by conditions favourable to the development of pneumonia, so that an unusually large number of people die about 11 days afterward. Here again we appear to have a curious contradiction between the effect of relatively high temperature and of the change towards such a temperature. This contrast appears so constantly and consistently that its reality can scarcely be doubted. One of the clearest and most convincing features of this investigation of daily changes of temperature is its unequivocal character. In all three diagrams, 
D, E, and F, the high coefficients are either higher or more numerous than in the corresponding diagrams of mean temperature. A, B, and C. This agrees with several other lines of evidence, such as the sensitiveness of people in monotonous climates, in suggesting that variability of temperature, not only from season to season, but from day to day, may be almost as important as the mean temperature itself. Such slight evidence is as yet available also suggests that variability in other respects, such as sunshine, rainfall, moisture, and wind, may have an appreciable effect upon health. The emphasis thus given to variability as a distinct factor, apart from the conditions which vary, is of much significance in connection with changes of climate and the relation of climate to the distribution of civilization. It confirms the conclusions derived from our study of factories, general death rates, influenza, pneumonia, and operations, and is itself confirmed by strong evidence which is yet to come. Turning now to relative humidity, we find that diagram G is completely negative. During the years in question, the relative humidity of the air had no appreciable effect upon the health of children under five years old in New York. This is true even when the effects of mean temperature and changes of temperature are eliminated. Among older people, diagram H, the same is true so far as any immediate effect is concerned. For days 0 to 6 have a regular and significant coefficients. From the 6th to the 14th day, after any given condition of relative humidity, however, there is a slight but persistent positive correlation every day. On two days, this rises to almost four times a probable error. This suggests that in winter, high humidity may possibly be favourable to the contraction of diseases from which people die a week or two later. A similar suggestion in respect to influenza has already been discussed. The pneumonia diagram, one, however, has a different aspect. None of its coefficients are large enough to be significant, but the fact that the first seven are all positive gives a hint that high relative humidity may have a slightly unfavorable effect upon pneumonia patients. It is most perplexing to find that different sets of data give different indications as to the relation between atmospheric humidity and health. The present investigation, with its almost negative results, but with a slight suggestion that damp air facilitates the transmission of harmful microorganisms, agrees with the experiments of the New York Ventilation Commission, and with the results obtained by the Committee of the Atmosphere and Man in its work on influenza. Opposed to this are the results of what seem to be equally reliable investigations pertaining to deaths after operations, to the death rate from pneumonia by months as is set forth by Greenberg, to Besson's inquiry into the weekly death rate in Paris, and to the monthly death rate where millions of people were studied as described in World Power and Evolution. Moreover, a new investigation, shortly to be described, points even more strongly toward atmospheric humidity as an important agent in promoting health. A possible explanation of this apparent contradiction may be that humidity affects people in two ways directly through the skin, nerves and lungs, and indirectly through minute organisms that bear disease. The disease-bearing organisms, being very short-lived, are quickly influenced by variations in atmospheric moisture. Hence a day or two of unusually high relative humidity may be enough to give them an opportunity to produce disease. Man, on the other hand, may be influenced more slowly so that the beneficial effect of moisture upon him becomes apparent only when he is subjected to moderately moist conditions for some time. Thus, relatively long oscillations in health may arise from the effect of atmospheric moisture upon man, and short oscillations through the effect upon the bringers of disease, and the two may easily be of opposite character. We now come to what seems to be a most conclusive study as to the general effect of the weather upon health. In order to gain a comprehensive view of the variations in this effect from place to place, and likewise from season to season, I have made a fresh investigation of the deaths each month from 1900 to 1915 in 33 cities of the United States. Every city with over 100,000 population in 1910 has been used so far as mortality data are available. Each city in each month of the year has been treated as a separate unit. The Januarys, Februarys, and so on been divided into two equal groups on the basis of each of the following climatic factors. 1. Mean daily temperature. 2. Mean daily relative humidity. Average of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. 3. Variability or storminess. 
number of storms whose centres pass within 200 miles of the given city, allowing double weight to those within 100 miles. 4. Wind. Total number of miles per month. Five cities only. Data for the wind were investigated only in New York, Baltimore, Chicago, St. Louis, and San Francisco. The Chicago data are doubtful because the growth of the city appears gradually to have cut off the wind from the Weather Bureau station and caused an apparent decline in windiness. An example will show how the data were used. The eight warmest Januarys in New York average 6.0 Fahrenheit, warmer than the eight is coldest, and had fewer deaths by 0.6%. In February, the excessive temperature in the eight warmest months amounted to 6.5 degrees, and the death rate was 4.1% less than that of the cooler months. In March, the corresponding figures were 6.4 degrees and 9.7%. In April, 3.8 degrees and 4.5%. In May, on the contrary, an excess of 3.5 degrees in temperature was accompanied by a death rate 1.5% greater in the warm months than the cool months. While in July, although the eight warm months averaged only 2.8 degrees above the eight cooler months, the excess in their death rates rose to 14.2%. The use of this method brings out many interesting facts on which we cannot now dwell. It eliminates entirely all complications due to the seasons. For each month stands by itself and can be compared with any other month. It likewise shows nothing as to the general effect of the seasonal variations of either weather or mortality. It merely shows how the departures of any particular climatic factor from the normal of that particular month affect the death rate. Boston, for example, is thus found to be benefited in summer by the coolness of its damp east winds. Dampness without coolness is the bane of New Haven in summer. New York, by reason partly of its great size and partly of its fine climate, is unusually regular in its responses to the weather. But for some unexplained and possibly accidental reason, is averse to storms in midsummer as well as in midwinter. Although Baltimore is hot in summer, it suffers little harm from humidity even when that factor runs high. Baltimore is likewise benefited at all seasons if it has more than its usual allowance of storms. While Boston, being far north, normally has so many storms that it is better off during the less stormy months except in summer. Chicago, on the other hand, is benefited by storms except during the coldest months. It is likewise benefited by high relative humidity except in the autumn, but curiously enough, it is not benefited by high temperature in winter, perhaps because the warm months experience dry southwest winds, bare ground and dust. Figure 18a is displayed on the previous page. Excess or deficiency of death rates in months of extreme weather in American cities, 1900 to 1915. Figure 18b is displayed on the previous page. Excess or deficiency of death rates in months of extreme weather in American cities, 1900 to 1915. Somewhat the same is true in Pittsburgh and Denver. Cleveland and San Francisco have climates of such a type that departures from the normal produce relatively little effect, whereas in cities like St. Paul and Minneapolis in the north and St. Louis and Cincinnati farther south, the effects are much greater. In southerly places like Nashville and Memphis, the effect of departures from the normal weather is especially great. Presumably it is still greater in the far south, but Atlanta is the only other southern city for which data are available. In figure 18, A and B, the 33 cities have been combined into geographical groups. Each city is weighed according to its population as follows. 100,000 to 200,000 equals 1 to 200,000, 2 400,000 equals 2 to 400,000, 2 1 million equals 3, 100,000 to 200,000 equals 1, 200,000 to 400,000 equals 2, 400,000 to 1 million equals 3, 1 million to 2 million equals 4, over 2 million equals 5. The curved lines indicate the extent to which the death rates in the 8 warmer, moister or stormier Januarys, Februarys and so forth, from 1900 to 1915, differed from the corresponding death rates in the 8 cooler, drier and the stormy Januarys in older months. The figures in the scales beside the diagrams indicate departures in percentage of the normals. The normals are the estimated numbers of deaths that each place would have experienced per month 
in any given year if the number of deaths change regularly in response to the growth of the city and the improvements in medical practice without regard to weather seasons epidemics and so forth the method of getting the normals is explained in world power and evolution in figure eighteen and the other figures of the same kind all the curves have been smoothed by the formula a plus two b plus c over four equals b which is a common way of eliminating the confusing minor irregularities which arise because of the small number of years for which data are available in the figure the heavily shaded areas mean that the months with relatively high temperature high humidity high storminess or high winds had lower death rates than the months in which the weather factors stood lower for example new york philadelphia and new haven form a group of cities lying within a distance of about 150 miles and having similar climates in spite of individual idiosyncrasies in the first column of figure 18 Diagram B shows that in these cities the months of January, February, and especially March are too cold. For in each month the death rate in the eight warmest years was from 3 to 5% lower than in the eight coldest, as appears from the dark shading. In April the average temperature was about right, for the curve crosses the zero line. In that month the bad effect produced by weather that is a little too cool is balanced by the corresponding effect of high temperature during the same month. As summer advances, the warm months begin to have a disadvantage, as is indicated by the dotted shading. The eight warmer Julys had an average death rate about 6% greater than that of the cooler Julys, even in the smooth curve. In the unsmooth curve, this rises to 10.4. Inasmuch as the eight warmest Julys averaged only about 3 degrees warmer than the coolest eight, each degree of excessive temperature raised the death rate more than 3%. In passing on to the second column of figure 18, it appears that high relative humidity is beneficial to New York and its neighbours throughout the winter, and especially in April when an excess of 6% in relative humidity is accompanied by a diminution of 6% in the death rate. During the three summer months, the highest humidities do harm, the smooth maximum excess of deaths being 4%, while the unsmooth figures are 5.8% accompanying an excess of 6.4% in the relative humidity. The duration of the period when humidity is harmful is short. During the autumn and early winter, the nearness of the curve to the zero line indicates that it makes little difference whether those months are relatively dry or moist, perhaps because the general conditions of health are so good that people can resist extremes which might harm them at less favourable seasons. Nevertheless, the damper rather than the dry months were the best. In the third column of figure 18, the storms of the New York group of cities appear to have less influence than either the temperature or the humidity. In the late winter and spring, the more stormy months were the most healthful. In summer, the less stormy ones had a very slight advantage, too small to be significant. The autumn again was like the late winter, while November and December were like June and July. This particular curve happens to be one where the effect of storms is at a minimum. The most important thing about it is that the dark shading is much more extensive than the light, which means that on the whole the stormiest months were times of better health than those that were less stormy. In the right-hand column of figure 18, where the effect of the wind is shown, the upper diagram is based only on New York. It is very symmetrical and indicates that in winter high winds are accompanied by a high death rate, while in summer they are accompanied by a low death rate. The question at once arises whether the four types of curves in figure 18 really represent the effect of the individual climatic factors or whether each curve is compounded of the effects of all four factors. For example, are high winds really favourable in summer or do they merely appear to be so because they are accompanied by low temperature or low humidity or some other favourable condition? The answer is found in figure 19. The solid curves there are the same as those which we have just been examining for the New York group of cities in figure 18, but are plotted on a larger vertical scale. The dotted lines are the same curves corrected to allow for the other climatic factors. In making the corrections, it was assumed that temperature is the most important climatic factor, and is followed by humidity, storms, and wind in this order, for this is what is commonly supposed, 
and is supported by the investigation here described. Figure 19 is displayed on the page, correction for effect of other climatic factors. The method of making the corrections were as follows. Knowing how much the temperature and the death rate in the moister months differed from those in the drier months, it was easy to determine how much effect a given difference of temperature produces. Since we know the difference in temperature between the moister and drier months, it is possible to make allowance for this difference month by month and thereby eliminate from the humidity curve the effect of temperature. When the humidity curve had thus been corrected, the storm curve was corrected in the same way, on the basis not only of the temperature curve, but of the corrected humidity curve. Next, the humidity curve was corrected to allow for the effect of storms, and the temperature curve to allow for the effect of both storms and humidity. Finally, the wind curve was corrected to allow for variations in all three of the other factors. The result was the dotted lines in figure 19. At the top of the diagram, the corrected and uncorrected lines showing the effective temperature upon the death rates are practically alike. The next pair of lines, those for humidity, are almost alike, but allowances for the other factors seem slightly to reduce the importance of humidity in the spring and raise it in summer. In the third pair of lines, the corrections seem to lower the general level a trifle, thus making it appear that storms are a bit more beneficial than appeared at first sight. Finally, the corrected and uncorrected curves for the winds are completely different. The good effect in summer has practically disappeared in the corrected curve. If the data for the wind had been available from New Haven and Philadelphia, as well as New York, the smoothing of the wind curve might possibly have been still more complete. As things now stand, the corrections seem to indicate that in figure 18, in spite of minor details due to other factors, the apparent effects of temperature Humidity and storms represent approximately the real effects, and would represent them still more closely if a larger number of cities were averaged together, as will be done in Figure 20. As for the wind, it may be that high winds in winter have some direct effect in raising the death rate, but in summer practically all of their effect appears to arise from the conditions of temperature, humidity and storms, of variability which accompany them. Let us return now to figure 18. In the left-hand column, the groups of cities east of the Mississippi behave almost as one would expect. Except for Rochester and Buffalo, D, which appear to be practically never too hot, all the diagrams are heavily shaded in winter and lightly shaded in summer, thus indicating that the winters from Tennessee and northern Georgia to Minneapolis and Boston are too cold and the summers too hot for the best health. In the centre of this area, to be sure, Group E, Cleveland, Toledo and Detroit, Group F, Pittsburgh, Columbus, Indianapolis, and Group G, Atlanta, Nashville and Memphis, show a curious depression in summer, as if the harmful effect of hot weather was somehow inhibited, perhaps because the hot winds are dry, so that the bad effects of high humidity are mitigated when the temperature rises. West of the Mississippi, all the groups... K2N suggests that while hot summer weather is generally bad except on the cool Pacific coast, unusually warm winter weather is also often harmful. This is presumably because warm months are generally dry, and our monthly data seem to show that dryness is almost always harmful in cold weather. That this last statement is true seems to be abundantly verified by the second column in figure 18. Here there is no such equal distribution of heavy and light shading as in the diagrams showing the effect of temperature. On the contrary, almost every individual diagram displays a greater area of heavy shading than of light, and some of the diagrams, such as C, G and K, have practically no light shading. In general, the amount of heavy shading, that is, the good effect of atmospheric moisture, increases as one goes from the moister and cooler parts of the country to those that are warmer and drier. It reaches a maximum in diagram L for Denver and Spokane, the two cities in a list where the atmospheric moisture is least. This clearly means that in practically all parts of the United States, so far as data are available, and especially in the drier parts, the health of the inhabitants would be materially improved if there were more atmospheric moisture. This clear-cut and apparently 
unequivocal result agrees with the study of death set forth in world power and evolution and with the study of the death rate after operations the contrast between these three lines of evidence on the other hand and the results of our investigation of daily deaths in new york together with the work of the ventilation commission on the other is a reason for our suggestion that humidity has two diverse and opposite effects it seems to be beneficial in its direct effect except at temperatures above the optimum and harmful its indirect effect through bacteria much of what has been said of atmospheric moisture is likewise true of storms as appears in the third column of figure eighteen notice how largely the heavy shading predominates note also that it is scarce in northern groups of cities such as b h and m but increases as one goes southward until in groups g j and especially c practically every month of the year shows a lower death rate when storms are relatively abundant than when they are few here just as in the case of humidity the regions which have few storms like those which have little atmospheric moisture give heavily shaded diagrams because an increase in the number of storms is an advantage to health at practically all seasons but places like boston which are exposed not only to many storms but to strong oceanic winds make it too many storms in the winter the question of the effect of storminess is so important that i have prepared figure twenty to show what happens when stormy periods last several months the upper diagram in each case shows the conditions when the storms of a given month are compared with the deaths of that month in the second diagram the months of the sixteen years using our study have been grouped into halves according to the number of storms not only in the month when deaths occurred but in the preceding month in the lower diagram the storminess of three consecutive months has been compared with the deaths in the third month to begin with boston a relatively high degree of storminess lasting only a single month is slightly beneficial in summer and again curiously enough in winter but this may be a mere accident due to the shortness of our record if the stormy period lasts two months the good effect of storms is much increased in fact boston's health would apparently be distinctly improved if the city could have frequent periods of relatively high storminess lasting two months during the summer but not during the late winter the lightly shaded area in the autumn is so small that it may be accidental if the periods of storminess last three months however boston gets too much of them and the death rate rises markedly in other words boston seems to lie close to the fortunate level where it gets neither too many nor too few storms in the long run although in the more extreme periods it gets too many just as in milder periods it does not get enough contrast boston with chicago in figure twenty a single month of more than the average storminess helps chicago a good deal during all seasons except midwinter but two successive months of unusual storminess and especially three do harm at practically all seasons in other words an increase in storminess hurt chicago more than boston nevertheless both cities evidently profit greatly by the fact that they have many storms as appears when they are compared with cities farther south in new york for example figure twenty shows that increased storminess during periods of more than one month is beneficial in summer but not in winter while seattle is benefited by increased and prolonged storminess at practically all seasons this simply means that new york with less severe storms than chicago or boston would profit by a mild increase in storminess on the other hand seattle with far less storminess than the other cities would be better off to have decidedly more figure twenty is displayed on the page excess or deficiency of deaths in relation to stormy periods lasting one month upper diagrams two months middle and three months lower nineteen hundred to nineteen fifteen at the bottom of figure twenty baltimore and washington which are treated as a single unit and memphis on the mississippi river in tennessee present still a third type at all seasons the stormiest months are the most healthful for these cities lie toward the southern edge of the storm belt they have far less stormy weather than new york chicago and boston but more than seattle during the years under discussion all these places were especially stormy in march they are benefited by a prolonged periods of storminess in summer and autumn but cannot stand such periods in the winter and spring too much emphasis must not be placed on the minor details of any of the diagrams in figure twenty especially that of a small city like memphis for the number of years included in our data is small nevertheless 
There seems to be little question that storminess has an important effect upon health. In a belt of country extending from New York to Boston westward to Chicago, the beneficial effects of storminess are greatest. To the north of that belt, increased storminess appears to have a harmful effect upon health. To the south, the present degree of storminess is not enough on the average, and a high degree regularly causes an improvement in health at most seasons. In concluding this chapter, let us turn to figure 21. Here the data for all of our 33 American cities have been combined into a single diagram. This shows the effect produced by an unusually high condition of any one of the four climatic factors upon the death rate in the whole northern United States, together with the Pacific Coast. In using such a large area, there is great opportunity for opposed conditions in different regions to cancel one another. But this cancellation is far from complete. Before we interpret figure 21, let us consider for a moment the degree to which the diagrams may be the result of chance. In most such cases, it is the custom for mathematicians to compute the probable error by means of a formula. Our method, however, whereby cities are weighted according to their population, and the departures are reckoned from normals which pertain to the year instead of the individual months, would cause such computations to take an excessive amount of time. Accordingly, I have calculated the data for four months exactly as in the diagrams, except that pure chance has been allowed to control the choice of months for each of the two groups of eight years into which the sixteen years have been divided. The smooth results for comparison with figure 21 are January 0.47, April 0.40, July 0.72, October 0.79, in each of the four diagrams, the extremes are four to seven times as great as the accidental variations thus obtained. This fact, together with the systematic character of the results, makes it practically certain that we are dealing with real relationships and not with accidental coincidences. Figure 21 is displayed on the page, Net Effect of Weather in the United States. If this be accepted, our diagrams in Figure 21 show that in the United States as a whole, Excluding the South, except in California, a certain amount of harm is done to health in winter by low temperature, but not so much as one would expect. The high temperatures of summer do much more harm. The effects of the wind seem to be very clear, but are probably due largely to the conditions of temperature, humidity and storminess which accompany the winds. Now for the most surprising fact, lack of moisture does almost as much harm to the United States in winter as does low temperature while in the spring it does only a little less than does high temperature in summer. At all seasons, the United States as a whole, and many of the parts for which we have no data, has poorer health in unusually dry weather than in that which is unusually moist. Almost the same thing is true of storms. The country is better off when storminess is unusually abundant, except in the late fall. In figure 21, the average departures from the zero line, regardless of whether the departures are positive or negative, are as follows. Temperature, 4.09%. Relative humidity, 3.96. And storminess, 3.60. These figures seem to represent approximately the relative importance of the three great climatic factors. Thus, in spite of certain puzzling facts as to humidity, the general result of our study of health in relation to the weather is to confirm the results of our previous study of efficiency in factories. The same conditions of temperature, humidity, and variability which cause people to work quickly or slowly in the ordinary affairs of life seem also to cause their health to be good or poor. End of section 9